on an oscilloscope. That was super cool and I was not expecting it. So that was a fun surprise. Um, welcome everyone to the Neutrino Parallel session. It's half past, so I think we better go ahead and get started right on time. Um, I'm Elizabeth Worcester from BNL. I work in um, Accelerator Neutrino Oscillation and I'm your um, convener for this half of the session. Um, all of our talks in this session are the 12 plus three variety, so it's going to be tight. So everybody try and stay on schedule. I will give speakers a two minute and one minute warning. I'm going to try to use the annotation feature so as not to interrupt the flow of your talk. So you'll see like a little text box appear on the screen. Um, and then uh, at, at 12 minutes, I'll pop up verbally. Um, Speakers, if you can share your video, we're asked to try to do that to make it a little more human. Um, but if you can't, that's okay. Um, attendees, if you want to ask questions at the end, the best way to do it is to use the raised hands feature. If somehow that doesn't work for you, uh, you can try to use the chat. In my experience, sometimes that goes by kind of fast, so I might miss chat questions. So the raised hand is the preferred feature. Um, I'm supposed to tell you we have uh, 34, 35 participants online in the meeting uh, right now and growing by the second. Um, so I think we better go ahead and get started. Uh, Marilisa, can you go ahead and share your screen? Yeah, sure. So, okay. And, and, and. Okay, great. We see it. Oh, I can also. Um, do you um, want to go to full screen if you can? My video and then um, go. Okay. 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 Very good. All right. So, our first speaker is uh, Marilisa Desario speaking about neutrino physics at the ship experiment at CERN. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So in my talk, I will uh, show the, the updated neutrino physics uh, performance studies and the progress in the detector design of the proposed uh, ship experiment at CERN. So given the current status of uh, the, the current picture of uh, high energy physics uh, um, showing at the same time the triumph of the standard model and uh, um, uh, evidence for the existence uh, of uh, physics behind the standard model, uh, two complementary approaches can be exploited to search for new physics. Uh, we can probe the energy frontier, which is the task of high lumi LHC and future colliders, and or uh, probe the so-called intensity frontier, searching for uh, light particles with masses at uh, the GeV scale with very weak couplings to standard model particles. Uh, SHIP, which stands for a Search for Hidden Particles, so is a proton beam damp experiment proposed at CERN uh, using the beam damp facility, which is under design in the SPS North area. The main physics goals are the search for particles belonging to the so-called uh, hidden sector, and I will show the potential of SHIP in searching for uh, heavy neutral lectins, as well as study uh, neutrino physics with special emphasis on uh, tau neutrino physics uh, and search for a light dark matter. Um, following the recommendation from SPSC and some research board, the collaboration has finalized the comprehensive design study report at the end of 2019. The beam dam facility is a general purpose fixed target target facility at the SPS, uh, sharing uh, the, the SPS uh, red existing TT20 transfer line with a beam that uh, would be deflected into uh, a new line as uh, sketched in uh, this uh, picture. 
uh, the BDF team has uh, uh, completed a comprehensive design study at the end of the last year with a detailed description um, of the feasibility studies, which have been carried out uh, over the past uh, three years, as well as prototyping and uh, the evaluation of uh, safety aspects. This is the current layout of a ship, 400 GV LC protons will impinge on a uh, target, uh, high density target in the spills of one second. The target um, is followed by a hadron stopper and a magnetized neon shield, which has a task of bending out of the detector acceptance uh, uh, beam related muons. The scattering and neutrino detector, the SND, is the detector devoted uh, uh, to um, uh, neutrino physics and uh, search for light or dark matter. Um, the hidden sector detector has been designed uh, to search uh, for visible decays of uh, possible uh, um, hidden particles uh, occurring in a long uh, uh, decay vessel, 50 meter long, uh, located immediately downstream of the scattering and neutrino detector. In uh, five years of uh, data taking uh, with uh, about two times 10 to the 20 protons on target expected, we expect uh, more than uh, 10 to the 18 heavy masons and more than 10 to the 16 tau neutrinos to be produced uh, at the beam dump. A few more details on the main elements. Uh, so the target uh, will be made of uh, blocks of titanium zirconium molybdeno uh, plus uh, so followed by uh, blocks of uh, pure tungsten for a total thickness of about 12 uh, interaction uh, length. And that's been uh, specifically optimized for uh, heavy mason production. Uh, the target is followed by a hadron sapper that filters out hadrons and the electromagnetic component emerging from the uh, target, while muons will be deflected by a magnetized muon shield, uh, which uh, is able to reduce the, the flux in the detector acceptance by about six orders of magnitude with respect to the initial uh, muon flux. This is a scattering and neutrino detector. The main physics goal is the measurement with uh, unprecedented statistics of the uh, interaction cross-section of all neutrino flavors with a special emphasis on uh, tau neutrino physics as well as search for uh, light uh, dark matter. It consists of a magnetized target, uh, which is uh, made of uh, bricks of emulsion tungsten uh, similar in uh, their structure to uh, the bricks uh, uh, used in the OPER experiment, interleaved with planes of uh, electronic trackers based on uh, scintillating fibers. The um, submicrometric uh, space resolution of uh, nuclear emulsions allows the tau lectin decay to be, uh, to be reconstructed, uh, typically occurring a few hundred microns uh, uh, downstream of the neutrino interaction vertex, and uh, the magnetic field allows uh, uh, for the measurement of the sign of the charge of the daughter particles produced, uh, thus making it possible to distinguish tau neutrinos from uh, tau antineutrinos. The target is followed by a muon identification system uh, instrumented with RPCs and iron filters. Uh, immediately downstream of the DSND, uh, the decay vessel is located. Um, uh, it is completely surrounded by a veto system um, based on liquid scintillator uh, to uh, efficiently suppress the background. And here in this slide, you can see a uh, sketch of the main background sources that have been taken into account in the evaluation of uh, the sensitivity of the experiment to the search for uh, hidden particles. The hidden sector spectrometer uh, is equipped with a zero tracker, uh, which has been designed to uh, reconstruct the, the decays of uh, uh, hidden particles occurring in the decay vessel. Um, it uh, also um, shows a timing detector, uh, which is required uh, to efficiently suppress the combinatorial background, an electromagnetic colorimeter, and a neon system. Uh, an intense uh, uh, activity of prototyping and testing has been carried out over the uh, past few years. In this slide, you can see some of the detector prototypes which have been uh, built and tested, uh, as well as a small-scale replica of the ship uh, target. 
In uh, 2017, uh, the collaboration uh, um, uh, proposed uh, a dedicated experiment with the aim of measuring the differential chain production cross-section, uh, uh, including the cascade production contribution, which is expected to be uh, relevant uh, in shape uh, given the high density target that we plan uh, to use. Uh, a test uh, measurement has been performed at SDF, uh, the SPSH 4 beam line in uh, 2018. And uh, um, a lot of effort has been uh, made in uh, developing and optimizing analysis uh, tools to reconstruct interaction and decay vertices in a high density and high background environment. Uh, the density of truck segments in one single emulsion films being as large as 10 to the 5 centi uh, per centimeter squared and the capability of uh, reconstructing vertices in such a quite tough environment has been uh, fully successfully demonstrated. Coming to the uh, physics performance, as I said uh, before, um, we, we, the, the main goal of the SMD is the measurement of the um, interaction cross-section for all neutrino flavors. In this second table uh, here, you, you can see the expected numbers of uh, tau neutrinos and anti-neutrinos uh, according to the different tau decay channels. So overall, in five years of data taking, we expect to collect uh, uh, about 10,000 uh, uh, tau uh, neutrino and anti-neutrino uh, events, which means a sample, which is a factor of about uh, 1,000 larger uh, with respect to the only sample available, which amounts to only nine events measured by the download experiment, which has also provided the, the only measurement available of the cross-section uh, with a statistical error of uh, 33%, which could be uh, significantly improved uh, with uh, SHIP uh, data. Uh, neutrino, tau neutrino and anti-neutrino cross-section also offer the, the, the possibility, the unique capability of measuring the structural functions F4 and F5, which are typically not accessible through uh, muon and electron uh, neutrinos uh, due to the fact that they are multiplied by factors that uh, uh, are proportional to the to, to square uh, mass of the charged leptin. Moreover, we uh, expect to uh, collect uh, uh, more than 200,000 uh, um, charmed produced in uh, neutrino induced interactions. Uh, again, a sample which exceeds by, one, by more than one order of magnitude the statistics already available from uh, previous experiments. Uh, anti neutrino induced charm production is also sensitive to the uh, strange core content of the nucleon and a uh, reduction of the order of factor of two uh, on the uncertainty uh, of the escort distribution is uh, expected to be achievable with ship data uh, in the uh, range of the Björk variable uh, between 0.03 and 0.35. Uh, uh, the, the SMD and ship can also uh, probe uh, investigate the existence of light uh, dark uh, matter by uh, detecting uh, the electromagnetic shower uh, initiated by the recoil electron in the scattering of uh, light dark matter particles in the SMD uh, target. Um, target bricks uh, uh, can indeed um, act as sampling calorimeters, as you can see in this uh, picture taken, by, uh, taken from the OPERA experiment. Uh, moreover, the submicrometric accuracy of nuclear emulsions uh, um, offers it uh, topological um, discrimination uh, of the signal against uh, background, which is mainly due to uh, cross-elastic interactions of electron neutrinos with the soft pion uh, not identified at the vertex. The plot shows the sensitivity uh, uh, in, uh, for uh, assuming five years of uh, data taking, and as you can see from the plot, uh, in the range between a few MeV euros squared to a few hundreds MeV euros squared, uh, we expect to improve the current limits by um, one order of magnitude. Uh, one of the main goals of the uh, experiment uh, is the search for uh, hidden particles and specifically the search for uh, heavy neutral lactins. Um, so um, the search for uh, right-handed uh, uh, sterile neutrinos, which would be uh, Majorana partners of the active neutrinos as postulated by, uh, for example, the, the neutrino minimal uh, standard model. 
um, these uh, particles could uh, um, explain uh, neutrino masses uh, through the C cell mechanism, uh, um, as well as also uh, baryon asymmetry and the light was of the, the three particles uh, could be also a dark uh, matter candidate. Um, in the ship, uh, um, such particles could be produced in the semi-leptonic uh, decays of uh, heavy masons and uh, uh, detected through uh, visible decays in uh, standard model particles, as for example, this uh, golden channel in the uh, muon and, uh, and bion. The plot uh, shows the sensitivity uh, as a function uh, of, the, uh, of the mass. And as you can see in the uh, region that uh, a ship uh, will be able to, uh, to probe an improvement uh, of up to three orders of magnitude uh, is um, expected. So in uh, conclusion, uh, SHIP is a proton beam dump experiment proposed at CERN uh, to probe the so-called intensity frontier. It has a quite rich uh, physics program, including uh, heavy neutral leptons, uh, light dark matter searches, and uh, neutrino physics uh, um, with um, unprecedented sensitivities. Uh, the beam dump facility and uh, SHIP experiment uh, uh, comprehensive design study reports uh, have been finalized in December last year, and uh, in next month, uh, uh, further steps will be defined by the collaboration uh, on how to proceed. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? You can raise your hand in the Zoom. Go in. All right. I don't. Ah, there's one. Uh, Sunny, go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. go ahead. Ah, okay, <laughs> sorry, I was talking uh, with mute. Uh, so, uh, so shape experiments seems to be very interesting experiment, and I just wonder uh, the the experiment is funded or not? Uh, no. Um, uh, so. Um... We will have to define uh, next steps in next month. Uh, um, so um, considering the output of the European strategy and the implementation that will be uh, done at CERN uh, in September, the uh, medium term plan of CERN should be made available and um, then the collaboration will uh, uh, define steps, uh, further steps to proceed. Okay. Can you tell us uh, the budget of uh, this experiment? If I can uh, tell you what, yeah. sir? Can you, can you tell us the budget, the cost of the experiment? Uh, so it's uh, 150 uh, millions for the BDF, which is the main uh, point, let's say, to be, to be overcome. So uh, it's for the beam dump facility, which is the, the, the first uh, element, key element that we need to, to go on. Okay, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we better move on to the next talk. So uh, Francesco, can you go ahead and share your screen? Sure. Can you hear me? I do hear you. You're a little bit faint. Okay, yeah. uh, maybe maybe now is better, right? Yeah, yes, that's much better. Okay, definitely. Okay, so just... Can you see also the slides now in full screen? Yes, this looks Very good. So our next speaker is Francesco Terranova speaking about uh, Inubet. Uh, go ahead when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much. So I will give a brief report on uh, the achievement that we got, uh, especially in the last year uh, for Inubet. Uh, I remind you that Inubet is uh, a project that started in 2016, uh, funded by the European Research Council. Uh, um, with, with the leadership of Andrea Longin. And then uh, very recently, I would say in April uh, 2019, uh, Inubet uh, has also been approved uh, at CERN as a CERN experiment in the framework of the CERN Neutrino Platform. And this is the reason why the title now 
is MP06. MP, MP06 is uh, actually uh, the the name at CERN uh, together with uh, with the standard name uh, from uh, the ERC. The collaboration uh, has grown uh, signific significantly in the last uh, uh, two, three years. We are now about uh, 60 people uh, from 12 institutions and, uh, and five, uh, five countries. And uh, the aim of InnoBet uh, is uh, to design, so this means that it is an R&D, not, not, uh, not yet a proposal for an experiment, to design uh, an aerobin beam uh, at the GV scale to measure uh, the flux and the flavor of uh, neutrinos at source uh, at 1% level and to measure uh, uh, on uh, an event by event basis uh, the energy of the neutrinos with a typical precision of 10%. Uh, is a new te technology. Uh, we believe uh, might be the right technology for a new generation of short baseline experiment uh, to achieve a precision of 1% uh, in the new, uh, new micro section and remove uh, most of the biases uh, due to the energy reconstruction uh, in, uh, in, in the final states uh, for a uh, total and differential cross section. Uh, clearly, this is essential to lower below 3% uh, the systematic budget of Dune and Hyper-K and uh, enhance remarkably the, the discovery reach. And this is also the reason why the European strategy uh, support uh, so strongly this kind of, uh, of, uh, of research uh, for INU, but in general for, for the reduction of, uh, of uh, the uncertainty of the flux. And uh, we believe that uh, it is the most natural follow-up of uh, the current generation of experiment for, uh, for cross-section. Now, the, the basic concept is uh, quite simple. You probably know that uh, all uh, absolute cross-section are dominated now by the knowledge of the flux at source, and uh, which in turn is dominated by the uncertainty on the uh, uh, simulation of the beam line uh, and uh, the other production data. The most simple way to get rid uh, of uh, all these uh, systematics is just uh, to measure the number of leptons uh, that are produced uh, in the decay tunnel because there is a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, let's say the, the positron that you produce and the electron neutrinos or the muons that you produce and the and the muon neutrinos inubet in particular uh, started uh, looking at the production of the positron large, large angle positron uh, from the free body decay of the chaos uh, and uh, instrumenting the decay tunnel in such a way that we can observe this positron over the year, especially I would say after the approval uh, from CERN, uh, we extended the significantly the physics reach. Now we are working uh, on uh, monitoring the muon from the two body decay of the chaos in the instrument decay tunnel and also transforming the hadron dump in a real uh, range meter uh, that is able to measure at single particle level uh, uh, the muons from the pions decay, which of course uh, are the core of uh, the new mu uh, events in the detector. Uh, these uh, ensemble of detectors uh, are what we call in jargon uh, a monitored neutrino beam. This is uh, what um, how we we dub the we dub this uh, this system. Now the the, the um, beam line that I'm presenting, uh, I would say, is probably the final uh, version uh, of, of uh, the beam line of Inubet. Uh, it is based on uh, two dipoles and uh, one triplet that is located uh, just after the urn. Every single part of the beam line is now um, uh, simulated at the target, uh, the transfer line, uh, the proton dump, uh, uh, and also the other dump, where we are also adding this modification that I was mentioning before, plus uh, a neutral shielding. Still, uh, we wanted to implement this uh, also in GM4, not only in G4 beam line, because uh, uh, this is very useful to assess uh, systematics, for instance, uh, from neutrinos that are produced uh, in the proton dump and uh, for some reason they reach uh, the neutrino detector. So there are still some work that has to be done, but uh, most, most of it has been, uh, has been completed. Now let's go a bit more on the technical side. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, if you run an Inubet like you are running a T2K or, a, or, or Nova, it, it will not work <laughs> because uh, the extraction uh, uh, is uh, just the, the proton extraction is just 10 microseconds, so you will get uh, a huge number of particles uh, all uh, in the same time, and so this uh, will saturate uh, the detector that we want to put uh, in the tunnel. So we need uh, a relatively short extraction. In particular, we would like to have uh, what we called uh, this is something that we, Andrea and myself, uh, proposed uh, five years ago 
we call it uh, slow burst extraction. Essentially, there are uh, small bursts of uh, 10 milliseconds uh, that are repeated uh, with a frequency of 10 Hertz during uh, the flat top. So not all the time, but just during uh, the flat top uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the accelerator. Uh, this system has been tested at the SPS at CERN in 2018, just before the LS2, uh, just a couple of days of uh, machine developments. At that time, uh, we achieved uh, 20 milliseconds. So we are in the ballpark of what we need, but not, not exactly. And then uh, in this year, uh, uh, we moved, uh, we implemented this scheme uh, in the full simulation of the S SPS. We played with uh, mostly with the, with the sextuple, and uh, at least uh, uh, at, at the level of simulation, uh, we were able to achieve uh, uh, burst uh, between uh, 4 and 10 milliseconds, which is exactly what we need for InnoBet. Of course, uh, the demonstration with the real data uh, will be done uh, once uh, the, L the LS2 is over, so probably in 2021 or more likely in 2022. In, in parallel, we are re-optimizing the ORN for the new beamline uh, using uh, a, um, a genetic alg algorithm to find the right point in the phase space uh, of the geometry of the conductor and the, and the currents. And still we are working on the possibility of getting rid even of the urn. In this case, uh, you would not need uh, a burst extraction, but uh, you could work with a, with a very slow extraction. Uh, I, I, this is unfortunately is not the scope of my talk. I don't have time to speak about this, but uh, uh, the, the, the big advantage of uh, the static focusing option is that uh, the particle are so, uh, how can I say, uh, this distributed uh, um, interspace that, that in principle you could associate uh, the neutrino observed uh, in the detector with the corresponding lepton if uh, the, the time resolution is good enough, is uh, 100 picosecond, and this would be the famous uh, tagged neutrino beam. Uh, Enobet is not a tagged neutrino beam, uh, is a monitor neutrino beam, but uh, of course if this works, uh, it might be a, in, 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 upgraded to, to a target neutrino beam. Now, uh, last year we've made the final choice on the technology. Uh, of, of course, we want to instrument the decay tunnel with something that is very cheap. Uh, it, it must be marginal compared to the cost of the beam line. And so we ended up with a longitudinal segment calorimeter with the silicon PMs on tops on top of the of the calorimeter to reduce uh, the radiation damage. Uh, this, uh, all this stuff was tested at CERN uh, with a charged particle beam uh, in 2018. At that time, we also tested uh, the photon veto uh, that is uh, here located uh, below, and uh, the results uh, were uh, really very good. So if you're interested in this, uh, there is a paper that you can, uh, it's just uh, appeared in j -Instant. You, you can find it uh, in, uh, in this link here. Now the highlight of uh, 2020, I would say the highlight of uh, ICF uh, 2020 for Inubet because this is the first time that we present uh, these results uh, in any conference, uh, is uh, uh, the major improvement that we got uh, on, the, on uh, the identification and the monitoring of the lepton. Uh, from the technical point of view, the, the, the tough job uh, was done in, already in the past. I'm speaking about the full simulation uh, with the det detector response, pile up, even building a particle identification algorithm. All this has already been discussed. But of course, uh, uh, with the new beamline, uh, we observed uh, a significant improvement uh, in the performance. This thanks uh, especially to the re-optimization re of the collimators and uh, the shielding uh, in the proximity of the, f of, of, uh, the first tri triplet. So for instance, uh, for the positron from the free body decay of the chaos, uh, for the first time uh, we reach uh, a signal to noise of uh, 2.1 and an efficiency of 24% that is dominated by geometrical effect. That is, uh, if, you, if you have a positron that go, goes uh, straight uh, in the axis of the, of the decay tunnel, uh, we cannot see it because uh, it, it must uh, touch the, the, the walls. Uh, so if, if it goes uh, directly to the dump, uh, this, this is not seen. But this is uh, very good news because uh, a geometrical effect uh, does not contribute uh, in a significant manner to the systematic. And then uh, we, for the first time, we monitor muons. Uh, and uh, we achieved uh, 
an impressive uh, results, I would say, uh, with signal to noise uh, equal to 6.1 and efficiency of 34 uh, percent that at present we are exploiting uh, mostly for the two body decay of the chaos. We are also working on a, a, a the, most of the results are optimized for Dune, I must say. We are also working for a version of this beam line that is optimized for hyper K, where the energy, of course, is much lower, and uh, this is our work in progress. Well, let's uh, physics performance. The, the, the table that you are see you see here is uh, unfortunately a bit obsolete because uh, this is the one of the of the previous version of the beam line. I think that after the optimization of the ORNA, we more or less we will get the same results, but uh, this is something that uh, I cannot guarantee yet. So please take uh, this table as, uh, as preliminary. Uh, the following results uh, are given uh, under the assumption of uh, having a 500 ton uh, neutrino detector located 100 meters from uh, the source, or if you like, uh, 50 meters from the Hadron dump. Uh, the beam liner is able to produce. Uh, 10 to the 4 fully reconstructed the new e-charge current events in about 1.5 year of data taking and 80 percent of these events uh, the spectrum is here co uh, correspond to events where uh, the leptons are really are in the decay tunnel and then there is a correction of about 10 percent uh, that comes from the decay of the chaos before uh, which means uh, in the transfer line plus uh, the contribution from k long uh, which gives essentially this low energy part that, of course, uh, we will not use uh, uh, because probably in the real analysis for Duna, we will cut the, the, the very low energy in the region. Uh, concerned the neutrinos, the, the muon neutrinos, of course, the statistic is huge. We are speaking about one million of uh, fully reconstructed new mu charged current events per year. So this. Uh, infinite from the point of view of uh, cross-section. Uh, the, the flux is uh, monitored uh, using uh, the range meter uh, uh, for, for the muons coming from the pi and uh, the instrumented decay tunnel for the muons coming from the free body decay, from the two body decay of the chaos. Uh, on the other end, uh, the momentum byte of the of the of the of Inubet is very small as uh, at the level of 10%. So this means that uh, there is a a very straightforward correlation between uh, the position of the interaction vertex of the neutrino and the energy of the neutrino. It's like a, an off-axis experiment, but uh, instead of having the, the detector of axis, you have a single det detector and you just span uh, the, um, the position of the neutrinos. And uh, we were able, this, uh, we dubbed this uh, technique, narrow band of axis techniques. Uh, I don't think we invented it because more or less uh, this is uh, in literature, but uh, the results are, are really impressive, I would say. For instance, uh, for 3 GV muons, uh, we are able to provide uh, on event by event basis, that is for any single neutrino, the energy with a precision of 10%, which get worse, at least in this configuration, uh, to 20%, so a factor of two, uh, if you go to, to 1 GB. Uh, the, ne the, the final step or the next step for the project, uh, as you can imagine, uh, will be the construction of a real demonstrator, uh, which means uh, a real uh, two meter uh, uh, long uh, tunnel. Of course, uh, the real experiment is 40 meter. This is uh, a prototype, but uh, we, you will see two meters of uh, instrumented decay tunnel at CERN uh, by the end of 2021. We are working on uh, the, the mechanical design and the, and the procurement of the of the um, of the material, and in general, I would say that uh, Inubet uh, is on schedule uh, in the sense that uh, the design phase is over, the simulation are nearly completed, uh, and we are going to build uh, the final demonstrator. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the work that uh, um, we are doing right now, uh, it is uh, as important as the construction of the demonstrator is uh, really to show that uh, the systematic budget for the flux is really 1% or below. Uh, this is a work in progress. Uh, we are using uh, practically the same technique uh, that uh, T2K or other uh, long baseline experiments are using. That is, uh, we are adding uh, the observable uh, I mean, from the instrumentation of Inubet as uh, additional priors uh, to, the, to the rest of the simulation in order to defeat uh, the flux systematics and uh, of course the information of the energy in order to reduce uh, the cross-section systematic on a final state interaction. 
So at the end of the story, uh, I think uh, we will build uh, the demonstrator and do this study uh, in 2021. And then uh, once uh, the COVID emergency is over and also the machine are uh, online at CERN, uh, most likely by 2022, I believe, uh, then we will test the demonstrator uh, with the charged particle beam uh, at CERN. And, uh, and that's all. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're over our question period, so I think probably I better encourage people to ask questions to you offline so that we don't get too far behind. But thank you for the very interesting talk. Okay. Our next speaker, Brant, can you go ahead and share? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. All right. I apologize. I don't have a camera on my laptop. Uh, so uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, and uh, I will talk today about hadron production measurements we make at NA61, also known as SHINE. Okay, so today, uh, briefly, I'll give you an overview of long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments that we provide data for. And then uh, I will talk about a leading systematic uncertainty in these experiments, the neutrino beam flux uncertainty. And then I will tell you about our experiment, NA61 or SHINE, and the measurements that we make there to help constrain these uncertainties. And then I'll tell you about an upgrade we're undergoing right now and some future measurement possibilities. Okay, so uh, long baseline neutrino oscillation experiments have given us uh, many prominent results over the past several years. There's lots of great results still coming out of active long baseline experiments like T2K and NOVA. And then there's some great future long baseline experiments planned uh, like Dune and Hyperkamiokande. And uh, the focus of these experiments is going to be uh, resolving the, the last remaining issues in the neutrino oscillation picture, but also really precisely measuring all of the oscillation parameters. Uh, and in order to achieve the level of precision that they aim for, uh, they're going to have to have very tight control over all the systematic uncertainties. And one of these such uncertainties is the neutrino beam flux uncertainty, uh, which enters into cross-section calculations and oscillation parameter results. Uh, so this is the uncertainty associated with the uh, flavor content of the neutrino beam generated for the experiment. And as you can see in this cartoon here, uh, the neutrino beam content is going to directly depend on the hadronic interactions in the target and also the, the target beamline facility. Uh, so yeah, this content is going to directly depend on primary interactions that happen both in the target uh, or secondary interactions that happen in the target and uh, in horn elements or support elements for the beam line or elsewhere. Uh, and if you uh, try to estimate your initial neutrino beam flux, um, you don't use any kind of hadronic interaction constraint data. You can have really large uncertainties on your, your resulting neutrino flux. And this becomes a, a large uncertainty to, to deal with. Uh, so how do we reduce this uncertainty? Uh, well, we make hadron production measurements. We can do this in two ways. We can either take thin target measurements uh, investigating pertinent reactions for different experiments, whether that might be uh, 30 GeV protons on a thin target, uh, thin carbon target, uh, in the case of T2K, or uh, 120 GeV protons on carbon for, for the NUMI beam line. And then, uh, so yeah, you can select your, your thin target material and your beam type, and then study the hadron production off of that target type. You can also take uh, replica target measurements, uh, as we call them where we mimic the neutrino beam creation uh, interaction. Uh, we take either a copy of the neutrino beam target or the target itself, itself and uh, put that in a beam line, use the same beam species and energy uh, and directly measure the hadrons produced off of that target. And just to show you the, the impact uh, that these measurements can have on beam flux estimation, this is the uh, beam flux uncertainty at Super Kamiokande, and you can see that uh, going from just using thin target data in the dashed line here down to using replica target to these two sets of lines here can, can reduce the beam flux uncertainty by several percent in the interesting region. So these are important measurements to make. Uh, and now let's talk about the facility where these measurements were made called NA61 or SHINE. So NA61 is a fixed tar target experiment at CERN's uh, SPS, located in the north area. It's in the middle of the LHC ring, as you can see here. SHINE stands for the SPS Heavy Ion and Neutrino Experiment. 
We've got a big uh, multifaceted physics program. There's a strong heavy ion program. Uh, we also uh, do studies for cosmic ray physics. And then there is this neutrino flux constraint measurement part of the physics program. NA61 is a really versatile detector in that it can receive uh, many different types of beams. It can get primary 400 GeV protons directly from the SPS, or those uh, protons can be directed into a secondary production target, and we can get second protons, pions, and kaons uh, anywhere from 13 to 350 GeV. So lots of, of beam uh, particle species options. Uh, for target materials, we can basically take thin target data using any uh, target material that's easy and safe to handle. And then we can also use full neutrino experiment replica targets as we've done in the past. This is just a picture of the detector here. Let's look at another view of the detector. Uh, so the beam comes in on the left here and then the detector starts here. So NA61 is made up of eight time projection chambers primarily. Uh, this gives us 3D tracking and also DDX measurement in the detector for particle identification. Two of these TPCs are inside vertex or superconducting magnets called the vertex magnets that give us momentum determination. We also have Cherenkov detectors upstream of the detector, which uh, tell us the species of the beam particle coming into the detector. In the case of a secondary beam, especially, this is really important. Uh, and then we have uh, three beam position detectors, which give us the trajectory of the particle on its way into the target. And then we also have time of flight detectors, which help us uh, do particle separation in the beta block crossing regions. And we have a forward, forward calorimeter also. This is used for heavy ion physics mostly. So uh, yeah, these are our capabilities for neutrino uh, experiment measurements. This is our thin target holder here. So this is uh, just a picture of one of the carbon targets that we used in the past, but uh, this thin target holder can, you know, uh, be outfitted with beryllium or aluminum or iron or uh, yeah any any nice target material that we can uh, get our hands on and uh, these are some of the replica targets that we've made measurements with this is the 90 centimeter t2k target up here upstream of our first tpc and then this is the numi medium energy target that we took data with back in 2018. and then down here you have a typical event that you might see in one of these interactions um, you have the beam coming in from the left here. Uh, the target is here where this vertex is located. All the, the tracks are meeting up and then we have tracks uh, bending in the magnetic field as it passes through the detector and through our TPCs. Okay, so let's talk about some recent results. We'll go over thin target reactions first. Uh, I'll show you production cross sections uh, and then we'll talk about charged hadron yields and neutral hadron yields also that we've measured. First, uh, I should uh, present a definition. There's, there can often be some confusion in our field with um, what we mean by production, inelastic, and quasi-elastic. So here, when I, when I say inelastic cross-section, I mean the total cross-section with the elastic portion subtracted off. So it's going to be composed of the production and the quasi-elastic cross-section. And then the production cross-section is the inelastic cross-section with the quasi-elastic term subtracted off. Okay, so here are some of our recent results. Uh, these are production and inelastic cross sections of many different reactions at various energies. Uh, so here we have pions on carbon, aluminum, and beryllium, kaons on carbon and aluminum, and then protons on carbon, and carbon aluminum, and beryllium uh, at, at various energies, mostly 60 and 120 GeV. And um, so these cross-section measurements are used to weight hadron production and uh, correct neutrino flux predictions when doing beam Monte Carlos for estimating uh, neutrino flux content. Uh, another uh, recent result is one of our charged hadron yield analyses. Um, so yeah, we get the, the ID of a produced particle in our detector using our uh, TPC's DDX and also the momentum of the tracks that we measure. And then we can bin up our accepted phase space and perform a DDX fit in each of these bins. Uh, and then we could get multiplicities for uh, protons, pions, kaons, electrons uh, in different P theta bins. And um, yeah, this is one of the, the results down here. This is a slice of angular acceptance. Uh, and so you can see for, for this range of momentum, for for, for the red data points here, um, our measurements uh, really disagree with, with all of the 
the models listed here. So we use the data, or the data is used to inform the models, retune them and uh, improve them. And then those models again go into uh, the Monte Carlo's estimating the, the beam flux at long baseline oscillation experiments. Uh, we also do neutral hadron production um, yield studies. Uh, so we can select positive and negative track pairs in our detectors and extrapolate them back towards each other. And if they're close enough, we can uh, enter them into an invariant mass calculation. And then uh, we get, uh, once again, a doubly differential. So a, a, a P versus theta uh, yield of uh, K0 shorts, lambdas, and lambda bars. And then here you have some recent results again compared to various models. OK, uh, and there are lots of ongoing analyses, too. These are just some of the analyses that have been released lately. Um, there is a beam survival probability study uh, going on to, to try to measure the production cross-section of protons on the T2K replica target at the T2K beam energy. Uh, there's also a thin target proton on carbon and proton on aluminum at 60 GeV analysis, which is um, uh, very mature, and this is going to give differential yields uh, for charge and neutral hadrons, like like I just presented. And then an exciting analysis, which is is beginning now, is uh, the analysis of the protons on NUMI medium energy replica target. So this is uh, data taken at the NUMI beam energy, uh, and this will also give differential yield measurements for both charge and neutral hadrons when it is complete. Uh, okay, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, improving the acceptance of the experiment. So back in 2017, uh, my group was involved with constructing and installing three new time projection chambers uh, right in the beam line. So previously, this part of the detector was uninstrumented. So you can see from the acceptance plot up here, uh, so this was a 120 GeV beam interaction, uh, and the acceptance really um, gets very poor and drops off completely at low angle and high momentum. Uh, but with the addition of these new detectors, now we can, uh, we've improved our phase space coverage all the way up to uh, the beam momentum here at 120 GeV. And it's got a really cool, uh, what we call a tandem field cage design where we can reject out of time tracks uh, right off the bat. So with the inclusion of these new detectors, uh, we can do even more exciting analyses. Uh, right now, I'm working on a, uh, an analysis of protons on carbon at 120 GeV. Uh, this is the NUMI beam material and energy, so uh, it's, a, it's an important reaction to study. I'd like to have a charged hadron analysis completed in the next couple of months. Uh, and uh, a neat thing is that the increasing of this forward acceptance leads to, I think, the potential for uh, maybe elastic or quasi-elastic cross-section measurement directly, which would help us to rely less on models. For correction. Uh, this is a list of other data sets that are waiting to be uh, calibrated and analyzed. So I'm working on this one here. And then uh, we had full forward acceptance for these last three reactions. So we have a lot of data uh, that we are analyzing and uh, lots of results to come. Uh, also, we are undergoing a big upgrade right now. Uh, we're increasing our data acquisition rate by an order of magnitude. And we're also uh, um, replacing the TPC front-end electronics uh, with the old Elise electronics. Uh, we're developing a long, low energy beam line to push our uh, lowest energy down to one GeV, which is really exciting for making future measurements for other experiments. And then we'd like to develop a tracker to uh, help do vertexing in long target uh, reconstruction. We're gonna resume data taking in 2021 or 2022. OK, so in conclusion, neutrino beam flux is leading systematic uncertainty for long baseline experiments, but NA61 or SHINE is capable of taking relevant data to constrain this neutrino flux. Uh, the thin and replica target data results for several pertinent, pertinent reactions have been published and are currently used in oscillation analyses. And uh, we would love to get uh, the DUNE replica or a DUNE target when the design is finished and take some data with it. So stay tuned and thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. If anyone wants to raise their hand. Last chance. All right, I'm not seeing anything. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks um, very much. Our next speaker is uh, Budimir Klicek talking about ESS new SB. Can you go ahead and share? 
Um, yes. Let me share my screen. Um, can you see it? Yep. It yeah, looks good. Perfect. Go ahead when you're ready. Okay, right. So, hello everyone. My name is Budimir Kličak. I work at the Ruđer Boškovic Institute in Zagreb. And to take, today I will talk about the ESS New USB project. So, the ESS New USB project is a design study for an experiment to measure CP violation at second neutrino oscillation maximum. So, this is the basic idea of what we want to do. Uh, as you know, CP violation in neutrino oscillations, oscillations is manifested by the fact that uh, oscillation probability for neutrinos is different than oscillation probability for anti-neutrinos in vacuum. In particular, in ESS USB, we want to look at the uh, electron neutrino appearance in muon neutrino beam. So our plan is quite simple. First, we will run with muon neutrinos and look at the electron neutrino appearance, and then we will uh, uh, run with the uh, muon anti neutrinos and look at the electron anti neutrino appearance. And then we will compare the two samples and see if the oscillation probabilities are the same or not. Um, uh, the, the special thing about this project is that we want to measure all of this at the second oscillation maximum. So I'm going to try to explain why. Uh, the basic idea, the good thing about the second oscillation maximum is that uh, the CP violation signal there is about three times larger than the CP violation at the first oscillation maximum. Uh, the problem there is, of course, you have to go either further away, exactly three times further away, and then you get the flux which is nine times smaller or you can reduce the neutrino energy three times, and then you get the cross-section, which is at least three times smaller, or you can go even below the charge lepton production threshold. So the optimal case actually depends on the systematic error, which we assume is similar at the first and the second oscillation maximum. Uh, the main point is that the, the, the largest signal at the second oscillation, oscillation maximum is less obscured by systematics, uh, but you have to make sure that you still have enough statistics to, to measure anything. Uh, so if the signal at second maximum is not obscured by larger statistical error, then second uh, maximum is better. And for this, you need to have an intense uh, neutrino beam. And also it's important that theta 1, 3 is large enough because otherwise uh, you would get no appearance events. Uh, it should be noted that with zero systematic error, which uh, never actually happens, uh, first maximum is always better because you get more statistics. Um, so can we go to the second maximum? Well, as it happens, a very intense proton Linux is in construction near Lund, uh, Sweden. And theta 1, 3 is, seems to be large enough according to our GLOBS uh, simulations. So the ESS Proton Linux is designed as a very intense source of uh, spallation neutrons. It will have five megawatt average beam power, which is peak at uh, 125 megawatt during the pulse. Uh, it will have 14 Hertz uh, repetition rate and a duty cycle of 4%, meaning that 96% of the time it will not accelerate protons. And here we see our chance to add uh, additional proton cycles which we can use to produce uh, neutrinos. Uh, the the design, uh, design the energy of the protons is uh, to, to GeV kinetic, but it can be upgraded up to 3.5 GeV. And this machine will actually uh, be capable of producing 2.7 times 10 to the 23 protons on target per year, uh, which put in the perspective is actually 450 milligrams of protons per year at 95% the speed of light. So it will actually uh, accelerate the macroscopic amount of matter to ultra relativistic speeds. Uh, so <clears throat> we want to modify the ESS Linux to produce neutrinos. And for that, we need to uh, build a new target station, which will be optimized uh, for neutrino production. We need to dig out the underground uh, uh, hole, which will host our new detectors. Uh, we want to increase the proton energy to 2.5 GV kinetic, because this will give us a better CP violation sensitivity. And we want to double the Linux rate so that uh, neutron people still get their protons and we get our protons. Uh, the pro one of the problems is that the ESS proton pulse is too long. So we need to uh, build an accumulator ring, uh, 
to comp compress this uh, three millisecond proton pulses to about uh, one microsecond because otherwise our magnetic horns would melt because uh, the current uh, will should uh, because the current would be too long. Uh, but also that uh, we found that the, the atmospheric neutrino background would be too large for CP violation measurement with long pulses. And of course, we must not interfere too much with the neutron program. Uh, so here you can see the uh, uh, energy distribution of neutrinos uh, we expect to have from the ESS uh, optimized for neutrino production. Uh, the, the beam would be quite pure uh, mean neutrino beam, which is uh, very good for the CP violation uh, measurement, but could be a problem for the calibration because uh, we need to use the small uh, new e contamination to measure the electron neutrino interaction cross section. Uh, our near detectors. So the baseline is to have a half kiloton water Cherenkov detector as a near detector. And immediately upstream of that, we would have a super FGD like detector of uh, one to four tons target mass. So the super FGD like detector means a detector which is a collection of small scintillator cubes, which can be read out semi independently. Uh, and we are considering a possible addition of the ninja-like water emulsion detector, which we can put in front of the Super FGD and uh, use to uh, have a really good uh, discrimination between uh, electron and mean neutrinos, and we can also measure the neutrino topology with it. Um, concerning the fire detector position, our baseline is the Garpenberg mine, which is uh, about 540 kilometers from neutrino source, which corresponds more or less exactly to the second oscillation maximum. And the alternatives we are considering is a Zingruen mine, which is 340 kilometers from the source, which still covers a lot of the second oscillation maximum. And there was an idea to have half of the detector at Garpenberg and half at Zingruen. Uh, but as you can imagine, this is the most expensive option. So, uh, I don't think it will happen. Concerning the fire detectors, our baseline is to have um, two large water Cherenkov detectors, which uh, with uh, 270 kiloton fiducia volume each. Uh, the signal would be read out by 20 inch uh, PMTs, and we would have about 80,000 of them for the two detectors. And this is assuming 30% of optical coverage. Um, Having such big detectors, uh, you can uh, they can be used for other purposes like uh, proton decay, astroparticles, uh, uh, galactic uh, uh, supernova neutrinos, solar neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, and so on. So the geological studies in the mine are already underway. And uh, here you can see the technical drawing of the Zingruven mine with possible positions of our fire detectors. Uh, the physics performance that we uh, expect from all of this uh, is shown on this slide. So since we are in the second oscillation maximum, we have a little dependence of, uh, on the uh, neutrino mass hierarchy. Uh, we, can, we are covering the delta CP uh, values range at 5 sigma up to 60% of the range, and we are quite accurate uh, down to 6 degrees at uh, no CP violation uh, values. And all of this is actually um, by assuming a very conservative systematic errors on signal background, uh, which is 5% on signal and 10% on, on the background. Um, it is important to, know, uh, to mention that there are already uh, ideas about synergies between, uh, with the, our proposed uh, modification of ESS Linux. Uh, so one idea is to Take the uh, to take the muons from the decay channel and uh, decay tunnel and put them in a storage ring and then you get new storm. Uh, or you can additionally accelerate these muons, put them in a larger storage ring, and then you get a neutrino factory. Or even more advanced, you can uh, uh, separately uh, accelerate positive and negative muons and then collide them, and then you get a, a Mion Collider, which is a quite a good uh, Higgs factor. Um, all of these studies are actually underway, and there is a dedicated series of workshops which is regularly organized to, to explore this uh, 
new synergies, additional things that could be done with the ESS uh, new USB uh, uh, proposal uh, of the upgrade of the ESS Linux. So uh, all of this was made possible by the EuronUnet cost action, which is now finished. It actually finished at the beginning of this year. Uh, but this cost action was, among other things, used to uh, apply for the Horizon 2020 uh, project, uh, which was approved. And uh, we got a budget of 3 million euro from, uh, uh, from the European Commission. And we are uh, 15 participating institutes from 11 European countries, and uh, including CERN and the ESS. Uh, so concerning the possible schedule, so we, we are optimistically planning to start data taking in 2035. Right now we are here. Uh, we are in the design study. Uh, then we need to do the TDR. Then we need to uh, find the international agreement to actually build this thing. Uh, then we plan to construct and start data taking. So to conclude, uh, ESS USB aims to observe CP violation in neutrino oscillations and the second oscillation maximum. Uh, yes, for this, we are planning to use the ESS Linux, which will be the most powerful proton accelerator in the world. Uh, we are already considering uh, uh, to what kind of uh, additional physics we can do with the proposed modifications. Uh, we can use our large fire detectors for many other things, especially the astroparticle physics program. And all of this was made possible by the cost network project and the ESS USB uh, H2020 design study. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Uh, I see Sunny, I'm going to unmute you, I think. I think you have to do it too. There you go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, can you go to your sensitivity plot? Yes. Yes, here. So, so yes. this is, so you, did you assume two detectors with 270 kiloton each here? Uh, yes. Ah, okay. And 10 years of data taking. Yes. And the distance is 540 kilometers. So I don't quite understand why your sensitivity is not as good as T2HKK, considering you have twice, you know, uh, more, you know, detector volume and half the distance compared to T2HKK. So basically, you have eight times of more statistics uh, compared to the second, you know, hyper K second detector in Korea. But it looks like the, the sensitivity of years is similar to us. So I don't quite understand. Well, it's hard to actually answer this question because I can't, uh, can't see the expected sensitivity of uh, hyper KK. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> have a look, but I, I don't quite understand since you have eight times or more statistics according to, you know, your ah, numbers. I don't know. I, I'm not sure we, which kind of systematic error did HyperK assume. Ah, so for HyperK, uh, you know, we basically used, uh, you know, T2K, I mean, T2K, you know, systematics. Uh, so it's not really, you know, we invented much better, you know, systematics. So, but how about you? Uh, well, as you can see here, it's 5% systematic on signal and 10% on the background. Uh, 5%? But I believe, yes. So I but think I it's similar. But it isn't for the hyper-K, I remember something like 4% on everything. The, for the systematic? Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, but, uh, but in this case... If we assume 4% four, four systematic error, then we are much, much better, of course. But, and but, you with know, time, uh, we are going to kind of lower our systematic error, so you can expect these plots to become better and better as the project progresses. But for the second... 
Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so let me interrupt you guys. I mean, doing these yeah. kinds of sensitivity comparisons is always super fraught and doing it online in front of a bunch of people is probably yes. impossible. So you guys <laughs> yeah. should probably okay. talk online. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for the nice talk. Uh, I think we'll move on to our next talk from uh, uh, Akitaka Ariga about phaser new at LHC. So if you can unshare Budimir, yes. you can go ahead and share. Okay, looks good. Go ahead when you're ready. Oh wait, you're muted though. Okay. There you are. So let me start. Thank you very much. And I'm going to talk about phaser new, which is a new experiment at LSC to study high energy neutrinos. I'm Akita Kariga from University of Bern. The phaser experiment is for such experiment at the LSC. So <laughs> conventional experiments like ATLAS or CMS looked for the new particle emitted in transverse direction with respect to the proton beam. However, not much attention has been paid for the hard particles in this uh, red arrows. We noticed that there is an intense neutron beam here, and uh, possibly there is uh, a beam of long-lived particles, little piece here. So far, regrettably, there is no experiment sort of neutrinos at the LSC. So therefore, we propose the phaser experiment both for LLP searches and uh, neutrino experiment. The phaser new particle searches has, was uh, approved by SUN in March 2019, and uh, phaser new neutrino program was approved recently in December 2019. There is a phaser general talk in the BSM session on Friday by Mikaela. If you are interested, please have a look. This is the layout of uh, LSC high energy neutrino beam line. I put a double quotation on the beam line because uh, this layout is not designed for neutrino beam line, line itself, but it works as a high energy neutrino beam line. Following the proton proton collision in Atlas, the, there will be forward meson bunch of mesons will be produced and some of them decay into neutrinos. And then the charged particles will be deflected away by the LHC magnets and neutral hadron will stop in the rock. And only neutrinos and possible long-lived particles can go straight through the rock. And there is a disused service tunnel here and we replace the phaser new emergent-based neutrino detector and the phaser magnetic spe spectrometer. So phaser sites are uh, placed uh, 500 meter away from the atlas collision point. In this way, we can exploit uh, the intense neutrino beam with almost negligible cost for infrastructures. The expected uh, neutrino spectra are shown here. The you can see the phaser new spectra for in the region where there is no data available. For example, for new E, so we can fill the gap between accelerator data and ice cube measurement. And for new E and new tau, we can provide points at the highest energy ever. The neutrino beam is very much collimated. This is a size and the neutrino beam size is of the order of 10 centimeter so that the small detector makes sense for this measurement. Phaser, phaser new measurement is not simply just a neutrino measurement, but uh, we are opening a new domain of neutrino research. The phaser new spectra compared to the other accelerator neutrino beams are shown here. And uh, so as you can see, the spectra the phaser new spectrum is uh, the highest high energy frontier of man made neutrinos. The neutrinos are made by collider method. This, is, uh, this will be exploited for the first time. 
so that uh, we can study production, propagation, and interaction of high energy neutrinos using this beamline. For the production, 14 TB proton proton collision is equivalent to 100 peta electron volt proton interaction in fixed target regime. So we can study prompt neutrino production at the peta electron volt scale. This will be a variable input for neutrino telescopes. We can study charm glue on PDF at high energy and then study intrinsic charm. We are also sensitive for the Newton oscillation at delta time square around 1000 electron volt squared. And uh, for the interaction, we measure the three flavor neutron cross sections in unexplored energy range, study neutron induced heavy coke productions, and possibly uh, study new physics effects in interactions. For this project, we carefully prepared. Uh, we, we studied the feasibility studies and uh, performed the in situ measurement in 2018. We placed the uh, emergent detector in TI 18 and TI 12 tunnels. There are two sites, symmetric position with respect to the atlas interaction point. So, this is a picture and this is the emergent detector. We measured particle flux and the angular distributions, and this shows the uh, angular distribution and there is clear peak of particles from atlas interaction point and there are secondary peaks from the LSC beam line infrastructures, but they are found to be very small. The flux, measured flux is listed here compared to the Fulka simulations and we found the background level is, is low enough for neutrino measurements and consistent with Fulka expectations. More importantly, we demonstrated that uh, the emergent detector can work at the actual environment. Following this result, we already performed the pilot run in 2018, aiming to demonstrate the feasibility of detection of uh, collider neutrinos. The small detector, 30 kilogram uh, emergent detector was installed on axis of the LHC beam and we collected six weeks of data corresponding to 12.5 inverse femtoban. This is a reconstructed data in the small volume, two times two times two millimeter times two millimeter times 10 emergent films. There are a lot of particles reconstructed, but there are muons and electrons, so that uh, this will not bother our neutrino measurement. In fact, we successfully reconstructed some of the neutrino interaction vertex, vertex. We are really excited about it. The size is 200 nanometer. We are performing a statistical analysis. We have analyzed effective, effective target mass of 12 kilogram. Since uh, the pilot neutron detector doesn't have lepton identification, so the separation of neutral hadron background is uh, a problem. For that, uh, we applied the tighter cuts. 11 neutral vertices were selected and uh, after BDT analysis to separate neutrino signal and uh, neutral hadron background, uh, we selected three events with uh, a certain cut. With this, we found three events with 0 0.8 expected background. So in this uh, sample, we expected a few signal events so that uh, it is uh, consistent with the signal plus background expectation. The p-value of background of only hypothesis is 0.05. So this result uh, demonstrated the detection of neutrinos from the LSC. The detector design for next uh, four years is here. The detector is called the phaser new. This is a flavor sensitive neutrino detector. In the picture, neutrinos come from right and enter to the phaser new detector. This is emergent tungsten detector. This is followed by the phaser spectrometer to identify muon charge so that we will separate new mu and anti new mu differently. The <coughs> emergent detector is made of tungsten plates and emergent films. Emergent film is high precision tracker. And uh, lepton identification will be done in the detector by the topology and kinematical measurements. 
So the, like this, uh, tau express the decay topology. Moreover, we, uh, we are sensitive to the charm and beauty production channels. So the detector is dedicated for the flavor physics studies. The neutrino energy resolution is expected to be 30%. The detector is small, just one ton detector, but uh, we expect a lot of neutrino interactions of the order of 10,000 CC events during the run three from 2021 to 24. This is a uh, interacting spectra, and the uh, mean interacting energy is about one TeV, as shown here. The, we have currently a few different uh, neutrino flux estimates with different uh, hadron production generator implementations. So we have currently large uncertainty. So in particular, the decay, the neutrinos from the decay from charmed particles has large uncertainty. For example, for new E, that affects new E and new tau flux estimates. And for new E, they could be different by one order of magnitude among different hadron production generators at higher energy above one TeV. So therefore we are working to update neutrino flux estimates. And in particular, the work is in progress for quantifying and reducing the systematic uncertainties by creating a dedicated forward physics tune with PTR8 using forward data. The expected cross-section sensitivity is shown here. So we will be able to put uh, several points uh, during the, uh, yeah, in the region where there's no data is available for new E and new mu, and we'll be able to put a single point for new, new, new tau. We have a series of uh, additional physics studies and maybe we, we can study furthermore, we can test some of the new physics models like uh, light gauge boson. The experimental site is being prepared. This is a phaser site last year, and this is a March this year. So the site is cleaned up and trench for the phaser detector is prepared. So we will, uh, we will transport uh, one ton detector over the LHC beam pipe. Therefore, uh, we need uh, some protection of LHC beam pipe, which is uh, cooled down at liquid heavy te temperature. So the protection is already installed and we, uh, it is ready to, uh, for the experiment. So phase new is uh, the new experiment and the first experiment uh, with uh, collider neutrinos and it's opening a new domain of physics research. The detection of neutrinos are demonstrated by the pilot run in 2018. And we are going to take data in run three and collecting 10,000 neutrino events with flavor sensitive detector. Furthermore, we are discussing for neutrino measurement at the high luminosity LHC error. Thank you very much. And this is a collaboration. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have questions? People can raise your hand in the Zoom. I'm not seeing any. I guess I have a question. Do you have thoughts on synergies between this and the, um, the oscillation physics program? Or is it really very different physics that you're looking at here? So we can study neutrino oscillations, but the uh, sensitive delta m square is about 10,000 electron volt squared. So it's relatively different from the, the other experiments which look for uh, standard or sterile neutrino oscillations. Cool, thanks. Other questions? I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you again. Thank Our you. next speaker is uh, Heng He Lau, speaking about um, hadron argon cross section measurements in protodune single phase. So you can go ahead and share your screen. Hi, first of all, can you hear me? I hear you, yes. Okay, 
I assume that you can see my screen sharing right now. Yep, uh, looks good. Go ahead when you're ready. OK, thank you very much for your introduction. So today I'm going to talk about the hadron argon cross-section measurements in building a single phase. Uh, first, first of all, I will talk to you uh, about the final state interactions and then our experimental setup and then the cross-section measurement that we use for uh, in protein single phase. And then we specifically focus on the pions and then proton interaction channels and then their in, uh, event selections. Uh, nowadays, the neutrino experiments use complex nuclei as neutrino targets. And when hadrons they are produced in uh, neutrino interaction, they can uh, reinteract with the nuclear medium before leaving the nucleus. This effect is known as uh, final state interactions, FSI. It's an imp important effect in neutrino interactions that they, this effect can change the charge multiplicity of uh, outgoing hadrons, as well as alternating their uh, final uh, state kinematics. Uh, in the final uh, diagram plot here, uh, without any involvement of the um, this FSI effect, this will be a CCQE e uh, event. But with the involvement of the uh, FSI, this may not be true anymore. This effect is a uh, very important uh, element in neutrino event gener generators that we heavily rely on to unfold the reconstructed neutrino energy to the true neutrino energy. Um, with the precise knowledge of the new clear models that will help you help us to get the precise measurement of the oscillation parameters. We do have many models, uh, but however, we only have very, very limited uh, measurement uh, to, to do the validation. Pro the main physics goal of the program single phase is to measure the hard argon cross sections. By doing so, we can provide the crit critical information on hadron scattering in liquid argon and then help better understanding of the FSI uh, in neutrino argon interactions. With the improved FSI model, we can uh, reduce the systematic uncertainty on neutrino event reconstruction uh, and then the uh, neutrino signal selection. These are all very crucial to achieve the uh, team physics goals. Uh, quite recently, we have uh, uh, we are happy to announce that the we have uh, submitted our uh, first paper in an uh, archive. You can see the archive being over here. Uh, for the setup of our experiment, we, we we are locating at the CERN neutrino platform at the e extension of the EHM one. Uh, so our um, detector is here. And then we enjoy the CERN uh, H4 beam line, which uh, with the known um, uh, particles, namely pions, protons, k and muons, and electrons uh, with the momentum ranging from 0 0.5 to 7 GV. Overall, we, we have collected um, more than uh, 4 million of beam events. On the right-hand side, you see uh, our main detector, that is the liquid argon time projection chamber that the, I, I have labeled uh, the size of our detector over here. And then the detector is divided by two volumes. Uh, this uh, liquid on time projection chamber will provide us the uh, good uh, tracking and then the chromatry capability that allow us to do the hard argon uh, in interactions in, in great details. Uh, so the detector uh, here is a cartoon product showing you the detector is here. Uh, we have a series of uh, bin line instrumentation that, that can tell us uh, some information on the, the incoming particles. Here, here you can see there's a time of, of flight detectors that they tell us the time of flight information. You can see uh, on, on, the, on the figure over here, time of flight as a function of momenta. Different uh, red curves represent represents for different particle species, and then the the uh, the color color spot here showing you our real measurement. Uh, we together with the churn curve information, we know exactly which type of particles that are coming into our main detector. After the particles coming in inside our detector, uh, that we use the P Pandora multi algorithm to reconstruct the checks and showers. Here you see the blue checks. Here are the uh, cosmic ray checks, and then the uh, the purple one here is the reconstructed beam, beam particles. Um, protons and pions they are all very important uh, to the neutrino interactions. So for the proton uh, cross section channels, we are interested in the inclusive cross section. Uh, and then the subchannel will be the uh, elastic or uh, inelastic. 
So here showing you an event display of data that the problem comes in that they have elastic state here. You can, you can clearly see the interaction vertex over here. This is, this is the uh, uh, elastic scattering candidate. For the inelastic scattering uh, event here, showing you another example that being problem comes in and then they have multiple proton uh, being knocked out. For the pi and cross section channels that we are interested in the inclusive and then exclusive. Exclusive, we are specifically interested in the single charge exchange. Uh, single charge exchange means that the uh, charge of the uh, the final state pi ions will, will only differ by one unit from the initial uh, pi ion charge. So here I give you an uh, uh, event display an event candidate of the pion exchange events. So pion comes in and then the and then pi zero uh, being produced and then pi zero decay to two photon shells that you can see a nice image over here by our real data taking. Uh, for the pion absorption channel is that the pion enter, uh, entering our TPC and then get absorbed. There, there, there is no pions in the final state. For the cross-section measurements that we have established uh, an entire framework for the cross-section calculation. Uh, the first method is called thin slice method. Uh, it's, uh, it's initially developed by the Larry experiment. We think there's a good approach, so we also use a similar approach. Um, the, the principle of this method is that they here showing you a cartoon plot that the liquid temperature chamber so basically, uh, we use the white wide spacing and then to sync slat the detector into very many, many small volumes. And then each thing that is considered as an independent measurement. So for, for each independent measurement, you ask a question that um, if there is any interaction, if no, then you put into the instant histogram beam. Uh, if until the very end that you have the interaction happen, you put the So the ratio of these two uh, histograms will provide you the profile of the cross-section. Together with this scaling factor, um, scaling factor will be responsible for the, will, will be depending on the, the thickness of the target and then the, the density of real target. In our case, it's 100 bond for protein single phase. With, with this, we were able to calculate the cross-section uh, for our measurement. Uh, the second method we we have established is a uh, so-called uh, re-rating method. Um, so th the method is described as follows. So assuming you have a configuration of a Monte Carlo uh, setting, then you will produce one uh, Monte Carlo observable, but the only charge will be the data observable. Um, you can imagine that you can too many cross-section parameters, and then you can always compare with your data observable. By doing so, we can estimate the cross-section systematics as well as to use this method for the model-dependent cross-section calculation. For the pion event selection, uh, the general feature of uh, pions are uh, there's no charge pion in the final say. I just re rem remind you that there's a cotton prop showing the pion charge exchange and then the pion absorption over here. Uh, for the event selection, that first of all, we, we use the convolutional neural network to, to tell us if the total particles are track like or shower like. On the bottom figure over here, that the, you see here is the CNN track like score. Uh, if, there's, uh, if the, the particles are track like, it will be close to one. If the shower like, it will be close to zero. Um, the, Black dots here are our data points. And then you can see the purple histogram here will, will be the uh, protons. And then the teal histogram here will be showing you the pions. And then the green one is for uh, uh, showers. So we make a cut to, to, to select tracks. And then the second cut we use is to use the, uh, to use the proton chromatory uh, information uh, to identify, uh, to separate the pions in, in advance. So if the, the check lights particles are close to pi on the chi square. We're picking at the wrong one. You can see the the uh, the purple color showing proton over here, and then you you can clearly see that the uh, the 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 pi on is here. So we make a cut to select it to reject the pi on events. This will be a general feature for pions to uh, separate the in individual channels in advance. We look for the pi zero like showers. 
uh, and then we develop the two cards to do that. Uh, first cut is to use the distance to vertex uh, information to to uh, select the uh, the charge exchange candidate. You can see the green one here is is for the pi zero shower. We make a cut and then to sep to 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 separate the 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 two channels that I just mentioned. C similar profile can be similar cut can be used by use use the profile of the number of hits. The overall performance that we have achieved that the uh, the sixty seven percent for uh, for the for 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 the for this exclusive channel, and then for purity is for sixty six percent. Uh, there are many many works that are ongoing is to um, to optimize the this event selection uh, process. For the protons, we develop a, a cut to select the to label the different types of interactions. That is to use the normalized track lens. Uh, normalized track lens meaning that the reconstruct track lens divided by the CS, CSD range. We get the beam momentum information from the our beam line instrumentation and then converted it to the associated CSD range. The CSD range meaning the average track lens of stopping protons. So protons uh, travel and then they stop. And then uh, if the protons stop, it will be picking close to one. And then you see the tail here that are the um, the uh, inelastic scattering proton that they have interaction such that their track length is shorter than the stopping one. Uh, here is showing you the uh, overlay of our Monte Carlo simulation. You can see that the, we do have a good um, Monte Carlo simulation to des describe the data observables that the you see the red one showing you the inelastic component and the green one showing you the stopping proton and then the blue one showing you the elastic scattering. Uh, the overall uh, agreement between uh, Delta Monte Carlo is reasonable. And then this uh, parameter so that we plan to use this for the model dependent cross-section re-rating. Uh, to conclude my talk, um, the final state in the action is very important to neutrino uh, experiments. We are measuring the uh, uh, hadron iron cross-sections that will provide a very important um, inputs for, to better understanding of final state in the actions. And then they will be also help to achieve the dune physics goals, and that will be beneficial to the entire neutrino community. Uh, we have a very uh, fast pro process in good progress in both pion and then proton uh, cross-section uh, studies that we have established the entire framework. And then the, right now it's more focusing on how to make the, uh, um, the selection better. Uh, we will deliver more important pieces results, so stay tuned. Uh, just to uh, um, this all other, all other nice talk from my, my protein colleagues. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Do we have questions? People can raise their hands. You all are a quiet bunch today. I'm not allowed to ask questions about this because I'm a Dune collaborator, but it was a very nice talk. Thank you, Henye. Yeah. Um, our next talk is from uh, Miguel Angel Garcia Paris on cryogenic instrumentation, also at Protodune. So, can you go ahead and share your screen? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? I can hear you. And okay. Can screen. you see my slides? Yep, looks good. Uh, go ahead when you are ready. Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Miguel. And in this talk, we are going to review the performance of the cryogenic instrumentation at the Protodune experiment. So let's start. As you all know, Dune, that stands for Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, is a new generation neutrino experiment that is being built right now at the United States. Its far detector is being formed by four liquid argon TPCs that will be placed inside four huge cryostats as the one that you are seeing here in this slide. It's one of these cryostats will have 17 kilotons of argon mass, and they are expected to run for periods of time of 10 years long, even more, which means that during 10 years, the cryostats will remain closed. So in the meantime, we need a way of, of understanding what is happening with our detector. We need to know if everything is all right or if it isn't. So here is where the cryogenic instrumentation plays a fundamental role because it is going to be our eyes and our hands inside the cryostat once it is closed. Of course, Dune was not going to be built without previous experience. And we had before several prototypes, being Proto-Dune the last one of them. 
The protein experiment, which you can see in this picture, has been operating during the last two years at the CERN Neutrino platform. It consists in two different modules, the dual phase one and the single phase one. And almost all parts that are confirmed in the DUNE experiment have been tested here. And of course, among those parts, we find the cryogenic instrumentation. So what do we understand by cryogenic instrumentation? It is a group of different devices which aims to provide a comprehensive monitoring and understanding of the cryostat, the cryogenic processes, the detector, and the liquid argon itself during the different stages of the experiment, which will have a later impact on the physics results. Its ultimate goal is to ensure the long-time operational stability of the experiment. Here, you can see an inner view of the single phase module of Protodium that you can see is, has a volume of eight meters per eight meters per eight meters, which is pretty big. You can see highlighted the locations of some of the devices that form the cryogenic instrumentation. Here in red, you can see the location of the purity monitors. In yellow, the location of some of the temperature sensors. And in green, you can see the location of some of the cameras. We additionally have gas analyzers, level meters, and pressure sensors. And we are going to review all of them in the following slides. We're going to start, uh, to start speaking about the purity monitors that are miniature TPCs that can measure the electron lifetime in the liquid argon. If you have a look at this drawing, you can see that they have a cathode, they have an anode, they have a field cage, and they have an additional light source. When this light is fired, a cloud of electrons is generated in the cathode, and the electrons travels towards the anode. If we measure the charge generated in the cathode, and the charge that reaches the anode, we can relate these measurements with the electron lifetime in the liquid argon. It is really important to have a precise knowledge of this value because it doesn't matter how powerful or how sensitive your really liquid argon TPC is, because if the liquid, liquid argon is not pure enough, the electrons won't reach your readout system. Then your TPC will be basically blind. In the case of the single phase module, we have a vertical array of three purity monitors, each one of them at a different height. And in the case of the dual phase module, we have a vertical array of two short purity monitors and an additional long purity monitor at the bottom of the cryostat. We have them in different locations because we want to understand if there is any kind of relation between the location of the purity monitor and the purity of the liquid argon in that location. If we have a look now at the data, we can see that in the three cases, we almost reach or surpass the 10 milliseconds barrier in, of the electron lifetime, which means that from all the charge that is generated inside of our TPC, we are only losing a 10% of the charge, which is really good. Indeed, the Dune far detector requirement is to have at least a 3 millisecond electron lifetime. So we are exceeding by far these requirements. Now we're going to talk about the temperature monitors. They are sensors, as the one that you can see in this picture, that can measure the temperature. And they were placed inside both cryostats for two different reasons. The first one was to monitor the cooldown process and the filling process of the cryostat. These two steps of the experiment uh, were probably the most critical ones, because during them, the highest temperature gradients appear inside the cryostats. And if those gradients had been too big, our detector could have been damaged. So we use the temperature sensors to understand and to control those temperature gradients. The second reason to have them is because they are providing precise measurements of the liquid argon temperature. And when we say precise, we mean at the millikelvin level. Uh, there is what we call fluid flow simulations that are trying to understand and reproduce the liquid argon behavior inside the cryostat. They are trying to predict the electron lifetime everywhere in the cryostat. So we are using these precise measurements as an input for the simulations. So for example, in the case of the single phase module, two vertical arrays of several temperature sensors were placed to measure the vertical gradient of temperatures in the liquid argon. And here you can see a comparative of the experimental data and the simulations. We can see that there is some agreement between both, but we still have some features to understand from the data. In general, the typical gradient that we have been observing is of the order of the 10 millikelvin, more or less. And it has been really stable during these last two years. Here you can see a plot of the stability of the gradient during two months, and you can see that it is basically flat. And having such a small gradient in a big cryostat as protodyne points that the liquid argon is being correctly mixed, which is really good because uh, it does not provide the stratification of the liquid argon. Now, the cameras. 
11 cameras were placed at each one of the cryostats. Some of them were placed in the liquid phase as those ones, and some of them were placed in the gas phase as this one. This one is placed in, a, in an acrylic tube that can be accessed from the outside of the cryostat and can, can be reoriented at any moment, which is really helpful. In general, the cameras have been really useful for us because they have been our eyes inside the cryostat. During the cooldown process and the filling process, we use them to make sure that no part of the detector was damaged or even misalignment. And during the operational time of the experiment, we use them to monitor the high voltage systems for example, looking for possible sparks in the ground planes and to monitor the different movable parts of the experiment. Uh, in general, each time there was something going wrong inside the cryostat, we use them to try to locate the source of the problem. So that, that is why they have been so important for us. Here I'm showing you a picture of one of the purity monitors of the single phase module after the filling process. And here you can see a picture, an inner view of the field cage of the dual phase module during the filling process. Now, the gas analyzers. Gas analyzers are commercial hardware modules, as the one that you are seeing here, that measures the amount of a contaminant in the argon gas. As we have told before, we need to have the purer argon possible. And the gas analyzers are continuously monitoring the amounts of contaminants in order to get so. We need to have less than 100 parts per trillion of oxygen and water, and we need to have less than one part per million of nitrogen. Because if we have more, the physics can be compromised. Here you can see a simplified view of the cryogenic circuit of protodium, and the argon gas exits the cryostat through these gray lines. Here is where the gas analyzers are connected, and here is where the measurements are made. Finally, we are going to talk about the pressure sensors and the level meters. Uh, the pressure sensors are used to measure the pressure inside the, cryost inside the cryostat, either absolutely or relatively. Here you can see a picture of the pressure sensors of the single phase module. And the level meters are used to measure the liquid argon level inside the cryostat. Here you can see an inner view of the dual phase module in which you can see a long level meter here and a short level meter here. Uh, pressure and liquid argon level may seem like pretty standard variables, but they have a really high impact on the physics results. So it is really important to have them under control. For example, the absolute value of the uh, pressure inside the cryostat sets the absolute value of the temperature of the liquid argon. And at the end of the day, the electron drift velocity depends on the absolute value of the liquid argon temperature. In the case of the dual phase module, the electrons travel parts of their path toward the readout system in the gas phase. So we need to characterize as accurately as possible this gas phase. We need to know exactly which is the distance that the electrons travel from the liquid argon surface to the readout system. And for example, in the dual phase module, in the readout planes, we have placed um, level meters that are sensitive to displacements of the order of 100 micrometers. And you can see in this plot here. At the end of the day, uh, the pressure, the temperature, and the liquid argon level are variables that are dependent among themselves. So any kind of variation of any of them can generate changes in the other two. So this is why it's so important to have them under control, because we don't want the physics to be compromised. Here you can see the liquid argon level during a pressure cycle. And you can see clearly how the level grows as the pressure grows, and then the level goes down as the pressure goes down. This is something that cannot happen during the, uh, that data taking period, for example. Now, before finishing, I would like to show you a few examples of how we have used the cryogenic instrumentation during these last two years. As we were talking about the readout system of the dual phase module, uh, the dual phase needs the surface of the liquid argon to be as flat as possible. So any kind of uh, disturb in the surface of the liquid argon is not good for us. And in the dual phase module, for example, we have used the cameras to locate bubbles appear in the surface of the liquid argon. Here you can see the, the bubbles appear in the surface, and here you can see the bubbles appear in the surface. It has helped us to understand how to uh, fight these bubbles. As I told at the beginning, the temperature sensors were used to monitor the filling process. And they were used, for example, to measure the liquid argon level as the filling process was going on. And they are being used to monitor the level, liquid argon level as the emptying process is going on, as you can see here and here. In general, all the cryogenic instrumentation is really sensitive to any kind of variation that can happen in the cryogenic processes. So each time we saw a, um, 
a drop like that in the temperature data or in the purity data, we knew that something was going on and we could act quickly to solve the problems in the early stages. This is why the cryogenic instrumentation has been so important for us, because it has helped us ensuring the long time operational stability of the experiment. So that's all. As, as we have seen, the cryogenic instrumentation of the protodyne experiment has successfully operated during the first whole run of the protodyne experiment. And it has been extensively used during all the parts of the experiment, since the filling process up to the emptying process. And it has played a fundamental role ensuring the long time operational stability of protodyne. And of course, it will play the same role in the Dune far detector. What is next now? The cryogenic instrumentation has been already improved and it will be tested again in the second run of the protodyne experiment before its final deployment at the Dune far detector. And that's all by my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have questions for Miguel? People can raise their hands. I see no questions. We have a second though. Maybe I can give you a chance. To, do you want to say a little bit about um, what, what the improvements are for the run to cryogenics? Yeah. Yes, sure. For example, um, here, if you have a look at this plot of the of the purity, it might seem that there is some kind that it exists as a stratification because there is relation between between the location of the purity monitor at the and the purity that is measurement that is measuring. It seems that the top purity monitor is measuring higher purity than the bottom one. For the second run of the of the protein experiment, we are trying to figure out if this is real or if if, or if it is not. So we have we are going to exchange the electronics from both purity monitors to see if this, this is something real that is happening or this is something that is not real because of the electronics. This is only just one example. Great, thanks. Okay, we have a question from uh, Wen Cheng. I think you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, this is Wen Cheng. Uh, I couldn't find the hand previously. My question about the long-term stability of your cameras and the sensors, they are so important. Uh, are you going to replace them if they fail like five years in the road? Um, for the moment, uh, no, no one of the sensors has shown any kind of fail of the temperature sensors. And no one, I think no one of the cameras has shown any kind of fail. Uh, the, the cameras that are placed in the, sorry, here, in the liquid argon phase, they are not expected to run for a long time. They are just needed to run for a couple of years, but for the moment they have not failed. And the ones that are placed in the gas phase, uh, the good thing of them is that as they can be, um, ma be manipulated from the outside of the cryostat, they can be exchanged or replaced at any moment. So this is something that does not worry us really much about the future. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, last chance for other questions. Okay, uh, I, have have other... a, oh, I have a question. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, can you remind me what's the cause of the bubbles? Uh, the, you mean the cause of the bubbles? Yes. Uh, okay, uh, let me see if I have a picture of that. I think I don't have. Uh, in one of the corners of the joints of the, of the field cage of the dual phase, there was a kind of a space in which the argon gas was trapped and then it was released toward the surface. And this is what was causing the, the, appear, the appearance of the bubbles. So, so it's very easy to fix it then. Yeah, it was, it was easy. Indeed, we were making some kind of pressure cycles in which after raising the pressure a little bit, all the bubbles were released and then we had a periods of time without any kind of bubbles. Did you see the same in the phase, I mean, the, the double phase? No, this was seen, the bubble problem was seen in the double phase. Yes. And in the single phase, as far as I know, we haven't seen it, but I, I'm not completely sure because this is something that does not worry in the case of the, does not worry us in the case of the single phase module. Okay, so, all right. All right, thanks very much for the nice talk. I think we should go on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Kenneth Long talking about New Storm. So can you go ahead and share your screen? Very good, I see it.
There we go, looks good. You can go ahead when you're ready. Although I don't hear you yet if you're trying to speak. Yeah, you're still muted. There we go. Um, yes, there you are. Go ahead. Now we should be good. Okay, thank you very much. So it's a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to present New Storm, um, which I think uh, I would like to convince you is a unique facility for neutrino physics, but also as a place where one can do accelerator R&D for muon collider. Okay, so here we go. What New Storm is, is a small uh, muon storage ring, as um, was already described. Um, in particular, uh, it is using technologies which are only slightly beyond state of the art. So the goal is to create the muon beam by shooting protons onto a target, collecting pions with a horn, and then injecting the pions into the production straight of a storage ring. Um, the pi to mu transition is happening as the pions pass down the production straight. At the bend, only the muons are circulated. The pions are directed into a dump. On the first and subsequent passes, the decays are producing uh, neutrinos. In the first pass, you predominantly have uh, the pion decays producing new mu's. In subsequent passes, you get new e's and new mu's democratically from the muon decay. You can instrument that with a detector close by where you can make um, precise neutrino cross-section measurements and you can have a fire detector to measure the sterile neutrinos or to search for sterile neutrinos if that is required beyond the Fermilab short baseline neutrino program. So the goals then, the scientific objectives, or at least the neutrino science objectives of New Storm are written there. So percent level neutrino cross-section measurements. Of course, one of the particular features is the large rate of new E and new E bar you can get from the muon decay. And therefore, one seeks to measure with great precision and with sufficient statistics to look at double differential cross sections of new E and new E bar. And of course, one can make a sterile neutrino search. To do that, we really need to deliver a normalization, in particular, of the flux at the less or 1% or better level. We believe we can do this by instrumenting the storage ring. Uh, of course, the muons are going around many times, and therefore there's many chances to measure the, the muon uh, flux. We can look at the decays, so we can measure the electrons and positrons coming from the decay, and therefore we think we can calibrate the flux at that level. If we know the energy of the beam, and we know the energy distribution in the storage ring, we know the energy spectrum of the neutrinos very accurately, because of course the Michel parameters from the muon decay are known with great precision. So we really believe we can make precise prediction of the neutrino flux sent to the detectors. A key feature I've outlined is that in the pi to mu transition, there's a very bright flash of muon neutrinos, and I'm going to show you that on the next slide. So what you see here is the, is a, is the neutrino spectrum, which has been estimated from a stored muon beam of 3.8 GeV circulating in the ring. What you see on the left-hand side is the flash, uh, is the um, neutrino spectrum you get from the first turn. The solid dots are coming, so there was a stored, sorry, we were capturing pi plus. So we get a large flux of new mu from the decay uh, of the pions producing the muons. You can also see contributions from kaons and from the muon decays themselves. I think the key thing here is that there's a very large rate of muon neutrinos from the pi plus decay. And separated from that, there's a, a strong contribution of the new mu's from the kaon decay. In subsequent turns, the neutrino spectrum you get from the uh, from the decay of the new plus is shown here. So that the black dots are the spectrum that you get from the new plus, and uh, and the red dots are from the new, sorry, uh, the new mu bar from the new plus decay. Uh, I just draw this line on to draw your attention to the height of this peak. So the the pion flash in the first pass is very large indeed. Uh, but we're getting a, a very good flux of new E's from the muon decay. Uh, okay. I think one key thing, um, the shape of the spectrum, as I said, is very well known. We want to be able to store muon beams as a function of energy. So we want to be able to vary the energy. And this means that we can use the shape of that spectrum to calibrate the energy response of the detector. Okay. 
So if we would make uh, an instrumentation such that there's a fire detector, a distance of say two kilometers from a stored muon beam of 3.8 GeV, uh, and we also instrument a near detector, we can make sensitive searches for sterile neutrinos. Now, I've taken these figures from the publication uh, from a while ago. Um, and what they demonstrate is that for the allowed region that is coming from um, LSND, one is able to exclude that at a 10 sigma level. I think it's not the 10 sigma exclusion that um, one should focus on. I think one should look at that statistical weight as the power of the apparatus. Uh, and therefore one has an possibility to make really sensitive searches for sterile neutrinos should that be required after the SBN program. I don't have to explain to this audience that the searching for CP violation in long baseline experiments requires a good knowledge of the cross-section of the detectors, uh, sorry, the cross-section of the neutrinos. The absence of such knowledge can lead to systematic uncertainties in the oscillation parameters, and perhaps more pernicious, if the cross-sections aren't known, you can get biases in the neutrino parameters that you uh, estimate, which cannot be removed um, because they're, they're intrinsic in the data and you cannot uh, remove them by fitting uh, various samples. So you need to make um, precise measurements of neutrinos. So in revising the design uh, or the specification for the storage ring, we wanted to make sure that we could make the best possible measurements of neutrino cross-sections. So one way to look at this is to look at the compilation of data of neutrino cross-sections for um, uh, as a function of energy. And of course, we note that there are different contributions, both in the neutrino and in the anti-neutrino uh, fluxes. And there's a competition as a function of energy between the quasi-elastic, the DIS, and the, the resonance regime. And in principle, once the monster make measurements across that region in order to separate the contributions. Of course, high energy beams cost you more money. So we wanted to limit that range uh, from the upper end. And if you look at the place where there, where there is significant contributions from different processes, perhaps you want to look at measuring cross sections in the range 0 0.5 to 8 GeV. We then considered the, the detectors. So people are developing uh, very sensitive and very uh, high precision detectors, both for June and for hyper K. So now I think if you imagine that you can use these things to measure um, um, more of the hadronic final state and to constrain the, um, the kinematics of the event, we convince ourselves that a reasonable specification would be that we would want to be measuring over the range, say 0.3 GeV to 6 GeV. So now we're assuming that we're going to have a detector which is capable of measuring Q squared and W, or at least two parameters of the event. And now we want to therefore store a muon beam such that we can vary the stored muon energy up to 6 GeV. So what we've done is it's taken a specification for the stored muon beam energy is that it shall be variable between 1 and 6 GeV. That's actually quite a challenge for the accelerator design. So as part of the CERN Physics Beyond Colliders um, study, uh, there was a feasibility study of executing new storm at CERN. And I'm just showing you the outcome of that study, the, the, the new storm ring, uh, which was redesigned in order to store this range of momentum um, is shown here. Uh, those of you that know the CERN site will recognize that the, the west area here, um, uh, so it's on the French side of the West area uh, in land which is owned by CERN, which is, but which is not presently developed. Extraction is coming from uh, LSS5, from, from the SPS, and the proton beam is then transported through existing and new tunnels onto the target, and eventually the pions are collected and injected into the storage ring. A new detector hall um, has been positioned in the study at this point here. We've arranged that it's transverse to the beam line such that in the pion flash, one is able to use the off-axis technique to vary the, um, the neutrino spectrum that you're getting from the two-body decay of the pion. And we also noted that in a, a suitable distance, about three kilometers away, there is a place where a fire detector could be placed 
in order to make the sterile neutrino search. Of course, one of the focuses here is on measuring the neutrino cross sections. Um, and I pull out uh, a, um, uh, an old figure of, the, of a compilation of the neutrino cross section data. On the left hand side, you're looking at the CCQE, new mu and new mu bar cross sections. And on the right hand side, there's new E and new E bar. Um, so at the time when we made this plot, there were no measurements in this kinematic range. Now there are one or two. But I think the key opportunity for new storm is to use the flux of neutrino events, electron neutrino events, in order to make precise measurements across this plane. And of course, in order to do that, we need to deliver a flux precision at the 1% level and a large data set so that we can look at the double differential cross section. I think in this regard, there's a, there's a strong synergy in the physics with ENUBET, and, uh, and this is something which will be lovely to discuss going forward. Um, okay, so the Physics Beyond Collider study, the goal there was to find a credible proposal for citing the facility at CERN, and this was, uh, I think, achieved. Um, what we found was that the SPS can deliver the beam. There is a place where we can put it which does not interfere with existing tunnels, and therefore um, it is possible to implement new storm at CERN. We identified challenges, in particular the magnets in the decay ring, and we need to do a detailed evaluation of the radiation protection and other issues around the target. So I just want to comment on the possibility for, for the uh, development of a muon collider. Um, I emphasize here that in because a muon is a fundamental particle, in principle, the discovery reach of a 14 TeV muon collider is similar to that you would get from a 100 TeV proton-proton collider. So there is interest in developing the um, um, uh, technology to deliver a muon collider. And how NewStorm could contribute is through the target and capture. The large aperture ring in particular is a demonstrator for large aperture acceleration that would be required at the, uh, to deliver the muon collider. In particular, one could do a 6D cooling experiment to follow the muon ionization cooling experiment that run at Rutherford Lab, and the storage ring instrumentation would be very important too. I note that in the European strategy, there is the recognition that the measurement of neutrino cross sections is an important contribution to the long baseline program, and perhaps that's a thing that the Europe could develop. And I've stolen a slide from Andrea Long in from the Neutrino Conference, where he is emphasizing the possible synergy between the implementation of ENUBET at CERN and NewStorm. And I think this is something we need to discuss going forward. So then these are my conclusions. NewStorm, when we implement it, will be a unique facility. It will be able to deliver percent level electron and muon neutrino cross sections. Um, it will be able to deliver exquisitely sensitive sterile neutrino searches, and it can serve in particular a 6D cooling experiment and become a muon collider accelerator testbed. We've established the feasibility study through the Physics Beyond Colliders study group. And as a step towards the muon collider, I think um, we demonstrate that muon beams of this kind can be used to deliver particle physics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? People can raise your hand. Uh, I see one from Francesco. You should be able to go ahead and unmute yourself. OK, yes. Uh, I just want uh, to stress uh, once more the point that, that Ken uh, raised. Uh, that is, uh, if you look uh, at the first part of uh, New Storm, uh, the transfer line, uh, uh, most of the features that are requested for Inubet are also the same for uh, for uh, new storm. Uh, uh, I see that the current beam line of Inubet is practically the same length of uh, new storm. So this is a, a great opportunity for a synergy for the two projects. It's just a comment. Great, thanks. Other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Maybe you could say um, what are next steps towards actually realizing this? Like what practically needs to happen next? Uh, well, I think um, we, so two things I think are the immediate thing. I think we need to engage with the snow mass process. I think there's lots of expertise uh, in the Americas that would be extremely valuable to develop this program. 
separately, I think the, the vehicle through which we can develop the activity uh, comes in two forms. Uh, one is, as uh, Francesco said, um, forging uh, an appropriate collaboration with Inubet. The other, I think, is engaging with the Emerging Muon Collider collaboration uh, in order to um, create the conditions where we can do the design study that we need. So we can, we've demonstrated feasibility, but we have not carried out the work that would allow you to know how you would do it in detail or what the detailed cost would be or where you have to break into the um, existing rings and stuff like that. So I think those are the two things we need to do. Great, thank you. I'm not seeing any other hands, so thank you again for the nice talk. The next speaker is Maylee Sanchez talking about Annie. So Maylee, you can go ahead and share your screen. Hi. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you. And I see your screen. All right. And let me make this big. Okay. Right. Can you see so that okay? Yep, full screen now. So go ahead when you're ready. All right, perfect. So um, thank you uh, for inviting me. The, I'm here to talk to you about the progress we made with the Annie experiment. And uh, forward. Um, so Annie is a neutrino experiment that we've deployed on the uh, Fermilab uh, booster uh, neutrino beam, the same as in the shore baseline. Uh, program that you probably saw in talks uh, yesterday. And uh, it is aimed at better understanding neutrino nucleus interactions and specifically the neutron uh, yield from uh, these interactions. We are also an R&D platform that will develop uh, and demonstrate new neutrino detection technologies and techniques in particular fast photosensors and uh, different detection media as I'll talk to you a little bit later um, about. We're a small but um, international collaboration, and you can see us here just before we couldn't meet in person anymore. Uh, that's literally like the weekend before. Um, what I'd like to tell you about is that we have built this detector. We filled it uh, with uh, uh, gadolinium loaded water since December 2019. Uh, we have all of these major systems in operation, undergoing a commissioning and calibration phase, and the fast photosensors uh, are being prepared to be deployed. And we can show you first neutrinos and calibration data in this talk, and then you expect to have physics quality data taking uh, in the in the late fall um, this year. So um, the main physics of Annie is to measure the multiplicity of uh, final state neutrons uh, as a function of outgoing lepton momentum and direction, and um, as you know, neutrons are a major component of the nuclear recoil system. And as it turns out, a source of missing energy in neutrino reconstruction and detection, which then ends up being a significant systematic uncertainty, for instance, for long baseline uh, neutrino experiments. Uh, so this is a, a, a poorly uh, known uh, process that uh, needs uh, certainly a, a direct measurement. Uh, so in order to carry out this measurement, we um, I'm going to use water loaded, um, uh, sorry, gadolinium loaded water, uh, where the neutrons uh, will capture because the, the gadolinium gives you enhanced cross section, say, for instance, over, uh, uh, over hydrogen captures. And we'll have a high flux of neutrinos provided by uh, the booster beam. Other features uh, that we expect to, to use is the fact that we are in the same beam as the short baseline program. In fact, just behind the, the SBND, the, the near detector of the short baseline program, which is a liquid argon detector. And it provides an opportunity of doing combined water uh, on argon cross-section analysis on the same flux uh, and being able to uh, then uh, do measurements that allows you to relate to what is essentially the two big programs in neutrino oscillation physics uh, in the world. Um, it also allows you the potential, the measurement allows you the potential to model uh, the atmospheric neutrino background for a number of interesting searches that are going to be 
pursued uh, by Super Cameo Candid now that it has just recently uh, uh, loaded with uh, gadolinium to pursue very interesting physics. So, and some of the, the key point is that we will analyze the high statistics sample that, uh, that is uh, relevant to a number of different uh, measurements uh, that are ongoing uh, in neutrino physics. So here's the ANI detector. It's a 26 ton um, gal, gal with uh, sorry, the 26 ton steel tank loaded with gadolinium um, loaded water. Uh, we have 132 uh, photomultipliers from a, a variety of origins. Um, we have also five of these fast photosensors that I'll talk about uh, later that adds 300 uh, readout channels. And we have a muon range uh, detector that has alternating layers with a uh, two inch uh, iron absorber uh, in between the muon paddles. So that's the ANI detector, a neutrino interaction in ANI then looks like uh, you will have a neutrino uh, charge current interaction in, in the fiducia volume uh, here where the uh, vertex reconstruction will be given by the fast photosensors and then the muon with, uh, momentum will be reconstructed by the muon uh, uh, range uh, detector. Uh, after the interaction, you will then have neutrons uh, uh, traveling and scattering until they terminalize. Once they terminalize, they will generate uh, the key signature, just these 8 uh, MeV uh, gammas which produce the flashes of light that then are detected by, uh, by the PPTs. Uh, we've done something like this uh, before. So we uh, did an engineering run in 2016, 2017 in a partially instrumented uh, version of the detector. You can see it here with just the bottom uh, PMTs uh, instrumented and um, as it happens, the, the your, your, uh, most important background is in time uh, neutrons uh, with the beam that are coming from neutrino interactions, uh, either in the in the rock behind the detector or in the uh, from the beam dome and producing them, uh, sort of scattering them through the air and in a, uh, what is known as sky shine. And you can see from our data here that uh, the water essentially mitigates the. Um, uh, these neutrons, as you go down, this is the a vertical scan in the blue. Uh, as you go down into the detector, you see less and less of these neutrons. And if you go forward again from the detector, uh, from the wall of the detector, then you see again less. So uh, the water buffer allows you to uh, mitigate the neutrons from coming from the, uh, from the beam. We have done um, uh, the installation over the, the past year. You can see our, our detectors are going through the Fermilab site into the Annie Hall, uh, which is the old Saigon Hall for those who are familiar with the site or that experiment. And we have developed a small uh, purification system that allows us to uh, not filter out the, the gadolinium while keeping the, the water transparency, uh, which has also recently been published uh, in, in just. So we've been gadolinium loaded since December 24th. And we have run a calibration campaign using LEDs that uh, went for one thing, it, it tracks the transparency of the detector. You can see here number of uh, photoelectrons per pulse um, as a function with this sort of a slow loading of the gadolinium. Uh, and you can see how that transparency has been uh, maintained uh, throughout. We also ran a uh, uh, calibration with uh, uh, an AMBI source for sort of neutron calibration. And you can see uh, in this plot here, the green is the, um, the neutrons when we have the source uh, and just the background when we have no source is a very small um, down here. You can also see that the neutrons, um, uh, the candidates, the number of neutrons follow what you would expect uh, in, uh, in time uh, once you do a fit to that. So we have excellent water transparency and we demonstrated that we can see neutrons. Uh, we have also seen uh, neutrinos. So we um, are reading out a 70 to 80 microsecond windows with the PMT system, which results in a uh, over 90% uh, neutron capture efficiency. Uh, and so in this uh, 
uh, long readout window, you can see that clearly 1.6 microsecond time, which is what we expect from the beam uh, spiel. And you can see it zoomed here, uh, uh, sort of a close uh, look uh, at that. So we're observing neutrinos from the beam and then you would expect, right, the neutrons to show up here once we're doing the, the measurement. We will um, have parallel data streams for the LAPPDs and the, and the muon range detector, which we combine later with GPS tagging. So here's our uh, first neutrino beam candidate event from back in uh, late January. Um, we can see PMT hits close on time. That's that tiny graph here. Uh, those are all of the PMT hits very uh, closely closer in time. You can see the Cherenkov disk. This is an outgoing muon uh, in the anion tank. And you can see no veto activity. So it's not something coming from the rock, um, as well as the clear long track in the uh, muon rage detector. So that's sort of one uh, neutrino beam candidate. And then last, um, talk about the uh, LAPPDs themselves. So these are these la large area picosecond photo detectors that have been developed uh, for a while now. Um, there are 20 by 20 centimeter tiles based on microchannel plates. They have a resistive and emissive coating and microstrip anode readout. Uh, and they have fast photo detector capabilities, a 60 picosecond time resolution and an excellent position resolution. Um, that um, that will give us substantial uh, benefits in terms of uh, uh, or reconstruction. The ANI has obtained five of these LIPPDs, in fact, uh, shown uh, here, and uh, we have we're characterizing them at the um, at a facility at Fermilab to be deployed later in the summer. In fact, I can show you what the performance is for some of these styles. This is the time resolution from our own data, our own characterization, and uh, they fill the specs also in terms of uh, things like after pulsing uh, and uniformity. You can see that uh, QE uh, is very uniform for uh, this style, uh, which are sort of early uh, production uh, tiles from, um, from income the company that produces them. Um, so then in the last uh, few minutes, I'll just talk a little bit about the future of ANI. I said we're a platform for uh, detector R&D. We also plan to add a uh, water-based uh, liquid scintillator, which is this detection medium uh, in which liquid scintillator droplets are dissolved uh, in water. And it promises to combine the best of both worlds. We can have the directionality and kinematic reconstruction from the Cherenkov light and the calorimetric reconstruction from the scintillation light while still maintaining high transparency, low cost. And combining these with fast photosensors, it would be possible to separate, you know, Cherenko from scintillation light. So we have a plan of putting in a 500 liter uh, of this liquid into any uh, in a vessel for um, over the next uh, year. So this, we see Annie as a first step in a series of efforts that will develop a series of detectors that offer new capabilities. Uh, for instance, Watch, Watchman is one, a detector for uh, sort of non-proliferation purposes, or TEA eventually as a fourth model of opportunity in uh, the DOOM program. Uh, so here we're testing the small uh, sort of the, the, uh, the technologies that might eventually be used in detectors like this. So I'll close, I think my, my time has run out. So I'll, I'll close with uh, telling you and reminding you that we have now demonstrated we can observe uh, both neutrons and, and neutrinos. We have an LAPPD deployment uh, coming up in, in the summer and we'll be ready for physics data taken this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions for Meili? You can raise your hands. Not seeing any. I should probably know this. How well? How good is the energy reconstruction in any? Uh, well, so I don't. We don't have quite the numbers yet. I mean, we've been very busy doing the um, the the um, all of the installation and the uh, um, and the characterization of the LAPPDs. Um, so I don't. I don't have a number for you, Elizabeth. But uh, but we will show those soon. Okay, I'll be patient. Thank you. Um, last chance for questions. 
All right, I don't see any hands. So thanks, Mealy. Our next speaker is Rory Fitzpatrick talking about uh, the first new E cross section on argon measurement at Argonude. And I already see your slides, very good. Okay, and you can hear me. I can hear you just fine. And okay. yes, you've okay. just gone full screen. So go ahead when you're ready. All right. I'm going to be talking today about Arcanute's most recent measurement, um, an electron neutrino cross section on argon. Uh, this happens to be the first measurement of this kind on argon. Arcanute was a very small LRP TPC that was deployed at Fermilab and took data about 10 years ago now. Uh, it sat underground directly in front of the MINOS near detector uh, and received neutrinos from the NUMI beamline. Uh, most of the data was taken in low energy antineutrino mode. And in that data set, we expect to see about 100 new E charged current interactions. And I want to note that throughout this presentation, when I say new E or electron neutrino, I'm referring both to new E's and new E bars because Argonut can't distinguish between the two. And so we combine them. The other thing to take note of uh, is the flux that Argonut observed. The neutrino energies peak in the few GeV region, which is an interesting energy region and happens to be the region of energies that is most relevant for Dune. In studying electron neutrinos in large TBCs, traditionally we use two handles to separate signal electrons from backgrounds, typically gammas, uh, uh, from neutral pion K. First, we expect that electrons are generated at the neutrino interaction vertex, whereas we expect a gap between the neutrino interaction vertex and the start of the gamma shower. And second, we expect DDX at the start of the electron shower to be about 2 MeV per centimeter, whereas we expect it to be about 4 MeV per centimeter for photons. And so you can use both topology and calorimetry to differentiate between electrons and gammas in large TBC, but this quickly becomes complicated at higher energies where DIS interactions are prominent and you expect quite a lot of activity around the neutrino interaction vertex, which can overlap um, the vertex related information that you need in order to make this distinction. So we have to start thinking about the showers more holistically in order to make this determination. Some other things to consider when studying data in Argonut is first the statistics. Argonite only ran for about five months. As I said, there's only 100 events we expect to see in this detector from the start. So there's a limit to what can be done to inform interaction models, um, but there's much that can be used to inform both reconstruction and selection techniques in studying this data. Argonite was also a very small detector, so we can't use a fiducial volume cut to move sufficiently far away from the edges of the detector to remove external EM-like backgrounds. Um, and you'll see in future slides that this becomes sort of the most mitigating factor for making this selection in Argonut. And then finally, an advantage that Argonut has is it sat directly in front of the MINOS near detector. And so we can use MINOS data to reject charge current muon neutrino interactions uh, in trying to select electron neutrino interactions because the muons produced typically enter the MINOS detector and can be tagged very easily. So I'm gonna to touch briefly on reconstruction and some of the pre-selections we do before getting into um, the details of the selection itself. First, we designed custom shower reconstruction tools for this analysis. And in particular, it was designed to reconstruct only the leading, maximize the efficiency for reconstructing electrons. Second, as I mentioned, we use MINOS to reject new mu charged current interactions by projecting tracks reconstructed in MINOS backwards and checking if they crossed the Argonut detector. If they did, we rejected that event. And then finally, there are some basic quality cuts that remove additional through going muons which are produced upstream of the detector uh, that were missed by the MINOS filter and then some other common reconstruction failures that are sort of easy to reject outright. The one thing that I think is most interesting about the shower reconstruction itself is you can see that for quasi-elastic like events, the reconstructed DDX at the vertex of the shower is nicely peaked around two where we expect it to be. But as you move towards more complicated event topologies and get into the realm of deep and elastic scattering events, you see this long tail up to higher measurements of DDX, which means we can't just rely on this handle to identify electron neutrinos in Argonut because a lot of the DIS interactions have higher than expected uh, vertex DDX. 
So in order to characterize the full topology of the shower, uh, we design a set of selection variables that are intended to characterize both uh, the longitudinal development of the shower, starting at the vertex and moving towards the end of the shower, as well as the transverse development of the shower, because we know what electromagnetic showers look like in large DPCs. Uh, when relevant, though, we have to charge normalize these variables because Argonut is a small detector and we can't rely on containment to select events. And so nearly all of our events exit the detector, meaning we can't reconstruct energy in a straightforward way. So all of these variables that we design are charge normalized in order to get around the fact that we don't see the full shower. After defining that set of variables, we use them to train a BDT that's intended to identify signal based on the reconstructed shower topology. And this BDT serves two purposes. It distinguishes well-reconstructed signal from well-reconstructed background. Um, but the second purpose is to reject reconstruction failures. And that's because in designing the shower reconstruction, we had the goal of reconstructing as many electron neutrino showers as possible, knowing that further down the line in this selection, we could reject things that had been reconstructed in error based on their topology. Um, and you can also see that in the distribution of this BDT, the external background, this brown uh, distribution, tends to contri contributes the most to our background before um, the BDT selection. But these tend to be typically reconstructed and they also tend to look extremely background-like. And so they pile up at lower BDT scores. The other thing I'll say, I had mentioned that the gap between the neutrino vertex and the start of the shower vertex is typically used in analyses like these. In Argonut with the high neutrino energies that typically result in large track multiplicities and the fact that we can't see the full event typically because it exits the detector, um, this all complicates automated reconstruction of the gap, um, yielding very weak separation power, and so we don't use it at all in this analysis. Uh, so because the external background contributes most significantly here, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about it. Originally, we observed a deficit in simulation relative to data of this external background. I show a couple examples in data on the left. You can see these are quite obviously events that are generated outside of the detector, um, but produce some kind of EM-like activity inside of the detector. And we see this deficit because Argonut simulation only includes neutrino interactions that happen inside of the cryostat, not ones that happen external to the cryostat. There's an additional time dependence, which would make this hard to model because Minerva was actively being installed in the same cavern during the Argonut data taking. And so, we developed an approach for handling this external background. Uh, first, we wanted to understand and correct for this deficit that we observe, and then validate that correction, which is a scale factor as a function of BDT score using a hand scan of in a back only sideband to confirm, our, to confirm that uh, the expected external background number matches what we observe in data after our correction. But in order to mitigate uncertainties associated with the scale factor, we also pick a very stringent signal selection with very high purity, which essentially removes all impact this external background has on the selection. And then we additionally assign a very conservative uncertainty, which encompasses uh, the multiple correction methods that were tested in trying to understand this external background. So we understand it, but we've also moved its impact, the final result. So with all that in mind, we define our signal selection to be interactions that have a BDT score above 0.9, uh, which gives us 13 events in data. Of those 13 events, we expect about 11.2 to be signal and about three of them to be background interactions. This yields just over 10% efficiency with almost 80% purity. And you can see that the reconstructed DDX of the signal-like events are here peak nicely around two with good agreement between data and Monte Carlo given the statistics. And one example of one of the selected interactions is shown on the right. Uh, it was nice to see that this selected event matched a selected event that was picked in a previous argument analysis that relied on hand scanning. Um, the nice thing about having so few events is the fact that we can show you all of them. Um, so these are all 13 events that were selected in this analysis. 
Um, and I'll get more into the topologies of these events um, in a future slide. Um, but you can see they, they do generally agree with our expectation of the topologies given the selection we've defined. And we do see sort of down here, the three obvious backgrounds. Uh, we can also extract a cross section with these 13 events, which agrees with Genie. And then because we know that the angular resolution of the reconstruction is very high, we also extracted a differential cross section in terms of electron neutrino angle with respect to the new medium line, which again, agrees with uh, simulation given the high statistical errors on this analysis, uh, which dominate our systematic errors. It's also worth noting these cross sections are defined to be combined new E plus new E bar cross sections, because as I said, we can't distinguish between the two. I'll also note that the dominant systematic uncertainties or they are extremely subdominant to the statistical uncertainties are uh, the Hadron formation zone used in Gini, which is relevant to the multiplicity near the electron or the neutrino interaction vertex, and also the quantity of the external background, though it is still, as I said, subdominant to any statistical uncertainty we have here. And to give you a sense, these are the neutrino beam, em beam energies we're working with. And so finally, I wanna talk a little bit about the signal topologies. Um, as I showed you, the topologies for the events we selected tend to be simpler topologies. And if you look at a sample of simulated electron neutrinos, you can see that the selection at 0.9 is extremely efficient for quasi-elastic-like interactions um, and tends to be less efficient for deep and elastic scattering interactions. This isn't surprising. Um, we were sort of forced to this very stringent selection because of the external background, but we can assume that future detectors won't have this issue because they'll be able to move further away from the detector walls. We did, however, do a subsequent hand scan of a looser selection for BDT score above 0.7 which remain consistent with the expectation of topologies in the sample and also yielded a larger sample of very clear high multiplicity deep and elastic scattering interactions that were selected using this method. And I've shown two examples here. Um, you can see this one's a nice electron neutrino event that also includes a pi knot. And all that said, there are also these cases where deep and elastic scattering signal and background events are simply impossible to distinguish because you have so much activity coming out of the vertex. And so there's a certain ceiling you reach with trying to reconstruct these complex topologies. And so finally, I'll just end to say that this is the first end-to-end -end automated reconstruction and selection of electron neutrinos from neutrino beam data on argon. And it's particularly interesting because it's GEV scale neutrino beam data. And it provides unique insight into the challenges of working with this energy data. Um, and it's also important to keep developing techniques like this to cross-check um, the machine learning based techniques that are currently being developed too. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions? You can raise your hands in the Zoom. All right, I have one. So you have a fairly low selection efficiency. Do you have a sense of how much of that comes from having to deal with this external background because you can't make a fiducial volume cut? Like if everything else were equal, but you were in a bigger detector, do you know what your efficiency would be approximately? Yeah, so it's, it's hard to estimate because there are a couple things that are conflated. There's the external background, and there's also just the fact that we can't see the entire event because they're not contained. And so it makes it harder to start reconstructing events to begin with. So the limit in efficiency here is in part just the reconstruction efficiency itself. How many we, showers we actually say these look like showers. Um, so the biggest limitation here in efficiency is the actual reconstruction itself and future detectors will also have a benefit there. Um, bespoke reconstruction stuff. Okay, thanks. Other questions? All right, I don't see any, thanks again. So our last speaker in this part of the session is Vincent Basque speaking about recent progress in Lariat. So you can go ahead and share. There you are. There you go. I see my video yep. right now. All right. I see it and I hear you. So you can go ahead whenever you are ready. All right. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, my name is Vincent. I'll be talking about the recent progress in Lariat and it will go quickly. It's just the last hour before the break. Uh, so 
Uh, funnily enough, uh, the detector that Rory was just describing, Arginu, uh, this is basically what Arginu has become after being at the, the new Mu beam line. So as you know, it, Arginu and Lariat uh, are uh, very small uh, large PCs. And I made a table just at the bottom here to just give you a sense of, of the dimensions and the type of uh, collection system and wire spacing that we have uh, in these large PCs. But the, diff the main difference and the big important thing about Lariat is that it is a test beam experiment meaning it was at the end of a known, uh, beam of known charged particles. So just in front of uh, the layer at TPC, there was uh, auxiliary detectors to ID uh, the particles and their momentum. And we use that to do a particle selection. So the physics, pro the program, the whole program of layer, it really combines some physics and R&D goals. And these are very important because uh, they can provide crucial calibration information for what I call the not so future large TPC. So the SBM program and, and Dune. And if you're curious, here's a link to the, the detector paper. Uh, most of the information I'll be talking about today is in the paper. So what goes inside the TPC? Well, Laird had uh, three wire planes. The outer plane was acting like a shielding plane. And then the two uh, innermost were the readout planes uh, at different angles, obviously to make the 3D reconstruction we had a, and had about a 240 wires per plane. Uh, the nominal field was the typical 500 volt per centimeter. And if you're curious, uh, during the various run of Laird, there was different pitches uh, from four to five to three millimeters. Uh, the two, two things that really makes a layer uh, uh, very special at this point is that it used coal electronics uh, versus other experiment at the time that didn't. So the coal electronics were actually attached to the PC and inside the crash stat. And the other main thing, main very big difference for, from Arcanute is that we have light information. Uh, there were PMTs, and SIPMs and even our PUKAs that were attached to uh, the cryostat uh, to actually detect the light that we get out of uh, large TPC events. Uh, so this is the Fermilab accelerator complex. And just to point out that Laird sits uh, or sat at the test beam facility, which is at the end of the 120 GeV proton beam here at Fermilab. Uh, but we're not looking at these uh, proton exactly. So as this proton beam goes into uh, the test beam facility, uh, it interacted or hit a, a tungsten target, which produced a secondary beam of mainly pions that will then go towards uh, the layered enclosure. But again, this is we're not looking at a pion beam, we're looking at this tertiary beam. So what happens is this pion beam actually encounters another target, a copper target here, and then these, the particles that are produced, so this whole family of electron, muon, pions, kaons, protons, and deuterions, both in in anti and, and in non-anti particles uh, are produced. Uh, so these particles will go through the whole beamline auxiliary uh, detectors and then go to the TPC. So uh, I'm sure many of you are aware, but these, te these test beam experiments have different components and the main components are really these time of flight to actually know the time it took the particle from, from exiting the, the sphere collimator to just before it enters the TPC, as well as these wire chambers in red where we can actually track the particle to especially get gets its trajectory and the dipole magnets that really helps us to essentially make a spec mass spectrometer of the particles. And these magnets, uh, we actually have different intensity and both in negative and, and positive polarity, which actually gave us a chance to, to choose uh, the sign of the particles. Uh, but now that we have these, we can act, we have this, this beam line auxiliary detectors, uh, we can, uh, identify the particle species using the combination of the time of flight, the wire chamber hits, and the magnet polarity. And we can make these very nice plots that, we, that I'm sure you've seen before uh, on a, that's on the bottom left, where I just plotted the time of flight versus the reconstruct, reconstructed beamline momentum. And you have these nice bands uh, for the different particle types. So for example, the big band right here is really where uh, you have the overlay of the expectation of, of the protons. And you see a really nice one here, and then you can even see some deuterions and some kaons here and then the rest are just accumulated down here. But now that we have uh, these beamline particles, we can actually select them by uh, either rec uh, looking at the mass that they have with the information that we have here. But now we want, to, if we want to, let's say, do a, a proton analysis, well, we can select these and then we need to see where they are in the TPC. So this is when we can use this uh, wire chamber hits where we look at the projected track. So if you want the wire chamber projected track into the TPC, and then we can look at the tracks that mostly match uh, the, the, the TPC tracks, sorry, that mostly match the projected tracks. So we can have 
some parameters that actually guide us to help us uh, determine which tracks that we're actually looking for. Uh, now that we have these particles, we know what they are, where they come from, and where they're on TPC. Uh, I can talk to you about the, the actual physics program of Laird. So the main thing, main physics, was really look at these hadron interaction cross section on argon. So especially the pions and kaons, we can also perform protons. But as well, Laird uh, also, as I mentioned before, did a lot of R and D. So the three uh, main things that I'll try to talk to you about today is, uh, you know. Uh, this color which calibration of, of beam particles because we know these particles they're coming from the beam and interestingly enough it the the, the particles that Laird sees are are in a they cover the phase space that we get from accelerating neutrino interaction so it's really important to be able to identify them uh, another cool thing that we've done is really combining the scintillation light and ionization uh, ionization charge in analyses to see what we get out of that and we even performed some antiproton annihilation in, on argon so the first thing I'll, I'll go over is the total cross-section. And Laird, if you want, has two firsts. Uh, it's the first measurement of total cross-section on liquid argon in this energy range, about less than one GV, for both the pi minus, which is on top, and the K plus uh, here on the bottom. So on the left side, you see it's, it's the B, essentially the composition of the beam with the, the data in black and then the, the simulation, the contribution of every particle type uh, simulated uh, in, in the bands. So if we start for the pions, you have this big yellow band and this trend, and then once you uh, select your particle in the TPC, you can actually calculate the cross section. So a few comments uh, on this cross section. Uh, the uncertainty is really dominated by uh, systematic. There was a lot of pions, but the, really the systematic is really what's dominated here because uh, it's really difficult to the removal of background interactions with decay and capture. But overall, there's a good agreement with Gian for prediction, and there's final cross check ongoing uh, with pi plus analysis that is also progressing in parallel. And then we can do the same thing with kaons. There's simply much less kaons. So there's about a thousand TPC event uh, that were selected here. So obviously the statistical error uh, dominates over. Uh, there is some tension uh, in with the, the kaons interaction mode, but uh, this measurement can, also, can actually help uh, in its tuning. So two very important measurements. Uh, as I quickly mentioned before, uh, the antiprotons are also made in the beam line. Uh, it's a very small it's a very small amount of them, and you can't even see it here. But uh, we've seen there's about a hundred antiproton candidates that have been found uh, annihilating at flight or rest inside the TPC. Uh, so why do we want to look at these uh, antiproton uh, uh, events? Is uh, their annihilation can help the neutron anti-neutron oscillation searches because the topology of the event is very similar. So this is the star shape that you can actually hear see in, in one of the events the star shape event that you have. Uh, and the outgoing energy of these particles is about the same for both the neutron oscillation and the, the, the proton and antiproton annihilation, which is about you know, twice the mass of the proton. So the goal of this analysis is to look uh, at the, uh, uh, or to measure the algorithm species, species, energy, and direction. Uh, so here I have two of my uh, personal, personal favorite events, which you can clearly see uh, that something that would be like a, anti-proton candidate that comes in, annihilates, and then creates these very nice uh, star-shaped pattern. Uh, the other thing that, that Laird has done is try to improve the collection efficiency. Uh, the scintillation light that gets produced in large TPC is, is uh, quite, uh, it's a low wavelength. It's 128 uh, nanometers. And this is not, uh, most conventional uh, light sensors cannot uh, actually see this light or blind to this light. So typical ways is to cover a, a delight sensor is with uh, some uh, wavelength shifter. And here have a nice example of a uh, PMT covered with uh, some wavelength shifter. So in this case, it was TPB and how it glows into the visible range, which can actually be seen by a PMT. So instead of, of coding uh, a light sensors, uh, Laird has decided to cover the whole uh, field cage of the detector of the TPC of uh, a TPB coded on reflective foils. Uh, so the, the cartoon here, if you want, uh, elaborates on how, how it works. You have your VUV photon that gets in, comes in, uh, interacts or gets absorbed by the TPB. And then if this is re-emitted in the opposite direction of where you want it to go, it will continue, but then it will hit this reflector and bounce back. And then we can actually recover uh, the light that you would normally lose. Uh, so here, what I've shown is, uh, is, what, is a simulation of what of the amount of light that we expect, so the light yield. So on the left, we have, if you only coat, coat the actual light sensor, uh, you have a very big uh, spot 
of where you expect your photon to be. That's totally what's expected. But if you code the, 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 the actual field cage, you have a very nice, most, more, uh, more uniform and high light yield across the whole detector, which is very nice too. That can enable measurements such as this one. Uh, so what can we do with all this light? Uh, so what, what we have done, we have done essentially, if you want to prove a concept by looking at uh, cosmic Michel electrons. So these are low energy uh, electron emitted by uh, stopping a uh, muon inside the detector. And we, we dedicated some scintillation like trigger to be able to catch them. And what we have shown is if we do analysis only looking at the charge information, or if we also add, or if we combine the, char the light information to this charge information, we see that we recover, uh, if you look at the truth information, which is uh, this dotted line on both graphs, you see that we recover a lot of it, uh, especially at the tails where uh, we recover what we would normally lose. So we really uh, mitigate these, these low energy tails and all and a lot of information that we lose uh, is partially recovered. Uh, here, there's a very nice paper if you want to read more information on how this analysis was performed. Uh, so layer may be small in size, one of the smallest, uh, but it, as you could, I hope I convinced you that it is clearly rich in physics. Uh, we have used the Fermilab uh, testing facility and we have performed uh, measurements of the total, the total uh, cross-section on pions, uh, pi minus and K pluses at this uh, low, uh, one GB range. Um, we've shown the, the powerful or how powerful uh, having more light in the large TPC can do and what it can do uh, for energy reconstruction. And another thing that we are currently working on is looking at what we can do out of this uh, 100 candidates of anti proton annihilation. And all of this information is uh, really important for the, the short baseline neutrino program at, at, at Fermilab and obviously Dune. And please stay tuned as uh, more of these uh, results uh, are currently pipeline. Thank you. Questions for Vincent? I see one. Go ahead, Wen Cheng. I think you can uh, yeah. unmute yourself. Uh, this is Wen Qing. So the idea of coding the entire detector case is in really interesting. Yeah. I, um, is there any north of uh, night? Seems as there isn't. I don't quite understand this, actually. If there was what, sorry? Night north, not, for example, some absorption in the TPB. Light north. Interesting. I'm not sure. Uh, I guess. So. What you could, I mean, the, the, the whole process of wing uh, uh, changing or wavelength shifting the light is very fast. And uh, if you think of a larger scale, uh, you could think that some of the visible light would take longer maybe, but it actually uh, takes, uh, it actually goes quicker in liquid argon. There's less really scattering for the visible light. So maybe at long distance, you, you get a, you recover a lot of the light that you lose, but actually to, translate that into noise, I'm not actually sure. Okay, and, and the plot on the right actually show that you don't, I mean, you actually get for doing this. Yeah, right? okay. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. You. you see that you don't have a spot, so you, your, your light sensors are in the same, in the same places, except uh, now they're, they're, your photon really needs to go there to actually be detected, while here it can go all around and the visible light is what you actually measure. You don't really measure the, the VUV at this point. You measure the wavelength shifted light if you do it, do it this way. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Last chance. All right, well, that ends this part of the session. Thank you to all of the speakers for the very interesting talks and for being so good about being on time. You made my job very easy. Um, so I appreciate that. So in the schedule now, we have until half past the hour for a break. And when we come back, uh, Vit will be in charge. So I will say goodbye. Do you have any announcements, Vit, before we go away? Uh, yes, I would like uh, to, first of all, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I would like to encourage uh, people who didn't ask questions during the session that uh, you can discuss uh, things uh, at the uh, matter most. This is one thing. Second is, uh, uh, I would like to uh, encourage speakers of the second half of, uh, of today's session uh, to test uh, their 
audio video uh, during the break. That's all. Thank you, Vit. Uh, this is Wen Jing. I have a quick question. Will you also use this digital reminder? Like, has it been used? Uh, why do we use what? A digital display on the slide with two minutes and one minute, one minute reminder. Will you continue to use that? So uh, the speakers in the first session has uh, this re uh, reminder display on their slides two minutes before the end of the talk. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we still going to use that? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, great. That's very useful, I think. I agree.
Good afternoon. Uh, let's start uh, the second half of the today session. And uh, the first speaker of is Laura Bernard, who will uh, talk about spallation background in the Super Kamiokande experiment. So, Laura, please, can you uh, share? Uh, your screen. Yes. Fine. So let's start. You have uh, 12 minutes. and I uh, will be speaking on behalf of the Super Chemical Collaboration on the spallation background uh, in this experiment. So the Super Chemical experiment has played a major role in astrophysics by investigating low energy neutrinos and uh, notably it has been instrumental in the characterization of the 8 spec uh, solar neutrino spectrum and also it currently exhibits the best sensitivity to relic neutrinos from distant supernova, and there will be a talk on this tomorrow by Sonia Elidri. So while solar neutrinos are uh, detected through the elastic scattering um, of uh, uh, electronic neutrinos, we use the electronic anti-neutrino flux from the supernova relic and detect them through the inverse beta decay. We expect very few events, 5 to 20 events per year. This is a very weak signal. So the advantage of using this uh, IBD interaction is that we have a time and space correlated signal. Uh, you can see it on the screen here with a prompt signal and also a delayed signal coming from the, the capture of the neutron on the hydrogen in water. So this is a very weak signal, it's 2.2 NG gamma. But this helps reducing the background. And uh, if you look at the, the right plot, so the si signal and backgrounds from uh, for supernova relic anti-neutrinos, you can see that there is a, a kind of golden region here where the neutrino from supernova seem to be reachable. Uh, the main neutrino induced backgrounds are reactor antineutrinos and atmospheric antineutrinos. However, in this golden region, there is actually a background that is very dominant and uh, it comes from uh, new installation in water. This is also dominant in the solar searches. So this, this background is well characterized in liquid scintillators, but uh, not yet in water detectors. And uh, this is why we need simulation, and uh, this, uh, what, this is what this talk is, is about. Um, so this is the Super Kamiokande detector. It's a water Cherenkov detector located a, in the Kamioka mine in Japan. It's uh, 1,000 meters underground, and at this depth, we have around uh, two uh, neurons uh, per second. It's composed of an outer detector, inner detector, and the fiducial volume is 22 kilotons. So the PMTs are used to, uh, to read the lights uh, from the Cherenkov effect. Now we are in the phase six. Sorry, can you hear better? Okay, I think I've, I forgot to put this. Um, so now we are in the phase six, and uh, an important point is that uh, uh, our Japanese collaborators have just started loading the water with some gadolinium that is dissolved in the water. And this will greatly improve the neutron tagging. Uh, as you can see here uh, from the IBD, for example, the neutron will be captured on gadolinium, and this is an 8 MeV gamma cascade, so which is much easier to see. So this will uh, greatly reduce the spallation background. Here we can see an illustration of the muon-induced spallation in the Super Kamiokande water tank. What happens is that the muons uh, produce daughter particles that initiate electromagnetic and hadronic showers through successive spallation processes. And today we know that hadronic showers are the dominant process in the production of unstable isotopes. You can see the isotopes here in red and the decays of these isotopes, so mainly uh, electrons, positrons, gammas or neutrons, 
or a background at low energy, so below 20 MeV. A good point is that the shower and isotopes can be located uh, by the neutron captures that come from the neutron from the hydronic shower in the medium. So how do we deal with spallation in the data? Um, the information has been extracted directly from the data. So we looked for correlation between uh, low energy events, so the isotope candidates, and the muon track, such as transverse distance and longitudinal distance to uh, the maximum of um, deposited energy of the muon. And more recently, there is also the neutron cloud that is used to locate the hydronic shower. And for that, there's a trigger system that is used called WIT, and it allows for a lower threshold to see the 2.2 MeV gammas from the neutron capture on hydrogens. So although the background, the spallation background is eliminated at uh, about 90%, we still need to reduce uh, even more this background. So, uh, so this is the point of the simulations. So we start um, our simulations from uh, simulating the muon flux at the super Kamiokande level. And for that, we use music, which is a 3D Monte, Monte Carlo code for muon propagation through the rock developed uh, a long time ago, um, I'm sorry, in 1997. And um, to reach um, the super Kamiokande tank, a muon must have an energy that is greater than 1.3 TV. And the mean energy of the muons reaching SK is uh, 258 GV. But the spectrum is quite uh, wide and it can extend up to several TV. So when, once we have this uh, muon flux at the super K entrance, um, we used FLUCA, which is a fully integrated particle physics Monte Carlo simulation package. Um, it's uh, good to know that the first FLUCA based simulation of a vertical um, muons in the water tank was already done in 2014. So what we did is that we reproduced this simulation and we improved it, ad adapted it uh, better by using the real music flux and also adding the mu plus components um, of the flux. And this actually reduces the isotope yields, mainly um, the nitrogen 16. And most importantly, we interfaced uh, FUCA with the official simulation of SuperK. So you can see here a comparison of the isotope production. Red is the data for the different isotopes produced. And uh, you can compare to the green dot. That is our simulation. The comparison is within a factor of a few, which is consistent with uncertainties from uh, nuclear physics models. We also developed very recently a giant four based um, simulation of spallation, and we compared it to Fluga. Uh, we are quite happy with it because uh, the overall observables are very well reproduced. You can see here the path length of all the particles in the shower and also here the distance to the muon track of the particles, left for giant and right for fluga. And uh, we also checked um, the yield of the dominant isotopes and they are within a factor of four. Um, however, there is a bit of a discrepancy for lithium-8 which is the third most important uh, isotope. But anyway, these simulations are about to be implemented in a giant four super Kamiokande simulation, which is called WCSIM. And this will allow better understanding um, of the reconstruction and also could be of, of interest for the hyper case studies uh, since it's already um, coded in WCSIM. So we chose um, to use the, Flo the Fluca simulation to interface it with uh, uh, the official Super K detector simulation, which is called SK Sim and which is Giant 3 based. So we really needed to evaluate how to propagate the Fluca events to SK Sim without repeating interactions. So since the unstable isotopes are mini produced in the hydronic showers, we saved this information from Fluca, so pions, neutrons, gammas up to the isotope decays. And, uh, and we input this in, uh, in the SK date sim, where we turned off the creation of secondaries in the hydronic processes, and also the muon nuclear interactions. And for the electromagnetic part, we let SK date sim take care of it. 
So you can see here an example of simulated event with the generated muon track, reconstructed muon track after applying uh, the reconstruction uh, features. In green, the neutron cloud and red, some isotopes. Of course, the tricky part is the muon and shower energy deposition and reconstruction. So going to the comparison of data with Monte Carlo, uh, this is actually the first comparison that is done for a uh, for spallation background in water. We used the supernova relic analysis of May 2020. And you can see here the muon directions uh, in the entry of the detector, so X, Y, and Z. This validates the music simulation, although we have some uh, discrepancies that are still uh, under, under study for um, the track length of the muon. Here, if we look at the energy deposition of the muon, we, we, can, uh, we have several observables like the total deposited charge, the, the residual charge, so the total minus the, um, the minimum ionizing uh, part, also the charge in the higher segments and the location of this uh, higher segment. These, this, these results are actually quite good and validate they are on the way of validating the Fluka shower model and interfacing with uh, SK scene. Now, if we look if we look at the isotope candidates, so um, we uh, the the main observables are the um, the transverse distance to the track here in blue. This uh, is a very nice agreement. However, for the longitudinal distance from the from the isotope to the to the maximum of deposited charge, so in orange here, we have a wider um, distribution than in the data. So we need to investigate potential misreconstructions of uh, of this uh, maximum of the EDX. And finally, the neutron cloud is uh, so the neutrons are very abundant, so they can be used to locate the shower. And uh, here you can see also observables like transverse distance of neutrons to the muon track, uh, which is a really, really good. And uh, we have this longitudinal distance of the neutrons to the muon entry point, which is slightly different, like in the case of the isotopes. So these studies are still under progress, but it is very promising. And uh, most of all, with the recent uh, dissolving of the gadolinium in the water, we expect to have a very uh, much better tagging of the neutron captures. And since I have 10 seconds left, I will speak a bit about gadolinium. So these are the first runs. Um, and we officially see the neutron captures on gadolinium after uh, showering muons. You can see here the height of the detector and the radius and uh, how day per day the gadolinium, so the, the neutron captures of, of, of gado on gadolinium are uh, getting upper and upper in the detector as the gadolinium is being spread. So this is promising upcoming results. And in conclusion, so muon-induced spallation is a dominant background for solar and supernova relic neutrinos. And uh, we need simulations uh, in water to improve rejection now. So those simulations are uh, already in place with cross checks between Fluca and Giant 4. And uh, I showed you first comparisons to data. Uh, we find nice agreements um, for this uh, first comparison. And of course, this is still under study. And uh, we wait for a new analysis uh, thanks to the gadolinium in water. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laura, for a nice uh, talk. Uh, questions? I see one hand raised. Uh, it is uh, Wen Xu. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Wen Qing. So very nice hi. talk. Um, I'm super interested in this. Uh, Fluka and the data uh, are quite consistent, but you said Jian4 has uh, uncertainty about the factor of four on one of the dominant uh, component. Does that mean Gian4 is less favored by the data? So I'm not sure I understood exactly what you said. Could you repeat? You said right. that uh, you were surprised that the, this data is consistent with the Fuka well, plus Giant four, plus Giant three simulation, or you were speaking about Giant right. four? Simulation? Yeah, this one, this slide here. Okay, sorry. So um, this is to compare with uh, Gian4 with the Fuka, and yes. the, the data support the Fuka. Does that uh, imply Gian4 is not? 
uh, consistent with FLUCA with a factor of four? Oh, for the yields. Right. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, we have uh, several uh, factors. Like we have a factor of four uh, for boron 12 and uh, for the dominant one, which is nitrogen 16, there's a factor 2.2, something like this. But uh, actually, it's, uh, it's quite consistent with the uncertainties that you get from nuclear physics models. Um, so. Okay, but does the data, uh, would the data speak on this at all? Maybe not directly. I'm you, sorry, you, I, I don't you, understand uh, the word that, that you use. Sorry, uh, can you compare this with data directly? Maybe oh. not. Um, so you mean doing this plot here, but with a giant? R right. Like the... yeah. Okay, we haven't done this yet, but uh, it, uh, we have the numbers, but haven't done the plot yet. But uh, so we would have, you would see here for nitrogen 16, for example, this uh, factor of uh, two uh, difference uh, with a uh, giant. So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit different uh, indeed. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And this is why actually we, we wanted to do these two comparisons. So these two simulations to really compare the yields and other. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you, Laura. I'm sorry we don't have time for other questions. Uh, so you can uh, continue discussion on a uh, matter most. So the next uh, speaker is Mark Scott, who is talking about uh, long baseline neutrino oscillation sensitivities with uh, hyper cameo -cande. So Mark, please. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? And can you see my screen? Yes, I do. I hear you. Perfect. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank you all for letting me come here and talk about the long baseline neutrino. If you can neutrino. speak louder, it will be better. Certainly. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to come here to talk about the long baseline neutrino oscillation sensitivities with Hyper Kamio Um, The biggest news since the last ICHEP conference is, of course, that Hyper K has been approved. Uh, so KEK has agreed to operate and upgrade the J Park beamline to 1.3 megawatts, and the University of Tokyo will construct and operate the Hyper Kamio Kande detector. Uh, and actually construction has begun. You can see the uh, work yard on the bottom right of this slide uh, and operation is due to begin in 2027. So Hyper Kamio Kande builds on uh, an illustrious history of water Cherenkov detectors in Kamioka. Uh, this started with Kamio Kande in the 1980s. Uh, we just heard about Super Kamio Kande, which is currently taking data. Uh, and as you can see here, the size of these detectors has grown with each iteration uh, by about a factor eight uh, at each step. Now, these are water Cherenkov detectors, uh, and so they're looking for the Cherenkov light from charged particles produced by neutrino interactions. Uh, you know, a muon neutrino will produce a charged muon, which doesn't scatter in the water, so you get a very clearly defined uh, Cherenkov ring on the wall of your detector, as shown on the bottom left. Uh, and an electron is lighter, it scatters from the electrons in the water, and so you get a more diffuse uh, ring appearing. And so we can use this technology to separate muons and electrons with a greater than 99% purity and have very uh, precise momentum and direction reconstruction. So the hyper Kamio Kande experiment, I said before it's an increased uh, power neutrino beam and a larger far detector. Uh, so in total, these give us a factor 20 increase in statistics uh, compared to the T2K experiment. We also have a new intermediate detector planned for Hypercamia Kande, uh, and will inherit upgraded near detectors, uh, which you'll hear about in the talk following this. Uh, and finally, we have improved photosensors, uh, which double the quantum efficiency compared to SuperK. Uh, and so you can see there's talks listed here later in the conference uh, discussing these developments. Okay, so this is the first neutrino oscillation talk of this uh, session today. Um, as you can see on the top right, I've written out the oscillation probability for neutrinos. Uh, and this uh, probability of a alpha type neutrino 
oscillating to a beta type uh, depends on these mixing matrix U, uh, the mass squared of the neutrino, and the distance and energy uh, that is traveled. And so in these long baseline experiments, we're measuring the flavor composition of our neutrino beams as a function of L over E to extract uh, these mixing parameters. Something that's unique to the next generation of uh, long baseline experiments is that they're really going to have the statistics to test uh, CP symmetry directly uh, by comparing neutrino beams to antineutrino beams. And so if we see a difference in the measured uh, oscillation probability, as you can see on the bottom here, uh, then that would be direct evidence for CP violation in the neutrino sector. Okay, so a quick word on formalism. Uh, we're following the standard PMNS description of neutrino oscillations. So we have three mixing angles, theta 2, 3, theta 1, 3, and theta 1, 2. Uh, we have three neutrino mass states, giving us two mass splittings, uh, delta m squared 1, 2, and delta m squared 2, 3, uh, and a single CP violating phase, uh, delta CP. Now there are three main questions that we want to answer in neutrino physics. Uh, the first is, whether theta 2, 3 is above or below 45 degrees. Uh, this is referred to as the octant theta 2, 3. Uh, the second, we want to know the neutrino mass ordering, uh, whether the M3 neutrino mass state is heavier or lighter than the M1 and M2 states. And this, you have either normal or inverted ordering. Uh, and then finally, the big question, of course, is uh, whether neutrinos violate CP symmetry. Uh, so these are the questions we want to answer with hyperkamiokande. Uh, so, as I said, this is a much larger experiment than T2K, uh, and so we have much greater statistical power. Uh, I'm showing here the expected number of events in our electron neutrino sample uh, for the neutrino beam mode on the left and the anti neutrino beam mode on the right. Uh, we've taken these, uh, estimated these, sorry, by scaling the existing Super Cameo Cande Monte Carlo uh, to the hyper K. Uh, fiducial volume and exposure. Uh, so this includes the full uh, likelihood-based Fitkun reconstruction that has been so powerful at Super K. Uh, having done this, we end up with about uh, 2,300 electron neutrino events and just under 2,000 uh, electron anti-neutrino events, assuming sine delta CP is zero, so CP is conserved. Uh, we can then compare this event rate to what we see in the detector for different values of delta CP. Uh, shown on the bottom. And for example, in blue here, if delta CP is minus pi by two, you see that your electron neutrino sample has increased relative to delta CP equals zero, and your anti neutrino electron like sample is decreased. And so it's by comparing the relative, ra sorry, the relative rates of these two samples that we have sensitivity to delta CP. Uh, alongside the electron neutrino samples, we also have a very large selection of uh, muon neutrinos approximately 10,000 uh, in neutrino mode and uh, 12,000 in anti-neutrino mode. Okay, so this talk is focusing mainly on the oscillation analysis of hyper-K, uh, and this follows the TTK analysis method. So we have a parameterized flux model and a parameterized uh, interaction cross-section model. These are then tuned and constrained by a suite of near detectors, and the result of that is passed on to our far detector simulation, where we use simulated events uh, to produce constraints on our oscillation parameters. Now, I've made a case for the large statistics at uh, HyperK. Uh, and because of this, I'm going to have a particular focus on the systematics that we assume in these uh, sensitivity studies. So to start, for the neutrino flux uh, on the left, we take the NA61 shine uh, thin target hadron production data and its associated uncertainties uh, to provide the hadron production uncertainties in our flux. Uh, we also take the JPARC neutrino beamline measurements uh, to give us uh, additional uncertainties on the focusing of the beam. Uh, for the neutrino cross section, this is based on the NUT uh, 5.4 uh, model and the T2K 2018 uncertainty model as our baseline. It's described in the paper here. Uh, one significant change with respect to that model is that uh, the T2K model has a heuristic a nucleon removal energy uncertainty, whereas for hyper-K, we've just included this 
directly as an energy scale uncertainty uh, at type k itself. Uh, we then take the T2k near detector fit, which constrains these models to the uh, near detector data at T2k uh, as our initial starting point for what we expect the hyper k near detectors to be able to do. Um, once we have this, we scale the uncertainties uh, accounting for the extra exposure at hyper k, but also the improved near detector performance, uh, which Mark Hartz will talk about in the talk following this. Okay, so putting all of this together, uh, all of the analyses I'm showing here assume 10 years of hyper-K data. Uh, we have a one to three ratio of neutrino beam to antineutrino beam. Uh, and unless it's stated otherwise, this is not including the atmospheric neutrino sample. Uh, the plot here shows our sensitivity to exclude the wrong uh, sine squared theta two three octant uh, as a function of true value of sine squared theta two three. Uh, the blue dashed curve is assuming the T2K 2018 systematic uncertainties. And then the dashed red is the improved systematics uh, that I just spoke about, uh, whilst black is the statistics only measurement. Uh, and to put some numbers on this, the uncertainty on the muon neutrino rate uh, from the T2K analysis is about 4.6%, uh, whereas the improved hyper-K systematics, we estimate this to be uh, just under 2%. Uh, so we're really reducing those quite significantly uh, and improving our exclusion uh, values of uh, the wrong octant. Uh, so with this analysis, we could achieve a three sig sigma exclusion uh, for sine squared theta two three below 0.47 and above 0.55. Moving on to the CP violation sensitivity. Uh, the plot here shows our ability to exclude CP conservation versus the true value of delta CP. Uh, again, the blue curve is for the T2K 2018 systematics model. Uh, the dashed red is our improved model and black is statistics only. Now you can see the black uh, curve here shows a real power to exclude uh, CP conservation due to the high statistics of hyper K, um, but systematics have a considerable effect uh, you're dropping from about 11 sigma down to just over six sigma uh, with the T2K systematic uncertainty model. Um, and putting this together with our improved systematics, uh, we expect to exclude roughly 60% of the true values of delta CP at five sigma uh, after 10 years data taking at hyper K. You can look at this over time. Uh, so the plot again is showing the percentage of true values of delta CP for which CP conservation can be excluded as a function of running year of hyper K. Uh, and the gray area is a three sigma exclusion. The red is a five sigma exclusion. And the only thing to point out here is that we can really achieve a quite significant result, a three sigma CP violation measurement over about 50% of the allowed values of delta CP after only two years of operation. So even with a relatively short, small data set, we can do some really uh, interesting physics measurements. Uh, finally, another quick word about uh, CP violation and the systematic uncertainties. Um, so the plot here shows our sensitivity to exclude CP conservation, um, but each curve now uses the improved systematics for hyper K. Uh, the only difference is our assumption of the new E over new E bar cross-section uncertainty, uh, going from 3.6% in purple uh, up to 2% in blue, 1% uh, in red, and then zero for statistics only. And just to give you a ballpark figure, the current theory uncertainty is 3.2%. Uh, so it's just better than this uh, dashed purple line here. So clearly, if we want to really get all of the benefit from the next generation of long baseline experiments, uh, we have to measure this new E over new E bar cross-section uncertainty as well as we possibly can. All right, so the final study I want to show is the effect of adding atmospheric neutrinos. Um, as you know, these have longer baseline and higher energy than uh, the beam neutrinos are hyper K, so give us some sensitivity to the neutrino mass ordering. Uh, this is the same CP sensitivity plot again as we've seen before, uh, but this time we assume that the mass ordering is unknown. And in this situation, the beam analysis only, shown in red, you can see there are some regions of delta CP where we have a reduced sensitivity. If you add the atmospheric uh, neutrinos to this, 
this sensitivity improves uh, dramatically, and we can actually exclude these regions of delta CP at five sigma again, uh, whereas the beam only, we were not able to do so. And if you look at the um, significance of excluding the incorrect mass ordering by itself, uh, hyper-K can achieve a four to six sigma exclusion, uh, depending on the true value of sine squared theta two, three. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Uh, I've presented updated hyper-K long baseline oscillation parameter sensitivities here, and what we can do after 10 years of data taking. Uh, the final plot here just shows our ability to exclude CP conservation, assuming delta CP is uh, minus pi by two or CP is maximally violated. Uh, so you can really see that hyper-K is a, a yeah, order of magnitude better than the existing T2K and even the T2K2 uh, experiments. Uh, and yes, if anyone's interested in the astrophysical sensitivities of hyper-K, uh, Jan Osan is giving a talk uh, tomorrow at 10.30. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mark, for interesting uh, talk. Uh, unfortunately, we, we are rather late, so I would prefer to conti uh, continue with the next talk. And uh, Oh, 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 this is. Uh, another Mark, Mark Hartz, uh, will, uh, will, will talk about uh, new detectors for Hyper K. Yep. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, and you can see my slides? Yes, I can. Okay, right. So yeah, thank you for this uh, opportunity to talk about our new detectors for Hyper-K. Uh, so I think Mark already described well in the previous talk uh, what the Hyper-K experiment is. Uh, we have a, a new very large uh, detector with 187 kiloton uh, fiducial mass in the Hyper-K detector and also uh, upgrades to the beam to get higher beam power. Uh, and uh, as I'll talk about in this talk, uh, upgrades and new near detectors to help us control uh, systematic uncertainties for the experiment. So, so Mark already talked about how we have very large uh, samples of um, electron neutrino or anti-neutrino candidates that are used in the CP violation measurement, about uh, 2,000 candidate events of each uh, that allow us to see um, the, the CP asymmetry uh, potentially very clearly if, if, it's a, if it's a significant CP effect uh, in the neutrino oscillations. Uh, but of course, with this very large statistics, there's a lot of statistical power uh, in, in the data that will be collected. So we really have to control systematic uncertainties. So we're talking about a 3% error on the, the CP violation measurement, um, uh, statistical uncertainty and for example, T2K's published uncertainties are around 6% at the moment. So these uncertainties can enter in through the um, neutrino flux model or the neutrino cross-section model or, or the detector model, but we'll primarily focus on the first two since they're constrained by near detector data. So talking about the neutrino flux model or the beam systematics, uh, we can kind of think of different categories. So one is, is just the, uh, uncertainties that come in the modeling of the hadron production in, in the, the target for the experiment. And of course, there are external hadron production measurements that are used to really constrain this. Uh, but there can also be, for example, um, uncertainties in the beam direction. Uh, when you're using an off-axis beam like Hyper-K is using, what that essentially does is shift the, the beam peak here. Uh, so, so we need measurements to constrain the beam direction. Uh, and then uh, there's also potentially uh, uncertainties in the wrong sign contribution of the beam. So these are the defocused. So when we're running in anti-neutrino mode, these would be say pi plus that are defocused, but they're still some significant contribution to the overall flux. In the case of uh, uh, anti-neutrino mode of the beam, the neutrinos are enhanced by the, the, the relative cross section. So we have to care about that background. So measurements that constrain that wrong sign contribution of the beam are important. On the interaction modeling side, we're primarily looking at quasi-elastic interactions, so interactions of a, a single bound uh, nucleon, and we reconstruct energy based on the, um, the kinematics of the, the charged lepton that we observe in the final state. In a water Trankov detector, typically the, any uh, emitted uh, protons are below Trankov threshold, so we don't see them. 
but there can be nuclear effects that change both the, the strength of the cross section and so also this energy inference. So, for example, you can have this uh, two nucleon uh, process where uh, you're essentially scattering off of a, a pair of correlated nu uh, nucleons and you have multiple nucleons in the final state and the energy reconstruction for those won't be the same as uh, quasi-elastic. Uh, so modeling those types of uh, uh, events that aren't quite quasi-elastic and can affect the energy infer inference is very important. In particular, for example, in the theta 2, 3 measurement where we're looking at uh, an oscillation effect uh, and many of the events that populate the region in reconstructed energy where the oscillation effect is largest are feed down from events with uh, much higher true energy. Uh, another important point that Mark mentioned is the uncertainty on the electron neutrino cross section. So typically we're measuring muon neutrinos in the near detectors, but it's electron neutrinos that we see at the far detectors when we're measuring CP violation. And we have a theoretical uncertainty on these. It's a roughly estimated to be around 3% or a little bit larger. It depends on another, a number of things like phase space differences, and how different the cross-section can be in the regions where the phase space is different, um, uh, form factor uncertainties in lepton mass dependent terms and, and radiative corrections. You can read more about some estimate of these here, uh, but there is a theoretical uncertainty on the difference between these two cross-sections. So to, to try to constrain uh, things for hyper-K, uh, we uh, plan a, a suite of near detectors that essentially includes three different uh, parts. So the uh, Ingrid on-axis detector, uh, so that will essentially monitor the beam rate and, and measure the beam direction. Uh, and then there's a will be a magnetized uh, off-axis detector that's based on the current ND280 detector for T2K and further upgrades of that both for T2K and uh, Hyper-K. And that has the capability to measure hadrons below Cherenkov threshold and is also magnetized so the wrong sign component of the, the beam can be measured. Uh, and then a new detector called the Intermediate Water Trankoff Detector, which is a, uh, a kiloton scale water trankoff detector that gives us a, a, a water target. Uh, and I'll, as I'll talk about later, we make measurements at different off-axis angles, which is uh, an important feature of, of that detector. So quickly uh, to comment on Ingrid. Uh, so this is a, it essentially is a cross configuration of uh, neutrino detectors that consist of uh, 14 modules with uh, each module having alternating iron and scintillator layers and a total of 10 uh, tons of target mass. Uh, so essentially this monitors the neutrino or anti-neutrino rate of the beam as a function of the position of these detectors. And from that we get uh, the, the beam direction measurement uh, but it also is monitoring the, the beam event rate with very high statistics. So if there was some change in the beam configuration that changed the production of neutrinos or antineutrinos, we would likely see it uh, in Ingrid first. Uh, and then for the magnetized detector, so uh, if you attend uh, Davide's talk uh, on the uh, ND280 upgrade for T2K, you'll, you'll learn more about this uh, detector. But T2K is in the process of uh, upgrading the magnetized ND280 detector with a, a planned installation in 2022 and operation for T2K from late 2022. And this consists of a new uh, target, uh, segmented uh, scintillator target, uh, and so-called horizontal TPCs above and below that target, uh, and time of flight detectors that are used to, to measure particle uh, direction. So the idea here is that uh, we want to improve on this and, and bring it into the Hyper-K error, giving us a well-understood detector at the, the, the start of Hyper-K, although we think that there will probably be uh, additional upgrades that are needed. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what we're getting out of this upgrade, the new time of flight detectors allow us better to distinguish uh, the direction of high angle muons, which is important for measuring the wrong sign contribution of the beam. The high angle TPCs give full angular coverage, which uh, really wasn't present uh, in, the, uh, in the original uh, T2K uh, design. Uh, and this super FGD target uh, uh, gives uh, uh, better segmentation in three dimensions, uh, which allows for uh, improved uh, spatial resolution in, in the reconstruction of short tracks, for example, or detection of particles from neutron scatters. Uh, and you can see that this is showing the threshold um, of the efficiency as a function of proton momentum for reconstructing protons. Uh, and uh, the red is this upgraded FGD and, and the, the, um, the, the dash line is the old uh, T, T2K, uh, ND280 FGD. So there's significant improvement there. 
Okay, so then I'll move on to the intermediate water Trankoff detector. Uh, so this is a kiloton scale water Trankoff detector, and it's located about 750 meters from the neutrino production point. Uh, essentially, there's an instrumented detector in a, a 50 meter deep pit. Uh, and by controlling the water level in that pit, we can actually move that instrumented detector to different off axis angles away from the, the beam direction. So ranging from one to four degrees off axis. Uh, this detector will have new multi PMT photo sensors that I'll talk a little bit more about later uh, inside it. Uh, and by, yeah, by making measurements at these different off axis angles, we can really probe the energy dependence of the uh, interaction cross section. So, um, and another possibility for this detector is to load it with uh, gadolinium, as you heard about in the Super K talk, this is now being put in Super K, uh, to, to have uh, neutron tagging uh, in this detector as well. So the reason we wanna make the measurements at different off axis angles is that we get a different neutrino spectrum uh, as we vary the off axis angle or the position of the detector. Uh, and essentially we can use these as a, a way to untangle uh, the relationship between neutrino energy and what we observe in the final state. So an example of how we do that is we use these spectra as a set of kind of basis functions and we combine them with some linear weights to make a very narrow narrow band uh, neutrino um, spectrum. Uh, and then we can take what we observe in the detector as far as the, the final state charge lepton uh, and combine them with the same weights. Uh, and then what we get is a reconstructed energy distribution um, for the, the very narrow distribution uh, in the, that we deduce from the spectra that allows us to measure things like the amount of feed down that we see uh, in the spectrum and do that with precision of about 5%. Another thing that we'll do in this detector is to uh, uh, measure the electron neutrino cross section. So we do have uh, electron neutrinos and ampton neutrinos in the beam from muon and kaon decays. Uh, with a, enough detector mass, we can get decent statistics on these. And a water trank off detector is ideal for this because there's large active volume that allows you to veto on what's usually a dominant background, which is externally produced high energy gammas. So there's work done on this type of analysis. This external gamma background is really controlled very well in, in the water trank off detector. And preliminary measurements show that uh, uh, precision down to around the 3% level can be achieved, but it does depend on how, how well we control the systematic uncertainties, particularly on the flux model. So, so there is work to, to try to understand if that can be improved. Uh, and there's quite a bit of work going on uh, for this uh, R&D for this detector, including the uh, development of, or the testing of different uh, uh, three inch diameter PMTs that can be used in this and actually trying, for example, to find PMTs with very good uh, timing resolution uh, so that we have uh, uh, the performance that we need. The development of a FADC based uh, electronics readout that actually goes inside this multi PMT module so you can see the, the readout board here uh, on the base uh, plate of one of these modules. And then you can see an assembled module, prototype module uh, on the right-hand picture here. So this is essentially putting 19 PMTs inside a single module that goes in the water along with the electronics. So there's really only uh, a single cable coming out of this uh, uh, module. So with the better timing resolution and also spatial resolution that comes with these smaller PMTs, uh, we really want to take advantage of them. So there's also quite a bit of work on the application of machine learning uh, to this detector. Uh, this is just showing uh, one uh, ROC curve here where you can compare the green line, which is a kind of traditional reconstruction tool, uh, and the, the, um, this orangish yellow line, which is a, a, um, a machine learning based uh, algorithm. Uh, and the rejection of uh, a muon background when looking for electron signal uh, becomes much stronger. Okay, uh, so we're developing this new detector. Uh, we wanna be able to test detector components and make sure we understand the calibration and the performance of this detector. So we actually have planned to build a, a prototype scaled down version uh, of about four meter diameter and four meter tall and put that in a charged particle beam at uh, CERN. Uh, and this will allow us to then have fluxes of, of, of known particle type and momentum entering the detector and we can study the detector performance. Uh, so this has actually been submitted uh, to the CERN SPSC with the proposal to operate this in the east area uh, at CERN. 
this is actually a, a separate collaboration from Hypercase, so others are, are welcome to join this, uh, especially if, the, you know, of course, if they're interested in water trank off uh, detector technologies. Okay, so I think I'm at the limit of my time, so I'll just leave you with my last slide and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, <clears throat> Mark, for, for, for the talk. The questions, I don't see any uh, hands raised. Fine. So let's continue. Thank you again. Let's continue uh, by series of two talks about Ptolemy uh, project. First of them is by Marcelo Messina. So Marcelo, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, nice. So please go on. You have twelve so minutes. This is just uh, this is just a, a background. It, uh, I'm not on a boat. I just forgot to have this background. So let's go straight to the topic. Uh, so the the aim of the Ptolemy experiment, the Ptolemy project, actually is what is to address uh, the, the the possibility of detecting. Uh, uh, a relic neutrino, cosmological relic neutrino. So, so why we believe in the in, in BIMIA? Let's try to, uh, to to point out why this uh, cosmological relic neutrino detection can be very interesting. We believe in Big Bang because we see the expansion, we measure the expansion of the universe. We 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 from the light element abundance also uh, we have a a clear evidence of the expansion of the universe. Uh, we, did, we we also detect the cosmic microwave background that has a, as what remains of the primordial explosion. And what is missing, the last uh, evidence of the expansion of the universe is a cosmic neutrino background that actually uh, so far escaped the uh, detection. Another very good point why to detect the cosmological relic neutrino is that uh, so far what we know of the universe is just obtained by the the, the 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 measurement of the CMB that decoupled or was created, let's say, 380,000 years after the start of the universe, while neutrino relic neutrinos have been uh, created or decoupled one second after the start of the universe. This means that looking at neutrino is like looking at a screenshot of the universe one second after the start. So this would give us quite many more uh, information about the, the universe. Universe. The, some features about these uh, uh, neutrinos. So the, they are very, they have very low kinetic energy according to the cosmological standard model. Uh, as you see reported here, the temperature is 1.9 Kelvin. That corresponds to very tiny momentum. Uh, the flux is, uh, the, 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 the density of these neutrinos is 56 per flavor. Uh, so 56 neutrinos per centimeter cube. And the fluence of the flux of the new, of neutrinos is the largest one that you can imagine, even though the energy of these neutrinos is very little. And you can see here the flux versus energy of the, of the, of the neutrinos from different sources in the, in the universe. So is it possible to detect uh, milli electron volt kinetic energy, energy neutrinos? Let's see. So uh, in this paper here in 2007 was published this idea that actually was also mentioned long before by, uh, by Steven Weinberg. Uh, but in the paper here, they were made clear, clearly calculated the cross-section interaction of neutrinos on, on beta unstable elements. Why beta unstable elements? Because we know that beta unstable, they decay, produce an, anti an outcoming antineutrino and electron. Uh, but you can imagine this outcoming antineutrino as an incoming neutrinos. And the nuclear transition is the same, actually. So the, the invariant amplitude of the process is the same. What changes the kinematics, actually, the fact that neutrino is incoming now, and it's an incoming part of this favor, uh, stimulate the process and the signature is the one that is reported here. So the electrons do the neutrino capture actually are expected to accumulate in a, in, a, in a distribution here, two times m nu farther away from the last beam of the Curie plot or the, the element that we are considering. So you must be able to measure this distance in energy scale to, in order to be sure that you, uh, you are observing this neutrino capture. Uh, and this was, I mean, the, in, in the cross-section of, of this process were uh, explicitly calculated in this paper. And from then, the, the, the discussion on this, uh, the, this experimental topic restarted. Uh, here you see some, some more details about calculation. M more of these plots will be shown by Stefano Gariazzo in the next slow, uh, in the next talk, where he will discuss more about the physics program, the physics that we can do with this uh, within the Ptolemy project. So 
why tritium target among the bad unstable elements we have chosen tritium why because of a high cross section for neutrino capture because it's a sizable lifetime because when you have a, 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 a target that is an unstable element better you have a large cross section and a large uh, lifetime so what must be optimized is the product of cross section times lifetime and not only the cross section low q value uh, and the drawback is that the tritium battery actually provides many many decays uh, Per, per gram, 10 to 15 becquerel per gram. This means that you cannot that you cannot measure all electrons, but you need to measure only only few of these uh, electrons, the one in the region of uh, in the region of interest. So the Ptolemy experiments. The goal is find evidence of, of cosmological neutrino background, uh, making accurate measurement of neutrino mass, uh, and also actually there is some possibility to study light dark matter detection, but this will not be discussed in this talk. And the key challenges are extreme energy resolution that is required and extreme background rates from from the target. So the concept here. Uh, the concept is that, first of all, we have a new uh, tritium storage capability based on a monoatomic layer of graphene, with the idea is to embed tritium in graphene monoatomic layer, such that, and I will tell you why we need this, uh, this type of uh, tritium storage. Then we aim at transporting the electron from the the target plays to a, a region where the RF emission of a single electron in a given field is measured. And this is important because this will trigger a dynamic filter that has the aim of selecting muons in the, in the region of interest. Then at the end of this filter, the, the electrons are supposed to be driven into these calorimeter detectors where the final very high res extreme resolution measurements is realized. Uh, in the... Sorry, are you... Oh, okay. Uh, so in these slides, uh, once more, the, the steps of the measurements are uh, summarized with some information, some equations. We cannot discuss this. It will take too long. Just quickly, uh, a new way of storing ato uh, uh, atomic tritium. In the step two, we have electron RF emission is detected, and this triggers a uh, good particle and give a preliminary evaluation of uh, energy and the transverse moment, transverse with respect to the magnetic field line. And this, in this equation, you see the frequency dependence by the uh, relativistic gamma factor and also the power associated with this, uh, with this frequency. And, uh, and then in the step three, there is the filter, the one that is supposed to select the particle of interest. Uh, and the field is properly set in this filter, the field is properly set on millisecond time scale. And so the transverse kinetic energy is removed by pushing the particle and it's a static potential heat. What does it mean? I mean, we, we, in order to be able to select the particle, we need that the momentum must be straightened on a magnetic uh, uh, on a on a magnetic uh, field line. Now, I do uh, uh, adiabatically, and the, the energy stays the same. Otherwise, we find out that there is a, a way to remove the the transverse momentum, and you get a straightened particles with uh, with with a, a, a magnetic field that is decaying exponentially. I mean, just believe me, it's a bit too long to explain here. The, the how does it work is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, embedded in these equations, and then the step four is the one of, uh, of where, where the electron is transporting the micro calorimeter. Uh, uh, and uh, where is realized the final energy measurements. And the good thing is whatever you do in this filter, this would uh, require some time to explain, the, the final energy of the electron is just the, the charge times the delta with the, the voltage at the anode minus the voltage at the source, plus the energy measurements in the calorimeter. Whatever you do in the filter, you don't affect the overall energy. And this is a very interesting aspect. Uh, once more, some other little uh, uh, cartoon to try to explain a bit more the feature of this new type of filter that we call dynamic filter. So the tuned particle, the particles of, the, of, of interest for which we set the proper field, they move along this uh, green line here on a straight line trajectory by climbing this uh, equipotential surface. They move so at higher and higher potential at expenses of the transverse momentum. And at this point where the magnetic field is very low because it is, is, is done to decay exponentially, the particle is driven into the calorie limit for the final energy measurements. While the, the particles out of tune, uh, so you see here out of tune and tuned, they end up on electrons. So naturally the particles that are out of, 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 of the region of interest, they found the field that is not properly set, they die on the electrons, while the particles that are uh, that of interest for us that meet the, the right field that we set promptly, uh, they go straight and end up in, the, in the one of the calorimeters at the end. Why we need uh, uh, why we need uh, uh, tritium because the, the, the sorry uh, graphene to store tritium because.
because when tritium is expected, when, when tritium uh, gets bounded with the monatomic layer of graphene, uh, the, this uh, bounding uh, uh, status is expected to be very well defined without any rotovibrational degree of freedom that would deteriorate the energy of the electron when it comes out. While this happens actually when the tritium is, uh, is exploited in the molecular form. When the tritium is exploited in molecular form, the electron that is emitted by the tritium decay actually is, uh, uh, suffer of a smearing due to the rotovibrational degree of freedom of the molecule that can be activated. This phenomenon does not exist in the graph. It's not expected, actually. This is a theoretical prediction that is not expected, but this is something that we should measure. On the right, a, a picture of the system that can make the embedding of the tritium in the, in the, in the, in the, in the graphene layer. Here you see there is a big effort in simulation, the signal of a single electron detected by uh, uh, resonant uh, cavities of uh, uh, waveguides. And uh, we need a lot of effort here to be able to detect this very low power. The power is talking about is on the scale of, uh, it's just the square of this number. So in the scale of, uh, of um, uh, femtowatt and less than, than, than femtowatt. Anyway, there is a big effort in simulation and optimizing the, the geometry of this uh, uh, RF antenna. Here are some details of the magnet. It is one of the most uh, uh, important and difficult things to design. The magnet should be able to accommodate the target, the RF region, and then this is the filter region in which the, the, the B field must have an, an exponential decay such that naturally in the region of a microcalorimeter that are actually are TES transition edge sensor, the field is, is sufficiently low. And the, also here there is a big effort in simulation uh, all, all the things that we need. Uh, microcalorimeter, the final detector, uh, the, the benchmark is the this uh, microcarimeter, this performance that have been proved by the National Institute of Metrology, where uh, they run uh, what is, is a microcarimeter is represented here. There is a bulk where energy can be absorbed. This bulk is in thermal is in thermal contact with the bath, so at a fixed temperature, and this and the and the temperature jump due to the energy release in the bulk is read out by a TES transition edge sensor. It's a superconducting strip that when gets warm get, gets get a higher temperature makes the transition from superconducting to conduct in making a big jump in the current flowing. The resolution that has been shown by this, uh, uh, by the Ital Italian Institute of Meteorology is this one, actually. This is a full, full width at half maximum, 0 to 12 electron volt. It is uh, 50 milli electron volt uh, uh, energy resolution. This is a picture of the uh, TS, the challenge is making this TS definitely larger, up to 100 uh, micron square and keeping similar, similar uh, uh, resolution. Um, this is a picture of the, where we have our, uh, let's say, R&D facility at the moment at the Gran Sasso, uh, in the, the Gran Sasso laboratory in Italy. This is the, the, where we are now above ground, not underground for the moment. Uh, this is a picture of uh, some magnets and some devices in our uh, above ground side. This is a list of the institutions that are expressed interest for this project, seven countries, 23 institutions, and more than 50 physicists. And uh, so to conclude, it's something completely different. Physics program matters to relic neutrinos, light dark matter neutrino mass, technological challenges and new support for tritium, XM energy, and uh, uh, I-rate, thanks to energy solutions. And uh, here there are two papers in which uh, our recent results are, are summarized. So the last two words to just thank the organizing committee for inviting me and also the people for, for listening. That's it. Hello? Sorry, I can't hear anybody. I don't think anyone is talking, unfortunately. Hello?
I'm sorry, but I don't hear any message. I assume that you move to the next speaker. Yeah, I think we can move to the next speaker, which is going to be uh, Stefano Gaiazzo talking about the Ptolemy again. Okay, so I will share my screen. So go ahead when you are ready. Yes. Can you see my slides? Yes, you can see it. Okay. So uh, in this talk, I will discuss about the physics that the Ptolemy experiment can explore. So let's start from the beginning. That is an introduction of the cosmic neutrino background. So we know that the history of the universe is well described by a model where the Big Bang was an initial state with a very high temperature that give uh, rise to the expansion of the universe. So the current universe is the result of uh, an expansion that is initially driven by an inflationary phase. Then there is a phase where uh, all the particles are in uh, mutual interaction between each other. But while the temperature drops, some of them start to decouple. And in particular, today, we observe the relics of uh, the cosmic microwave background that are the photons that uh, decoupled when the temperature of the universe was around 0.3 electron volts, and the BBN, that they are uh, the light elements produced when the temperature was about 0.7 milli mega electron volts. Uh, just a little bit before the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, there was a decoupling of neutrinos. Neutrinos that coupled when the interactions with electrons are uh, not strong enough to maintain them in equilibrium. And in particular, it's possible to compute that uh, expanding a universe to, until today, the temperature of the neutrinos decreases. And decreases up to the level of 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. It's like 0 0.1 milli electron volts. Such neutrinos are the most abundant particles in the universe, apart for the cosmic microwave background photons with a number of 56 per centimeter cube per family. And we also know from neutrino oscillation constraints on the neutrino masses that at least two of the mass eigenstates are non-relativistic today because the, their mass is larger than the, their average energy. So we know very well the universe until the epoch of the CMB because we have uh, an image of the anisotropies. This is a comparison of the first images of the anisotropy from Kobe then the W map one, and then the Planck, uh, the most recent map. On the other hand, we have no observation of the relic neutrinos. This is what we would like to achieve. It's a technologically complex challenge, as Marcello already said. But this would give us the image of the universe when it was one second old. So much older uh, than uh, with respect to what we know from the CMB. We know that the cosmic neutrino background is likely to exist because we measure this number of uh, effective relativistic species in the early universe and effective, which is predicted to be 3.0 something. It's not exactly three because the, the neutrinos do not decouple instantaneously. There is a little bit of energy transfer from the electrons when they become non-relativistic. And this 3.04 something is in perfect agreement with the experimental value by Planck, for example, 3.0 plus minus 0.2. So this means that we have an indirect probe of the existing of the cosmic neutrino background, more or less 10 sigma or even more, depending on the exact data set that is considered. So we, we know that these neutrinos are likely to exist, but we would like to, to really detect them in a direct way, because in this, uh, with an indirect probe, we do not know if this an effective equal to three is just coming from neutrino or there is something else. How to do that? Well, it's complex. Uh, the best idea is to use the neutrino that capture on beta decay nuclei. So instead of having a nucleus that can undergo beta decay when a neutron decays into a proton and an electron and an antineutrino, we can have that the antineutrino is in the initial state as a neutrino. So the production of the electron is triggered with the energy that is higher than the endpoint of the beta decay. Particularly, we see in the figure that there is on the left the beta decay spectrum that uh, goes down until the endpoint, that is Kn. 
which depends on the neutrino masses because the neutrino takes part of the energy. Plus we see a peak that is due to the neutrino capture of relic neutrinos. And in particular, you see that the distance between the new peak and the endpoint of beta decay is twice as large as the neutrino mass. Uh, in this figure, I am assuming that the three neutrinos are degenerating mass. There are two problems. So the first problem is that uh, this peak is much smaller than the beta decay spectrum. So we have to achieve an impressive energy resolution in order to detect the signal from the background. And we need a lot of material. If we write the spectrum for cosmic neutrino background capture, it uh, will depend on the number of target uh, uh, atoms. It depends on the mixing matrix element because uh, each of the mass eigenstates uh, will contribute differently. It depends on the average number of neutrinos on the, on, in, the, in the universe, but also it depends on this FC is a clustering factor that depends on the mass of the neutrinos because the neutrinos can cluster in the dark matter halo of the Milky Way, for example. This is the expression for the beta decay spectrum. And this is more or less what we could observe, assuming that the lightest neutrino has a mass of 10 milli electron volts. And this energy resolution is also 10 milli electron volts. So we see that if the neutrinos are distributed according to the normal ordering, where the lightest neutrino is the one that has the largest mixing with electron flavor, the first peak from the cosmic neutrino background that is this one is closest to the to the beta decay spectrum so it's hard to distinguish this peak and the second peak is much smaller just because of the value of the mixing uh, angles in the inverted order in case it would be the opposite so the first peak is much smaller and it's easier the, to detect the second one because it has it corresponds to a larger number of events Unfortunately, this is for a very optimistic energy resolution. If we go to a less optimistic energy resolution, we see that it is crucial to have uh, energy resolution comparable to with the lightest neutrino mass, because otherwise all the events will be lost behind the beta decay spectrum. It's impossible to observe them. So the idea is that the Ptolemy experiment that was already discussed in the previous talk with uh, 100 grams of tritium will uh, try with an energy resolution of 0.05 electron volts or so to detect something like 10 events per year from the cosmic neutrino background capture. This number could be enhanced a little bit. I will not discuss uh, the neutrino clustering and other effects because I have no time, but I will now move to, to the results. So I will uh, not discuss the the structure of the experiment because it was already part of the previous talk. Let me go to a few formulas that we used for the simulations. So basically we, uh, we compute an ex expected number of events, assuming a fiducial uh, energy, fiducial mass and fiducial mixing matrix for the neutrinos. And then we use this uh, expected number of events to try to fit the theoretical expectations. And th this will be depend on the amplitude on the, of the beta spectrum that we leave as free, on the amplitude of the neutrino capture spectrum that is also left as free, and then on the masses and the mixings on a constant background, and even we fit a possible shift in the end point. So if we compute this chi-square, we can do a study and study the sensitivity of the experiment in the different cases. And we started from the neutrino mass determination. Uh, here we assume uh, a fiducial value for the lightest neutrino mass, and we vary the, uh, the lightest neutrino mass and the uh, energy resolution. This is what we would observe with the full-scale uh, Ptolemy experiment with 100 grams of tritium. Uh, statistical errors are only taken into account because we have no uh, information on the systematics yet. But let's say an ideal... Uh, direct detection experiment with 100 grams of tritium can achieve at most 1% uh, uh, measurement of the lightest neutrino mass if it is 10 milli electron volts. Of course, uh, this will be much worse with the systematics uh, if they are not under control, but this is an idea of what the ideal experiment can do. We can compare normal ordering, inverted ordering, we see that there is basically no difference. And also the energy resolution does not influence very much the result. 
it's interesting also to consider like uh, preliminary or uh, prototype Ptolemy experiments with less tritium. This is one and uh, one gram, and this is one uh, with ten milligrams. This could be like the first phases of the development of the full scale experiment, and we can see that even with just ten milligrams of tritium, we could have a detection of two or three sigma of the lightest neutrino mass, even if it is of ten milli electron volts. Uh, the sensitivity is probably like seven milli electron volts or something like that. The second study we did uh, is that, as you uh, may remember from these plots here, there is quite a difference between normal and inverted ordering. And the difference is especially visible here because there is a kink that is due to the fact that the mixing matrix elements are exchanged in the normal and inverted ordering. So the second lightest. Uh, uh, neutrino is much heavier in the inverted ordering case. And this is uh, why the, the kink is much more visible. So just to, due to the fact that we are observing so many beta decay events, we can uh, we use the Bayesian method, but what we obtain is that it's basically uh, extremely easy to measure the uh, mass ordering because uh, the, the difference in the number of events from the beta decay spectrum is huge. We did not study this case uh, with the uh, smaller scale experiments, but it will be similar. So the difference is really, really huge in the number of expected events from the decay. Uh, the crucial point is that actually Ptolemy is built in order to detect the uh, relic neutrinos. And the, the detection of relic neutrinos, uh, we estimate the significance by fitting this parameter here, that is the amplitude of the cosmic neutrino background uh, spectrum. If we can detect this parameter to be larger than zero at few sigma, we will have a detection at few sigma of the cosmic neutrino background. And here I show the comparison of the sensitivity in normal ordering and in the inverted ordering cases as a function of the energy resolution and of the lightest neutrino mass. The blue region is what corresponds to less than one sigma detection, so basically no detection while the orange would be a three sigma detection. And you see that even with 100 grams of tritium, it's very hard to have a, a clear detection of the cosmic neutrino background. We would need a heavy or relatively heavy light, uh, lightest neutrino mass above like 0 0.1 electron volts, 0.15, something like that, in order to have a two, three sigma significance. And even more crucial is the dependence with the energy resolution. So if the lightest neutrino mass is below, say, 20 or 10 milli electron volts, we will really need to achieve a, a much better energy resolution than what we are expecting now. Uh, in this case, we do not study the, the perspectives with less than 100 grams of tritium because it would be absolutely impossible. The number of events is too too small in order to expect to be able to reconstruct this parameter here. So in conclusions, uh, we have seen that Ptolemy can see, can see the neutrino masses, the mass ordering, and in the most optimistic case, even detect the relic neutrinos for the first time. The requirements for the experiment are not that strict if we want just to have a first detection of the neutrino masses or the, of the mass ordering. But so the, the preliminary, the pr prototypes would probably already be able to do a lot of physics. If we want to do the relic neutrinos, then we, we really need the full scale, full scale experiment. So to summarize, this is a very complex technological challenge. It would be an amazing result because it would be the first time the non-relativistic neutrinos of the cosmic neutrino background are observed. And meanwhile, we can also study neutrino masses and mass ordering and so on. Uh, the problem is that we have to develop all the technologies. Marcello already discussed. Thank you very much. Thank you for the talk. Uh, are there any questions? Yes, I don't see any. I think we can go.
go to the next talk by Fei Fei Huang about the Lemstringer astronomy prospects. Please go ahead and start when we are ready. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Well, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Let me share my screen. Okay, you can see it? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. All right, so hello. Um, my name is Fei Fei. Uh, I'm going to present you the status and prospects for uh, neutrino astronomy search uh, uh, with Chem3Net. So I will mainly talk about these four aspects and I will show you the status and some first measurements with our detectors. Um, so let me first uh, go to the introduction part. So this is a map of our collaborators all over the world. We have over 200 scientists uh, spanning over four continents. Uh, the yellow dots here represent the uh, locations of our uh, detector sites. I will talk more about this later. So this is an uh, artist's impression of, of one building block of our experiment. So one building block consists of 115 streams uh, attached to uh, anchored to the seabed and each stream has uh, 18 domes. Uh, and uh, here one dump, the dump refers to the digital optical module and it consists of 31 three inch PMTs inside uh, uh, facing uh, at different uh, directions. So basically our detector is this uh, three dimensional uh, array of optical sensors that are able to detect shadow cuff light uh, emitted by the uh, secondary particles uh, from the neutrino interactions in water. So for example, here is a muon neutrino Kami have interactions here and the outgoing muon track goes to the detector and produces the Sharonkov light. This is the Sharonkov cone we created and by uh, using the arrival time and amplitude of the observed light in the, in the domes, we can reconstruct the neutrino direction and uh, energy. And we can uh, uh, have a very accurate position up down to like a few centimeters level and the timing resolution of one nanosecond. And this guarantees a accurate and precise uh, direction reconstruction that are important. Um, okay, so now this um, shows uh, again the detection sites. So we uh, use a phased construction for our detectors. Uh, so right now we're in phase one um, where we plan to have six streams of ORCA and 24 streams of ARCA. So ORCA is located um, uh, in the sea uh, near France here. Um, it has, relatively speaking, a dense spacing. So here, the, the 115 um, uh, streams are distributed within like 100 meter radius. And on the right here is Arca, which is located near Italy. Uh, it has a, a sparser spacing and uh, it's sensitive to neutrinos in above uh, one TeV uh, range. So, let me show you more in detail what the science goals are for uh, for Chem 3 net So this is a um, uh, the neutrino flux for different um, neutrino sources, either naturally occurring or artificially made, and over a large uh, energy range. So this um, blue shaded area is our region of interest. And for ORCA, um, our main goal is to measure the atmospheric uh, neutrinos uh, relatively uh, in, uh, in GeV to TeV range. Uh, we want to look for neutrino oscillations, uh, the determine the neutrino mass hierarchy, neutral appearance, etc. We also can conduct some uh, low energy astronomy uh, for time or space clusters. Then for ARCA, um, uh, we want to detect astrophysical neutrinos uh, that are uh, very energetic. Uh, so more specifically, for example, uh, neutrinos in galactic point -like sources or diffuse astrophysical neutrinos uh, flux. Also for the multi-messenger astronomy, uh, we would like to send and receive alerts for transient source searches. Then at the MEV level, uh, we are also uh, sensitive to MEV supernova burst neutrinos. Uh, here uh, I say both uh, ORCA and ARCA because one single dome can act as a detector. 
So today I will show you our results regarding these uh, four bullet points. Um, but before I do that, I will show you uh, the signal, the neutrino signatures which uh, we uh, expect to see. Uh, so we divide them into two uh, channels. One is track light events, where we see events with a visible muon track. And um, so with this muon track, we can, we can see this uh, simulation here, uh, which created this uh, uh, light path inside our detector. And this point provides a great point in resolution for points like a, a neutrino source study. On the right here shows the shower-like events where there is no visible muon track and the light distribution is more or less uh, symmetric and still, but we can still uh, achieve a uh, quite nice uh, angular resolution. So uh, this is just more um, uh, in detail, the, uh, the reconstruction resolutions. I'm not going to spend too much time here. Um, so, but basically this is the, uh, in the track channel, we see um, uh, the good angular resolution um, we see here, especially above 100 TeV. All right, now let's talk about uh, the, uh, the studies we can do. So for first, for the diffuse neutrino flux, we want to detect astrophysical neutrino flux. Uh, they're uh, located usually like above 100 TeV range. This is the um, um, assumed flux spectrum. And here, this plot shows you the significance uh, versus observation time. And we can see, uh, so with the black curve is uh, the search with one block of ARCA, uh, and the blue is for uh, the full blocks, so the two blocks of ARCA. So you can see we can already achieve uh, five sigma of significance with, within one year with one block, or half of a year with uh, two blocks. Then for point-like neutrino searches, so this uh, is for uh, sources with a generic neutrino flux proportional to e to the minus two. So for example, here uh, I'm comparing the new, uh, the came three net sensitivity with ice cube. Uh, the x-axis here is the um, the source declination. So here on the left, this is the uh, southern hemisphere, and this is the northern hemisphere because came three net is located. In the northern hemisphere, uh, we have a very good sensitivity to uh, sources from uh, from below us. So we can see that we can achieve an over one order of magnitude better than ice cube uh, uh, in this uh, range. All right. Now, uh, for we also considered external extended galactic sources. So these sources are known uh, gamma ray uh, sources, and we use uh, uh, neutrino flux derived from the gamma ray flux. So here you can see in this plot uh, the uh, discovery potential versus observation time. So, uh, for example, for this uh, Vela uh, Junior source, we would be able to achieve three sigma uh, significance within six years. And similarly for this uh, RXJ source. Um, on the right side, uh, this is a stacking analysis, including both, and we can see a three sigma uh, observation within three years. And you can see more details um, uh, uh, in the link to the paper here. Then for um, neutrinos, that's my third part. Uh, for So the most prominent neutrino, uh, supernova neutrino we have seen, is this 1987A uh, neutrinos. And so here there are like 25 neutrinos observed uh, that occurred two to three hours before the light arrival. And future events, we could uh, see uh, thousands of events, um, neutrinos. Then, so this is showing the sensitivity for chem 3 net So the technique to do this is to search for uh, supernova neutrinos is via the multiplicity, uh, which is defined as the number of PMT hits within a uh, coincidence window inside a dome. So here this plus the uh, event rate as a function of the multiplicity for the background shown in uh, the blue triangles and the uh, signals. 
uh, shown in this uh, red and orange and light yellow uh, histograms. So you can see, for example, at seven, um, we, we see less than 10 like backgrounds uh, from uh, within our detector. And for the signal, it's over like 10 to 100 uh, events. And the same for the others. And then on the right side here shows the sensitivity versus distance. So you can see for different um, um, sources of the supernova uh, considered. So for example, at 20 uh, kiloparsec here, we can achieve over five sigma uh, sensitivity for most of the, uh, this covers like over 95% of the galactic uh, supernova sources. And also, I want to mention that CCSN search is also very important in multi-messenger community. So Ken Finnet is already connected to the SNUs network. So, all right. Um, now, um, let me talk about the multi-messenger astronomy uh, studies. So um, in the past, we have seen like, three successful multi-messenger detections the supernova 1987, then in 2017, the gravitational wave and uh, electromagnetic observations. And the third one is the uh, famous blazer text uh, also in 2017 uh, with neutrinos and gamma rays. So this is really an exciting uh, new area. And Ken Thunet um, would like to participate in this. And the goal here is to um, be able to have a, a, a framework to receive external alerts um, and perform online neutrino correlation search within us uh, within came through net and or we send online uh, neutrino alerts if we see something interesting such as multiplets or high energy events in came through net and for uh, for external observatories for them to, to follow up so this requires a fast online reconstruction and a fast selection of high purity neutrino sample so here i'm showing you the um the status of the framework here. So currently uh, with our, since we have um, six lines of work out here, shows you some of the time it takes uh, for doing online reconstruction. So it right, right now is less than one second per event for a standard track direction reconstruction. And for shower reconstruction is uh, on the order of one second per event. Then for e online event selection, right now, uh, uh, we are using a gradient boosting decision tree for event classification, and it costs less than one second per event too. Uh, so here I'm showing you a preliminary selection with uh, this uh, BDT, and here it shows you the effective area uh, with seven lines of ORCA. And we see we can reduce the background by 100,000 times while keeping 30% uh, of our uh, neutrino signals. On the left here is the plot showing the uh, angular resolution versus energy. Uh, this is again for seven line worker. And um, you can see with this selection, we can achieve at uh, one TeV a one degree uh, angular resolution. And then for the time delay here right now, uh, with uh, the online filtering plus the online reconstruction and online event selection, we achieve uh, roughly four seconds of time delay on average. All right, now let me show you some um, more recent uh, um, news. So Ken Thurnet is being reconstructed. So the current setup is we have six uh, strings of Orca running. So this is phase one since uh, this year, January. And then Orca, two, Orca has two strings installed. Uh, it's now temporarily shut down for a major intervention and refurbishment. Um, the goal here is to uh, complete the phase two uh, construction within like four and six years. So right now with these four lines of Orca, uh, I'd like to show you uh, some event uh, simulation inside our detector. Um, let me just quickly go to this link here. You can see a YouTube link. Uh, I'm just showing you the, this is uh, the reconstructed track going upward in our detector. 
uh, and you can see the showing of cone coming uh, through and create and lighting up our DOMs inside our detector. So let me go back. And this uh, six plus here shows you the um, triggered hit uh, deposition versus time. And the yellow curve is the earliest sharing of light expected from uh, the reconstructed track. So you can see that this is basically the projection of the sharing of cone uh, onto our um, strings. So you can see that they match well with uh, the triggered, light, triggered hits. All right. And then uh, we also have four string OCA data um, uh, over 4.5 months of lifetime. So here, here uh, is a event sample with 99% purity. Um, there are upgoing track like events. So on the left here shows the dashed lines shows you the events uh, distribution before selection. So this is the majority of the events are the background atmospherical muons uh, plus some noise. And then after the selection, we see this is the solid lines. Uh, the red is for the neutrinos. Uh, and the, um, the background is almost, uh, almost removed. And the bla uh, black line is the data. So even with this um, uh, four months of data, we can see um, already see the uh, oscillation effect. So here, this, this um, yellow curve here is the uh, no oscillation now hypothesis. And we can see that we can already uh, see oscillation at a two sigma um, significance. All right, we also have conducted um, atmospheric mu flux measurements. So this is a link to the paper. So basically what we are plotting here is the uh, measured uh, mu flux versus depth under the sea. So the red dots here are from Orca and these are from Arca. Uh, you can, and the uh, dashed line is the model, theoretical model. And you can see that uh, the data matches the model quite well. And this shows us that we have a very good understanding of our detectors. All right, uh, this is my summary. Um, so having a great angular resolution and with the galactic center in view, PM3 network contribute enormously to the neutrino astronomy. Uh, then for physics with Orca, uh, um, I please go to this uh, Orca talk by my colleague, um, which will happen on Friday um, morning. And right now we have deployed uh, phase one Orca data with uh, six strings running for six months. So here are our little celebrations. Uh, there are like two links for, um, for some um, music uh, uh, instruments playing for, for example, this one is for original song and this is a piano piece. So feel free to have a look uh, when you're free. And we, will, we plan to uh, start our deployment soon and hopefully we will finish uh, the construction of phase two within four to six years. And stay tuned for more physics. Thank you. Thank you Fei -Fei, for a very nice talk. Unfortunately, we don't have time for discussion. So the next uh, talk is uh, uh, by Fabio Mantovani about uh, geoneutrino uh, results from Borexino. Uh, please uh, be so kind, try to, to okay. keep your time. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, very weakly. Uh, really? Now? Uh, do Good you point. hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, and do you see my screen? Not yet. Uh, yeah, now? Yes, fine. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, well, yes, uh, uh, I'm Fabio Mantomani, and tonight I would like to present the uh, recent improved geoneutrino result from Borexino on behalf of Borexino Collaboration. Uh, well, quickly, the summary of my, my presentation. First of all, I would like to introduce the geoneutrino and the heat power from the Earth. Uh, in a few words, we, the idea is to understand what happened in, in, 
the thermal history uh, about our planet. And uh, then I will present uh, the recent result from Borexino. And uh, finally, we, we will see what are the geological implications uh, of this measurement, and uh, which are reported in a, in a complete paper, uh, which is published at the beginning of this year on Physical Review uh, D. Um, well, um, um, uh, geoneutrinos, what are geoneutrinos? Uh, well, by definition, are the, the, the anti-neutrino producing by beta uh, decay inside the Earth. In particular, uranium, thorium, and potassium in the early release heat together with anti-neutrino in a well-fixed ratio. Here I report the free um, measure contribution to the natural radioactivity of uh, uh, terrestrial um, uh, uh, in the Earth. And uh, uranium uh, decay chain include uh, eight alpha decay and six beta decay, which produce uh, uh, anti-neutrino with a, a maximal energy of about 3.3 MeV. And um, as you can see here, the, uh, there is a, a fixed uh, ratio between uh, the, 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 the radiogenic uh, uh, heat produced, power produced by uranium and, uh, uh, and, the, and the anti-neutrino. Um, luminosity. The same is uh, for thorium, which, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which has a, a lower uh, a maximal energy. Uh, concerning uh, potassium, uh, the, um, uh, the maximal energy of uh, antineutrino is below the threshold of inverse beta reaction, which is used for detecting anti-geoneutrino. Uh, here I report the uh, inverse beta reaction, which is basically an interaction between antineutrino and a free proton, which produce a positron, which is the prompt signal and neutron. And, uh, and the threshold is 1.8 MeV. Uh, we can recognize uh, uh, two different uh, energy uh, contribution from uranium and thorium, uh, since uh, the highest energy come from thorium and geoneutrino. And typically the signal is reporting in TNU, which is at uh, one terrestrial neutrino unit, which is one even per 10 to 33, 32 free proton per year. Uh, well, uh, let me uh, summarize the open question about natural radioactivity in the year. Uh, well, first of all, we don't know what is the uh, radiogenic contribution to terrestrial heat production. And so we would like to know that. And uh, we would like to know so how much uranium and thorium are in the crust and in the mantle. Assuming that in the core, uh, we don't have uh, uh, uranium and thorium because the core is uh, basically metallic uh, based. Um, the third question is about the thermal condition of the Earth initial um, uh, stage. And um, what is hidden in the core uh, of the Earth? Maybe a georeactor, maybe potassium-40. Uh, and finally, what is the uh, standard geochemical model consisting with uh, 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 geoneutrino data? Um, well, uh, the heat power from the Earth is basically measured on uh, using uh, 40,000 heat flow uh, measurement, in, in particular in, in the continent. Uh, but as you can see here in this map, which is published by Davis and Davis in 2010, uh, the highest contribution come from the oceanic floor, uh, which release about 70% uh, uh, of the total terrestrial, um, uh, total terrestrial power. Um, well, in order to fix in our mind the order of magnitude, uh, uh, the global heat loss is measured in terawatt, and uh, the, the, the scientific community adopted 47 terawatt uh, uh, which, uh, the, as a power of the Earth. So um, what is the origin of uh, this heat? 
Uh, well, if we neglect uh, the, um, uh, the tidal dissipation and gravitational contraction, uh, the two major contributions come from uh, secular cooling uh, caused by the initial hot environment of early stage for uh, early formation stage and the radiogen heat, which is basically the heat produced by uranium, thorium, potassium inside our planet. Um, uh, it's useful to define the convective uh, URE ratio, which is basically the ratio between the uh, radiogenic power in the mantle, which is the total radiogenic contribution minus the uh, radiogenic contribution from the continental crust divided by the uh, basically uh, secular um, cooling contribution. Uh, why we subtract uh, the, <coughs> the uh, uh, radiogenic con continent uh, contribution from uh, the continental crust because we can accept, we can measure um, on, in the sample, the, the uranium and thorium uh, um, abundance in sediment and the upper crust and the middle crust and lower crust. Don't forget that the deepest hole that ever uh, been dug in the earth is uh, uh, about 12 kilometers deep. So we uh, directly investigate only the thin uh, part of the of our planet. And, um, and this part is called the lithosphere, uh, which is uh, the superficial portion of our, uh, of our Earth, uh, which is include the crust and the continental lithospheric mantle. Here you have a, a scheme of the Earth, and this you recognize the metallic inner and outer core and then the mantle, and uh, finally the uh, lithosphere. Um, the lithosphere uh, contain uh, uh, less than uh, 2% two, two of the Earth mass, but about 50%, uh, half of the total uranium and thorium uh, mass. In particular, uh, in the continental uh, portion of, uh, of the lithosphere, um, in which we can observe uranium and thorium in abundance of uh, some uh, PPM. Um, so, um, and this, uh, in the, in the lithosphere uh, produces about 12% of the total heat flux. And uh, we, we know this, uh, uh, this number uh, pretty well uh, using direct measurement on the rocks. So uh, now let me speak about geoneutrino signal. And uh, the first thing to, to say is that uh, the flux of geoneutrino of the detector uh, located the scale uh, with the inverse of the square distance of the emitter. This means that it's important to study the local contribution. For this reason here, I pour this uh, green portion around the uh, Gran Sasso. And, uh, and in fact, we observed that 40% of the total signal come from a region which is very close to the, the detector. And uh, so, uh, moreover, since we would like to understand the radioactivity in the mantle, um, uh, we have to consider that the radioactivity, the, the signal from, uh, from the mantle is the same order of this small portion uh, uh, around the Gran Sasso uh, area. So Borexino, as you probably know, is a, a liquid scintillator uh, uh, experiment, which is located in the center of Italy in the Gran Sasso lab. Um, basically, uh, the detector has a concentric multilayer structure. The outer uh, uh, layer serve as a passive shield against the external radiation, as well as active chair and convictor of Cosmo. Fabio, you have five nuance. minutes. Yeah, uh, and the scintillator, uh, the, the, the inner portion of the, and the active portion of, this, of the detector is uh, the, 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 uh, inside the inner vessel. Here you see the recent result uh, of uh, Borexino detector and uh, compare it to the previous uh, um, uh, result. And uh, 
uh, in this new release, uh, what has improved the uh, basically improved the muon veto uh, for external for internal muon uh, cylindrical veto is applied, and uh, that time are tuning according to the muon probability to for spallation product, which mimic the inverse beta reaction. And moreover, the tagging efficiencies increase, and, uh, and moreover, we increase also the fiducial volume uh, of the detector. Here you see the distribution of events in the lower energy, in the lower window of energy uh, of uh, geoneutrino and the highest uh, energy window. Uh, here I report the background uh, um, measuring in Borexino. And finally, this is the spectrum uh, in which uh, we collect uh, about 154 uh, antineutrino um, data. And the background is uh, about eight uh, events and the geoneutrino and the reactor uh, events, uh, uh, which is the, uh, mm, the violet area is uh, 39 events. And uh, in the lower re region, you can recognize the geoneutrino contribution, which is uh, uh, about 53, uh, uh, 53 events. And uh, so then you can convert the, the events in TNU. And then um, if you assume to know the contribution from the lithosphere, you can extract the mantle contribution. If you want to understand what are the implications of this measurement, you need to compare this uh, contribution with the standard model of the Earth, which is summarized in this slide. The basilic earth described the primordial non-metallic earth. And here you can see the cosmochemical cosmo chemical model, uh, which is uh, a lower, um, which is, has a lower contribution in radioactivity and the geochemical model, which is the standard model of the earth and ge the geodynamical model, which higher contribution. And fully radiogenic is uh, the idea is uh, the model, which, uh, which is based on uh, that, uh, all the 45, 47 terawatt that come from radioactivity. The, if we compare the, the geoneutrino measurement of Borexino with the models, you can see that uh, uh, the observation favor geological model that we predict a relative high concentration of, of uh, radioactive element in the mantle. And, uh, and here I report uh, the measurement of the Borexino uh, respect to the different outdoor uh, hypothesis uh, with the contribution from the uh, lithosphere, the contribution of the radioactive from the mantle and the secular cooling. And uh, an hypothesis, a hypothetical uh, uh, 2.4 terawatt reactor in the center of the earth is excluded that 40, 95% of confidence level. Finally, here I summarize the, the result uh, which, is, which are published uh, at, the, at the end of the last year from the two big detect from two uh, main experiments for geoneutrino, Camland and, uh, and Borexino. And let me conclude with uh, four highlights. Then uh, geoneutrino measurement of Borexino is obtained uh, with uh, an optimized data selection, which improved the, the detection efficiency of 85, uh, 87%. Uh, Borexino observe a uh, uh, geoneutrino mantle signal, and, uh, and the null observation is excluded at 99% 99 of confidence. Leaving. Moreover, Borexino estimates uh, for the first time a radiogenic power from the mantle. Uh, which is basically 24 terawatt, and uh, and the total radiogenic contribution uh, of the Earth, and uh, we observe a 2.4 uh, sigma tension with the basilic Earth model, which predict the lowest uh, uh, uranium value abundance in the mantle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. Very nice talk, and uh, as uh, before, we we don't have time for. Uh, discussion. So the next is uh, Michal Danilov uh, talking about the uh, uh, dance experiment. Uh, hello. 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 Uh, I'm not allowed to uh, uh, share my screen because it is blocked by other participant. Uh -huh. No. 
Fabio, could you please stop sharing your screen? Yeah. I did it? Okay. Okay. Do, do, do you see my... Uh, please go on. And then please keep the time. Okay. Good. Sorry. Uh, I will uh, uh, talk today about new uh, results from the dance experiment. Many extensions of the standard model uh, have uh, uh, sterile neutrinos. There are also experimental hints of sterile neutrinos. A deficit of reactor neutrinos and uh, neutrinos in uh, calibration runs of the uh, gallium solar neutrino experiment can be explained by oscillations of uh, 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 electron neutrinos to sterile neutrinos. The appearance of uh, electron uh, neutrinos in uh, uh, muon neutrino beam can be explained by oscillation of muon neutrinos to sterile neutrinos and back to electron neutrinos. Recently, the neutrino 4 experiment claimed the observation of the uh, sterile neutrino with a very large mass difference of uh, seven, uh, must be a difference of seven a squared. And uh, the uh, new, uh, neutrino excess in uh, neutrino muon muon neutrino beam reached a six sigma level. So this is a very active field and there are many experiments searching for sterile neutrinos. DANCE is a one cubic solid scintillator detector which is built out of uh, 2,500 uh, one meter long scintillator strips covered with uh, gadolinium uh, containing uh, uh, paint. Uh, strips in adjacent layers are placed in an orthogonal way. This allows uh, a quasi 3D, 3D reconstruction of event. Detector is surrounded by uh, passive shielding and active muon shielding. The detector is uh, installed on a movable platform on the a three gigawatt uh, reactor of the Kalinin uh, uh, nuclear power plant in Russia. The Material of the reactor provides a shielding which reduces the cosmic background. The detector distance from reactor is changed two, three times a week from 10 to uh, 0.9 to 12.9 meters. We made many improvements since uh, the previous analysis, but the major change is that we use not only the shape of uh, positron spectra at different distances, but also relative rates. This uh, improved uh, the sensitivity of the experiment. We also use three detector position in the fit. Uh, this gives a very small gain in sensitivity, but provides a cross check uh, of the, uh, for the consistency of the data. Previously, this was done separately. We collected about 4 million IBD events, mainly at uh, the top and bottom detector positions, which are most sensitive uh, to neutrino oscillations. Accidental coincidence background is uh, uh, determined directly from the data and subtracted in a model independent way. However, it increases uh, the uh, statistical errors. Therefore, several uh, cuts are applied in order to, uh, to reduce it. For example, the cut on the distance between the prompt and delayed signal. Uh, this cut depends on the uh, energy of positron for small uh, positron energy where we have a lot of background. Uh, this uh, cut is more tight and this uh, allows us to reach a very reasonable uh, uh, fraction of the accidental background of about 14%, keeping uh, high uh, efficiency for the signal. Uh, Cosmic uh, muons are rejected by muon VETA. However, this uh, uh, system, muon VETA system, has some inefficiency, and this inefficiency was determined using the reactor of data. Uh, finally, uh, the total amount of background we have to subtract is about 1.7% at the top uh, detector position. That means uh, we, we have uh, the signal over background ratio of larger than 50. Muons are used to calibrate continuously all 2,500 scintillator strips, and also they are used to check the uh, linearity of the detector response. 
the energy scale of the experiment is anchored by the uh, uh, boron 12 decays. Electrons from these decays are very similar to the positrons from IBD events. I must stress that we measure only kinetic energy of positrons. We do not use annihilation gammas because they produce many soft electrons and these soft electrons uh, lead to a non-linearity of the uh, signal. Uh, in addition to the boron-12 uh, calibration, we use several other uh, calibration sources uh, just for cross uh, to cross-check the uh, uh, result. And here you see the signal from the neutron capture on uh, gadolinium. And uh, uh, below is a, a spectrum of Michel electrons. This calibration source is very interesting because we have many uh, Michel electrons, uh, more than 10,000 per day, and th therefore we can check the uh, uh, calibration uh, uh, dependence on uh, time. Here you see the sp uh, positron spectra measured at the top, middle, and uh, bottom position, detector position. At the top, uh, we uh, detect about 5,000 5, events per day with a uh, background of 1.7%. We compare this uh, shape of the positron spectra with the uh, prediction of the huber muller model. Uh, in order to reach the best agreement uh, with the model in the region between 1 and 3 MeV, we uh, shifted uh, the predictions of the model by 50 keV. With such a shift, uh, we see some bump uh, similar to bumps in other experiments. However, we cannot claim that uh, we ob observe uh, such a bump because uh, uh, our uh, uh, sp the spectrum shape uh, depends very strongly on the uh, energy scale and on this uh, shift uh, which uh, for which we do not know the reason. Here you see a comparison between the uh, reactor power uh, shown in blue and red and uh, counting rate of uh, IBD uh, uh, events. You see the, the nice agreement. Uh, obviously we corrected uh, the uh, counting rate for one over R square dependence and also for uh, fuel evolution using uh, Huber Muller model. Also, we expected a very small uh, background from adjacent reaction reactors. Uh, the spread is very small, and we can say that we measured uh, the reactor power with uh, the anti neutrino flux with 1.5% accuracy in two days during three and a half years. The spread of points uh, is consistent with just statistical uh, nature of this spread. The test statistic consists of four uh, pieces. Uh, the first uh, term uh, is related to the period when we uh, used three detector positions for measurement, uh, top, bottom, and middle. The second term correspond to the period when we used only top and bottom positions. The third one takes into account uh, uh, relative uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, relative efficiency. And finally, uh, the, uh, the last term takes into, uh, into account uh, different systematics. Systematics are treated as nuisance, par nuisance parameters during uh, chi-square minimization. Here you see the uh, uh, difference in chi-square for four new and uh, three new hypotheses. The red regions are regions with uh, chi-square for four new hypotheses uh, smaller than uh, uh, for three new hypotheses. And uh, the blue one uh, is uh, opposite. The dark blue region corresponds to uh, a three sigma confidence level e exclusion uh, in case of chi-square distribution with, with two degrees of freedom. However, this assumption is not valid and we use Gaussian CLS method to get limits. 
Here you see the ratio of positron spectra at the bottom and top position and uh, middle and top position. Blue lines correspond to uh, three new case and uh, magenta lines correspond to the best fit for the four neutrino hypothesis. Uh, it has a chi-square smaller by 5.5. However, this difference is not statistically significant. It is only 1.5 five uh, sigma significant. The yellow line is uh, the prediction for the best fit point for a reactor uh, anti neutrino anomaly and it, is, it has been excluded with a delta chi square of about 68. I would like to stress that uh, this point was excluded by dance with more than five sigma already uh, two years ago. The exclusion region was calculated using Gaussian CLS method and uh, the corresponding uh, sigmas for nuisance parameters and corresponding systematics are shown here. The new da data allowed and new analysis uh, allowed to extend uh, the uh, excluded area uh, in the four neutrino parameter uh, space and uh, uh, ex uh, we exclude a very interesting area uh, with uh, a lot of uh, predictions there. I would like to stress that uh, the, the most stringent uh, limit reaches already uh, eight times to the, to the minus three in sine square of two theta. We plan to upgrade uh, the detector. We plan to use uh, four, uh, strips with eight fibers. In this case, uh, the uniformity of the response is uh, very good and also light yield is sufficient to uh, get the desired uh, de uh, resolution. And with the upgraded detector, we uh, can check uh, the uh, neutrino four claim uh, we, uh, in 1.5 years of data taking. So uh, this is my conclusion. Uh, with improved data analysis, DANCE records about 5,000 antineutrino events per day with a cosmic background of 1.7%. That means with a signal over background ratio of more than 50. Reactor power was measured uh, using antineutrino rate with statistical error of 1.5% in two days during 3.5 years of operation. Dependence on the fuel composition was clearly observed. There is an indication of 5 MeV bump, but it's not conclusive. And uh, preliminary dance analysis based on 3.5 million of IBD events excluded a large and very interesting part of the four neutrino parameter space. Uh, I think uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention and thank you for organizer, organ, on, organizers for inviting me to the talk. Thank you. Congratulations thank you. to the nice uh, results and uh, for uh, keeping the time. Uh, no questions are, uh, no, no hands are raised. And uh, so let's continue with the next talk. It is uh, by Xiani Zhang, uh, who is going to talk about reactor neutrino measurement with prospect. So, Mikhail, please uh, uh, unshare the screen. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Please go on. Okay, um, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm presenting on behalf of Prospect a collaboration uh, about our improved reactor and neutrino measurement with Prospect. Um, Prospect's motivation includes uh, a model independent search for the EV scale stereo neutrino that's uh, been suggested by um, uh, reactor spectral measurements uh, around the world uh, and uh, some uh, short baseline accelerator experiments as well. And we want to mirror uh, the uh, EV scale stereo neutrino uh, in a short term, uh, in a very short baseline model independently. And we mirror the, uh, the uranium 235 spectrum from HEU um, to provide the insight uh, into 
the fission isotope source of the uh, of the uh, spectral difference uh, in C between the data and um, uh, model that's been measured by uh, different commercial reactor uh, at different uh, commercial reactors, and we commonly call it uh, an excess at uh, five MeV. Okay, uh, the detector, uh, the experiment, uh, we observe uh, the anti neutrino from uh, the uh, HIFA reactor where 99% of anti neutrino are from uranium 235. It's a compact core uh, where the width and height, uh, height of uh, the cylindrical core is about a meter uh, and uh, is about half meter. And uh, the reactor on cycle is. Uh, uh, for it, uh, about 24 days and reactor off cycle is about a month. Um, uh, they switch on and off uh, uh, constantly while we are uh, uh, in this period while we are marrying uh, the neutrino. And the detector is a, a four tons uh, lithium six loaded PSD capable liquid scintillator. And the uh, baseline coverage is uh, of the detector is. Uh, Hi, Xian Yi. Sorry, we only see your title page. It's not uh, moving oh. forward. Sorry. Uh, yeah, now we see it. I, uh, can I try the full screen mode again? Do you see a change? Mm, not really. Uh, uh, this works fine. Sorry. Um, I don't know what to improve this. Maybe I'll have to show it this way then. Probably. Um, I, I'm sorry about that. And um, uh, let's continue. So uh, we are very short, a uh, uh, short baseline compared uh, uh, close to the reactor. And we are, um, uh, we are, uh, uh, and high exposure uh, to the high uh, to the cosmic ray at um, uh, with only one meter water equivalent uh, overburden. The detail about the detector uh, is um, uh, it's optically segmented into fourteen by eleven uh, segmentations, and each segment is about uh, one point two meter long. Uh, this allows us to three D reconstruct the events. Uh, and the events position. And the lithium-6 uh, loaded scintillator has a PSD capability to uh, uh, for us to identify the neutron capture and uh, nuclear recoil events, uh, among other events. And um, uh, both, both ends of each segment are coupled to uh, five-inch PMTs, and uh, the long sides are enclosed by uh, specular reflectors. Uh, and 3D printed rods are made hollow, uh, so the uh, calibration sources can fit through and calibrate the detector inside. Um, the calibration done, uh, the, the detector calibration is done uh, with both uh, radioactive calibration sources, uh, gamma sources and neutron sources, and the cosmogenic events like boron-12. Uh, uh, to calibrate the energy and position reconstruction. And the detector nonlinearity is adjusted in Monte Carlo uh, simulation. So uh, based on uh, these energy scale calibration, so the, and so the uh, simulated nonlinearity has a good agreement with the, uh, the, uh, the actual detector uh, energy response. And we achieved person level uh, uncertainty and stability of both the energy and position reconstruction. The way we detect IBD uh, from the uh, from the anti-neutrino is uh, to tag the IBD events using time coincidence between a boron uh, a positron uh, event and the neutron uh, that's captured. Uh, by lithium-6 uh, about 50 microseconds later than uh, the positron uh, signal. And using PSD, we can very uh, easily distinguish the prompt and delayed signal 
uh, because it's uh, uh, the neutron lithium capture signal is very localized in the energy and uh, PSD parameter plane. And this is only our first level of uh, uh, IBD selection uh, uh, by time coincidence uh, to, to make sure we subtract the background as much as possible uh, on the Earth's surface. Uh, we exclude the prompt signal uh, that contains uh, uh, nuclear recoil-like events and the, uh, the veto event, and we also veto events that coincident with the uh, cosmogenic neutron and muons uh, and require proximity uh, between the uh, positron and neutron signals. And uh, we reject uh, the, the events outside of the fiducial volume of the detector because they are more uh, uh, accidental, uh, 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 higher accidental rates. The uh, with these uh, IBD selection strategy and more than 90 days of reactor on and 70 days of reactor off, we have uh, uh, collected uh, 50,000 IBD uh, signals uh, in the range of uh, 0.8 to 7.2 MeV. Um, that's about uh, 530 IBD signal. Uh, uh, per calendar day on the Earth's surface. And we have a signal to background ratio uh, in this energy range uh, uh, above one. And we see uh, the signal follows uh, R over uh, one over R square trend throughout uh, with increasing baseline. The cosmogenic neutron uh, introducing the uh, N the NH and NC star interactions, uh, the neutron inelastic scattering uh, interactions uh, are the main uh, background sources. And uh, we recently posted these, uh, the analysis based on these data set uh, and has submitted to um, PRD. With this new data set, we proceed our search for the stereo neutrino uh, what we do is uh, we compare the uh, uh, the spectra that's measured by ten different baselines uh, uh, in the detector, uh, and uh, compare uh, compare these spectra to the full detector measured uh, spect uh, spectrum. Uh, and you might notice there are excluded segments uh, in this two D plot. Uh, it it's uh, the segments that excluded where uh, there are PMTs unstable with unstable response that were turned off. And this is, a, uh, is our measurement uh, when we compare uh, the spectrum of each baseline to the spectrum measured by the full detector. And the day, uh, from these data, uh, we don't see obvious deviation compared with the uh, no oscillation a scenario. But precisely speaking, did we uh, see a stereo neutrino? Uh, we use Feldman Cousin frequencies test and uh, Gaussian CLS method uh, to uh, evaluate the excluded uh, oscillation space phase. What we did is we compare the no oscillation scenario and the uh, reactor anti neutrino anomalies best fit uh, scenario to the uh, to our best fit data point and our frequencies test shows uh, the no oscillation follows a, a good chi square distribution and um, uh, it's compatible with the uh, uh, with uh, with the no oscillation hypothesis uh, at uh, of 57% and um, the Reactor anti neutrino anomaly, however, uh, is are exclude uh, these parameters are excluded at uh, uh, 98.5 percent. That's 2.5 sigma. Um, continue with the spectrum uh, analysis. The statistics uh, of these new data uh, has increased. Uh, this uh, has been increased uh, by 45 percent. Um, 
uh, compared to our previous PRL publication. And uh, this uh, mirrored spectrum is compared to a Huber model with a modification of a prospect mirrored non fuel uh, anti neutrino uh, elect. Uh, a non fuel anti neutrino uh, contribution and a, a non equilibrium feeding process. The, compared to this uh, model, uh, we find the chi square over NDF is 3.8 over 31, uh, 30.8 over 31. That's indicating a good uh, data to model comparison. And uh, so far, uh, we are still. Uh, uh, our uncertainty is still statistics dominated. To answer the question of did we see the bump, uh, we did a bump dialing um, uh, analysis where we uh, added a Gaussian feature to the Huber mo Mueller model where Diabay experiment uh, compared against and find the best fit Gaussian uh, against the Diabay spectrum. And then um, apply this best fit Gaussian uh, to the Huber uh, U235 model and allow the, the amplitude to float to feed the uh, prospect spectrum. Um, and the best fit shows the, uh, the best fit Gaussian amplitude is 84% uh, uh, plus or minus 39% compared to diabase bump. That's uh, that means we favor uh, the hypothesis that all isotopes equally contributed to uh, the bump and disfavor the uh, hypothesis where um, neutrino, uh, no uh, U235 contribution or all U235 contribution to that bump. So we hit the summary, uh, the uh, prospect uh, reactor, uh, the prospect's newly uh, published data uh, has uh, increased our sensitivity in the high data and square regime. To date, no evidence of uh, sterile neutrino oscillation has been found, and we uh, disfavor the RAA best fit at uh, 2.5 sigma. Prospect has uh, uh, increased the spectrum uh, mirror and uh, statistics as well, and uh, Compared to the LEU uh, experiment, uh, the result shows um, uh, we suggest the hypothesis that the spectrum mismodeling is present in all fission isotope, and uh, compare uh, and, and we disfavor the no uh, uranium two thirty five spectrum uh, contribution or the uh, only uh, uranium two thirty five contribution. Uh, with the 2.2 sigma and 2.4 sigma respectively. And we also started um, a joint spectrum analysis with the stereo uh, uh, collaboration. And uh, I hope you uh, stay tuned for um, our update coming soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for very interesting results. Uh, and we are looking forward uh, to, to the next uh, results. Uh, so uh, the next, ah, so, so there are two uh, raised hands. First is from uh, Mikhail Danilov. Uh, I, I have a question about uh, slide number eight in uh, uh, one over R. Uh, dependence, uh, there is a, a large spread of uh, points. Uh, wh what is the reason for this? Uh, that, uh, that you mean, uh, the, the large spread, uh, spreaded point is the, uh, is the segments of, uh, uh, each data point represents a segment in the detector. And, uh, um, uh, I, I don't. I wouldn't say it's a large threaded uh, because each segment has a different. Uh, uh, a single segment has a uh, may have different statistics uncertainty compared to uh, uh, the other segment. Uh, 
uh, and um, uh, uh, and their position uh, is uh, uh, spreaded based on uh, how far they are from the uh, detector, and each single segment can be uh, at the different baseline. But the chi square should be quite bad uh, in, in this plot. Mm, I, I didn't include that value, but uh, uh, it, uh, it really is not. Okay, thank you. I think well, it's an important uh, topic. So there is uh, one more question possible. So uh, Beda, please. Yeah, hi. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I have a question about this um, combined analysis with, with a stereo experiment. Can you comment on this? What exactly do you do you plan to achieve? What, what is like the outcome of this analysis? Because stereo is also on the research, like uh, the measure only one, two, three, five. So you want to like benchmark things, or yeah, essentially, what what is the outcome? What, what we can expect from this combination then from the sing single single uh, experimental measurements uh to uh to a, a simple answer is that we want to improve uh our uh, our result of um, uh, the spectrum analysis uh, uh, stat uh statistically and also uh have a stronger um uh, has a stronger result when talking about the uh um the 5 MeV access uh, with uh, less uh, with less uncertainty, uh, and the ultimate goal is to have a, a better uh, uh, is to provide a, a a more precise result of um, about the isotopic source of the uh, spectrum deviation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thanks again, and uh, uh, let's uh, continue with the next uh, talk uh, by Wei Chin. Hey, um, can you hear me? Wen Chin Xu talking about uh, Majorana demonstrator, please. Okay. Um, thank you. I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk about uh, the status and the recent result from my runner demonstrator. So what we are looking at is neutrino double beta decay. And in a regular double beta decay, you will have these two anti-neutrinos coming out of the decay. And this is possible when energetically favored. For example, this Gemini 76 decay here. Uh, in a neutrino double beta decay, there will be zero neutrino coming out. And this will require an anti-neutrino to be also a neutrino which means the neutrinos are Majorana particles. And this process violated the total neutron number by two units. So what we do is really a test of total neutron number conservation or violation. Uh, in Majorana demonstrator, we use a high purity germanium detectors to do this. There are a lot of advantages of such detectors. For example, the source is also the detector. We have an array of p-type point contact detectors 30 ki kilograms of which are enriched in Gemini 76 uh, at 88%. That is the isotope of interest. At the same time, we have demonstrated the best energy resolution in all double beta decay experiments. That is about uh, approaching 0.1% at the Q value. And uh, we have uh, uh, strategies to get uh, no background. For example, we have uh, compact uh, graded shields you can see a uh, uh, net shield, copper shield here, and we have active muon veto and ultra clean materials. Here is a photo of our detectors to be installed. And we are operate uh, at uh, uh, the underground level. So we choose the PPC detectors because they offer more strategies uh, dealing with background. They are intrinsically pure because of the physical and, and uh, chemical processing. You can protect them from cosmic uh, activation by limiting above ground exposure. And they have this feature of slow drift for the charge carriers that allow us to well separate multiple energy depositions inside a detector. So each individual detector is relatively small, but it is very unlikely 
two double beta decay can happen in one detector simultaneously. Therefore, any event with two detectors firing like this is a background event. Also, this P uh, uh, type of point contact result in a very localized waiting potential, which means you have the slow drift of charge carriers, uh, which is good for pulse shape discrimination uh, of various kind. Uh, for example, we can distinguish the signal like a single side event from the background like multiple side event. Due to the multiple energy depositions here, you can see there are multiple steps in, the, in this current pulse that is for the multiple side events. That is not so in the uh, single side event. Therefore, we can compare the maximum amplitude of the current pulse along with the, elect, uh, with the energy. We call that A versus E parameter, and we can use that to identify multiple side uh, background event. We do have a population of known single side event because of the double escape for uh, events of the high energy gammas from the calibration source. So we can keep 90% of such a double escape events, which means we have a 90% efficiency for the signal. In the end, we can achieve a factor of three background rejection. Uh, we have improved this A versus E uh, uh, parameter recently. For example, we have aligned it much better across different channels, which means across different detectors. This is the old one, and this is the new one. You can see it's much better aligned. And also we introduced the uh, uh, energy dependence correction, and this improves the single side acceptance at higher energy. This is uh, uh, due to a uh, cobalt 56 calibration we performed. And we have noticed uh, a correlation between the drift time of charge carriers and uh, this A versus E parameter. This is not surprising, and we adjusted for this correction. So in the end, this new parameter is much uh, stable and uniform across all detectors and is a better uh, parameter. So alpha particles can always be a problem in this business. If alpha particles deposit their energy on the passivated surface of our detectors, some of the energy could be lost. Some charge carriers could diffuse out of the surface and then drift towards the point of contact with uh, reduced uh, mobility. So this is problematic because of the degraded energy. However, such events are much slower. If you look at uh, the wave uh, form after the rising edge, you can notice this characteristic slower recovery time for the surface alpha event in red compared with a rather faster uh, a normal bulk event. So based on the slope in this region, we devised this DCR cut. And we can tune this card based on the calibration data to retain 99% of the beta gamma events. Those are the bulk events. So uh, you can find more details about this card in this new uh, paper on the archive. And uh, we have done improvements to GCR uh, similar to a previous A versus E. So here we also aligned it better across different channels. And there is also a, co a correlation between drift time and the D DCR parameter due to charge trapping. We correct for that as well. And we have implemented the electronics transfer function. So that also improves this parameter and provide the better discrimination between the bulk events and the alpha events. Energy is really key in this business. We have uh, the best energy resolution. We also have a record good linearity that is smaller than 0.2 keV for up to 3 MeV. Uh, on this, uh, new, in this new paper on archive, you can find uh, uh, details about our dedicated nonlinearity correction. And we also improved our energy meter recently. And we start time. We actually corrected that start time to make sure it is the same for coincidental gammas. So that is the improvement, and that reduces the residue in the energy calibration by quite a lot. This is uh, improved energy. This is uh, uh, the previous one. You can say it's much improved. And this is very important, uh, especially at a low energy. Here are some results from the, the demonstrator. We have had the initial result with a 10 kilogram year data, and then followed by a 26 kilogram year exposure. And uh, uh, that had a significant uh, blended data. 
that data set had a sensitivity of ten, uh, four times eight times uh, 4.8 times 10 to the 25th year with a observed limit of 2.7. That is because there is an event very close to the Q value, but that is still consistent with the background estimation. Right now, we are working on a new result with double the exposure and all the latest improvements I just mentioned. We expect this uh, in this form. So we do have some excess of background near Q beta beta compared to our essay prediction. And we have done a lot of background modeling to understand this. Uh, our work indicated that uh, the excess is probably due to a source of excess uh, thorium far away from the detectors. So it's a distant component, not anything nearby. And this can be inferred by the peak intensity and the coincidence studies. And we are still working on improving this background model. I wanted to bring your attention to the detector upgrade we have done. So we have had a number of bad channels and that motivated the upgrade. The upgrade took place early this year and stopped by the COVID and just resumed recently. We use this opportunity to remove five PPC detectors from my runner and ship them to Nagin 200 for test in liquid argon. This is very important for Nagin 200. And as I said, we have better cables with collectors. So we swapped out the signal and the high voltage cables with much improved collectors. We also use this opportunity to install extra shielding. So you can see in this picture, this is the cross arm, and we added those additional plates to shield against the distance radiation. Uh, last but not least, we installed four Altec inverted coaxial point of contact detectors. You can see them here. They are bigger and they are intended for netting the 200. We installed them here in module two of my runner to test them uh, in our no background setup. So this is also important for netting 200. After the upgrade, we found that all of the signal and high voltage channels are working and uh, all detectors are operational in module two. So this is a great success. And we are going to run in this setup for the next half year or so to understand the performance and the background and to reach uh, exposure of 65 kilogram a year. Anything we learn with ICPC will be very important for netting the 200. Uh, and we are going to ship our enriched detectors to, uh, to netting the 200 and continue to study our background with natural detectors. At the same time, we are making progresses on other fronts. Uh, for example, we are searching for double beta decay to excited states. This could be a good test for nuclear matrix element calculation and could be sensitive to be understand the model neutrino properties. Due to the nature of excited states, there will be characteristic gammas when they de-excite. So essentially what we do is to look for those uh, very sharp characteristic gammas in coincidence with uh, those two electrons. And we can do that pretty well at Majorana thanks to our great energy resolution and uh, no background. For example, in this simulation on the left, you can see these two gammas can be identified clearly and our background is relatively low. So we found the number of events consistent with the background and we establish a stringent limit for this mode and many other modes as well. So our limits are much better than previous uh, uh, result. And this is also thanks to the fact that we operate in vacuum, not in liquid argon and other things. So that increases the detection efficiency. Uh, this paper is being finalized. We are also making progresses along other fronts uh, in the search of uh, physics beyond the standard model. Also, thanks to the bunch of advantages of our detectors, we have previously uh, established limits on dark matter, solar axions, and the baryon number violation. And we are working on some of uh, 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 the limits. Uh, for example, uh, here is an update based on some open data. Uh, on the left, you can see our no energy data fitted by uh, our no energy model. Uh, it can describe the data pretty well as no as 5 keV, it includes helium decay, for example, and we are still improving this. Now coming back to double beta decay, 
This plot shows a three sigma discovery level uh, with the function of exposure. So in order to cover the inverted ordering here, you really need an exposure of 10 ton year like this. And with extremely low background level, you can see those are different background levels and they, they are really different here in this discovery plot. So we need a background that is even better than this. From the uh, germanium perspective, this would be the large enriched germanium experiment for neutrinous double bed decay legend. So there will be several presentations related to legend, including this talk about one of the background uh, element. The goal of legend is to uh, have a discovery potential at a half life beyond 10, uh, 10 to the 28 years. And we wanted to use uh, existing resources to speed up this process. Uh, that's why we are building the first phase of legend in existing infrastructure at LNGS with upgrades. This first phase is called legend 200 because we have 200 kilograms of detectors and it has only a moderate uh, goal for background. This is only a factor of three also better than good uh, achieved background. And we hope to start data taking next year. Ultimately, we wanted to reach uh, the legend 1000 phase with a thousand kilograms of detectors and a much more aggressive background goal. The location is to be selected and there are a lot of R&D work ongoing. As I mentioned, some of them are at Marona. So as a summary of my talk, uh, we have established the limit on double beta decay. We have demonstrated the best energy resolution of all neutrinous double beta decay experiments uh, we have been working on our background model and have learned a lot from it. We are in the process of finalizing improvements to our analysis class, and we look forward to a new release of data in this fall. At the same time, we have, making, we have been making progresses in other analysis, including a double, uh, excited state search and dark matter searches. So there will be a lot of results coming out of this. We are in the process of completing an upgrade to the cables and collectors, which has been great, uh, really successful. Uh, the module is ready to be uh, moved back to the shield that would conclude the, the upgrade. At the same time, we deployed the new ICPC detectors for nudging, and this is going to be very informative for the nudging R&D. Uh, for my runner, we expect to reach a, a 65 kilogram a year exposure with a sensitivity in the region of 10 to the 26 year. So please uh, keep tuned uh, to our result. And this is our collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice talk and congratulations to the beautiful results. I don't see any hands raised, uh, so I take the privilege to, to ask a question. Uh, I would like to know, uh, you are talking about the uh, thorium as the main uh, source of the background. Where is the thorium located in the experiment and uh, uh, what is the origin? Right. So when we say the thorium is the main thing, we are talking about an access in comparison with our assay model. And uh, uh, right now, uh, what we can say is that uh, this excess of uh, thorium in comparison with the assay is coming from far away component. For example, some, uh, um, some component in this area could be possible. Um, we can conclude that it is, uh, it is unlikely to come from nearby parts such as the detector holders or the, and, and any other things uh, close to the detectors. So. Uh, it's a very general statement, and that's known by looking at the different peak ratios and the coincidence. Uh, the background is in general very low, so it's actually a little bit difficult to pin down a particular source. Thank you. Well, I don't see any other questions. So thanks to all speakers. It was a very interesting session today. And uh, the session is closed. Thank Bye. you. Bye.